They came before Columbus, the African presence in ancient America by Ivan Van Sertema. Chapter 7 Black Africa and Egypt What was most characteristic in the pre-dynastic culture of Egypt is due to intercourse with the interior of Africa and the immediate influence of that permanent Negro element which had been present in the population of southern Egypt from the remotest times to our day. Randall McIver Ancient Races of the Thebaid Egypt was the receiver still more than the giver Ancient Egypt was essentially an African colonization. Basil Davidson, The African Past If you could stand on the summit of the Great Pyramid of Khufu at Giza, looking south, you would feel your spirit walking down a street that took you back to the beginnings of man's longest civilization. As far as you could see on the southern horizon will lie the conical tents of the gods, pitched upon the earth for more than sixty miles, pyramid after pyramid, row after row of royal tombs, skyscrapers of sheer stone, the blocks of which, if laid end to end, would circle the belly of the world. You could descend and walk unannounced into this city of the dead, for the doors of the tombs are standing open. When Count Volney stood under the shadow of the Great Sphinx in 1783 and looked at these man-made mountains stretching across the western desert, he was startled and confused. He had walked across the low flat country dotted with villages of mud brick huts where stood the tall date palms. The floor of the land was a vivid green and through the green ran an intricate network of irrigation canals. Brown and black skinned men of slender build and dark hair, mostly negroid, quote, having a broad and flat nose, very short, a large flattened mouth, thick lips, End quote. were seen along the banks of the canals, swaying up and down as they rhythmically lifted irrigation buckets attached to what looked like a well sweep. These men were native Egyptians, with skins and features like many of the slaves of the French Empire. How could things have been turned so upside down? How could history have been so violently reversed? A strange guilt troubled Count Volney. It was so natural to think of blacks as, quote, hewers of wood and drawers of water, end quote. When did this curse begin? How we are astonished, he later wrote, quote, when we reflect that to the race of Negroes, at present our slaves and the objects of our content, we owe our arts sciences." End quote. Fifteen years later, an expedition under Napoleon marched into Egypt. The scientists of that expedition were equally astonished and impressed. From what they saw, they concluded, as the Greeks had done a thousand years before, that Egyptian civilization owed its inspiration to a black race this rediscovery by Europeans of ancient Egypt and the disclosures of a powerful Negro African element in the ancestry of a civilization to which Europe owed so much came as an embarrassment. It came also at a most inopportune time. It threatened 
to explode a myth of innate black inferiority that was necessary to the peace of the Christian conscience in a Europe that was then prospering from the massive exploitation of black slaves. Africa was being systematically depopulated. Its empires had disintegrated. Its history had been buried. Its movement and step with other world civilizations had been abruptly halted. Only its most backward and inaccessible elements were left virtually untouched to bear false witness in later times to the scale and complexity of its evolution. The Christian conscience of slave trading Europe had been assuaged for a while by a myth which drew its inspiration not from the Christian Bible as some theologians of the day then thought for the Bible makes no distinctions between black and white but from a very arbitrary interpretation of a biblical story the story of Ham, which appeared in the Talmud, a collection of Jewish oral traditions in the 6th century AD, starting out as an innocuous little antidote. Noah curses a son of Ham, making him and his progeny, quote, a servant of servants, end quote, for looking at him in his nakedness. It grew to become a most pernicious racial myth. It has affected nearly all histories of Africa and Africans for the past 200 years. The curse of the son of Ham, it was said, was the curse of blackness. The descendants of the son of Ham, according to this interpretation of the story, were the Africans and the Egyptians, who, at the time the myth began to circulate, had fallen from their pinnacle of power. When, however, the Napoleonic expedition uncovered the splendors of ancient Egyptian civilization, a new version of history was urgently required. The myth of blackness as a curse had backfired. How could a black and a cursed race have inspired or contributed greatly to the development of a pre-European civilization? An ingenious new version was not long in the making. Political necessity, then as now, is the mother of historical invention. Christian theologians began to suggest that Noah had cursed only Canaan, one son of Ham, and that therefore the curse lay only on his progeny, the black race. Another son of Ham, Mizraim, had not been cursed. From him issued the marvelous Egyptians, the creators of the greatest of early civilizations. The Christian conscience could sleep peacefully again. Canaan's sons, after all, the black branch, were only getting what was their terrible destiny and due. The sons of Mizraim were the Caucasoid, curse-free branch of the Hamites, according to this new version. With the creation of these two legendary branches, a servile and a cursed Negroid branch, and a gifted and blessed Caucasoid branch, the problem of the Hamitic curse was neatly solved. From then on, historians and anthropolog anthropologists would talk of Hamitic culture bringers in Africa, meaning whites, fairy grandfathers, touching the Kemai, the original word for Egypt, literally the black lands with the magical wand of civilization. Behind the van of the clergy to assist and consolidate this version rose up a scientific establishment that tried to prove that Negro Africans had nothing whatever to do with the evolution and development of Egyptian civilization. Skeletal material from Egypt was selectively gathered and selectively measured and classified. The American Anatomist Samuel Morton, the Shock Lee of the 19th century, using pseudo-scientific criteria, flattered and delighted his negrophobic listeners by demonstrating to their satisfaction that the Egyptians were a Caucasoid race and indigenous to the Nile Valley. 
This finding flatly contradicted the claim of the historian Herodotus that the Egyptians, compared to the Greeks and other European Caucasoid, were for the most part a black-skinned and woolly-haired people. The findings of Morton had been shown to be false. Extensive skeletal surveys of the ancient Egyptians, both before and during the dynasties, show them to be of roughly the same racial composition as the blacks of a modern Caribbean island, with a predominantly Negroid base and traces of Asiatic and Caucasoid admixtures. As Basil Davidson had pointed out in Africa in History, quote, it now seems perfectly clear that the vast majority of pre-dynastic Egyptians were of continental African stock, and even of Central West Saharan origins. End quote. These people later mixed with the Asians and Caucasians migrating into the north of Egypt. The Nile was the meeting place of races, but the Negro African element, both before and during several of the dynasties, was a dominant racial element. An Oxford professor of anatomy. Arthur Thompson, and an Egyptologist of the same university, David Randall McIver, carried out the most extensive surveys of ancient Egyptian skeletal material ever made. They reported in 1905 that from the early pre-dynastic period to the 5th dynasty, 24% of the males and 19.5% of the females were pure Negro. Between the 6th and the 18th dynasties, about 20% of the males and 15% of the females were pure Negro. An even larger percentage were, quote, intermediates, end quote, with Negroid physical characteristics. But the density of the Negro African racial presence in pre dynastic and dynastic Egypt is an empty statistic in itself. What should most concern us is the contribution of black Africans to the birth of Egyptian civilization, their participation in the growth and development of that civilization, and the eventual emergence toward the close of the dynasties of a black power, the Nubians, from a land south of the Negroid and Mulatto Egyptians as the source of both spiritual and political authority in the Egyptian world during the significant 800 to 700 BC New World Old World contact period. Black Africa's influence upon the genesis of Egyptian civilization was profound. What came up to Egypt from south and west of the Nile was seminal. In the early formative centuries the Sahara did not divide the African continent. Far from being a natural barrier between the peoples of West Africa and North Africa, Basil Davidson has pointed out, quote, the old Sahara joined these peoples together. All could share in the same ideas and discoveries. Many travelers journeyed through the Green Sahara in New Stone Age times. They used horses and carts, that have been found along two main trails between North and West Africa. New ideas were being taken back and forth by these old travelers. We shall make little sense of African history unless we have this picture constantly in mind. This picture of the great regions learning from each other, teaching each other, trading with each other through the centuries." End quote. But in this cultural give and take, what did the black African outside of Egypt really give that was so crucial to the foundations of Egyptian civilization? Recent archaeological studies in the Sahara and the Sudan have shown that much of the art one finds in the tombs of the pharaohs, many of the bird and animal deities the ancient Egyptians worshipped, and the custom and technique of mummification itself originated among Negro Africans south and west of the Nile. It has always been assumed that mummification 
originated in Egypt. There is evidence to show that it was practiced there as early as the Second Dynasty, circa 3000 BC. Since J. E. Quake Bell found at Saqqara several tombs of this date in which the bodies have been elaborately bandaged, the limbs being wrapped separately. From the beginning of the Fourth Dynasty, 2900 to 2750 BC, there is the canopic box of Hetephines, mother of Cheops, the builder of the Great Pyramid at Giza, which still contains packets of what presumably were the viscera prescribed in a dilute of Nacron, a chemical used in embalming, which is proof that the body has been embalmed though the mummy was not in the tomb. There is an Egyptian mummy on display in the Museum of the Royal College of Surgeons in London that dates back to the 5th dynasty, 2750 to 2475 BC. But going back to centuries earlier than the earliest of these Egyptian mummies is a recent find in the rocky hills of the Fezan, the body of a Negroid child, mummified, flexed, and buried beneath the dirt floor of the family shelter. The body was carefully preserved, in this case by drying before burial. The discoverer, Italian archaeologist F. Mori, claims a date of 3500 BC for his find, and the carbon 14 dates back him up. The spectacular thing about that date is that it makes the Fezan mummy older than the oldest known Egyptian mummies. There is one thing more. On the wall of the rock shelter in which the child was buried, someone had painted a mummy figure bound in many cloths and tied with bands. This is the way the dead were represented in Egypt in latter times. And yet, Dr. Mori believes the painting may date even further back than the child's burial. Another blow to the Egyptian image, to her reputation as premier undertaker. The implications of this go beyond mere burial practices. Mummification in dynastic Egypt was part of a complex body of ritual and belief. The concept of the king as divine, as a god in person among men, lay at the root of royal mummification. The particular form of this divine kingship found in Egypt came not from Asia, as was formerly supposed, but from the heart of Africa. Egyptian ideas of kingship, Bohannon and Curtin have pointed out, developed in Egypt itself and were developed on an African cultural base. The ideas about the nature of the dead were expressed in the pyramids, which ideas developed with amazing rapidity once they started. And the forms of the state that emerged are significantly different from similar ideas and practices found in Asia Minor. Divine kingship seems to have been an African invention, for the African forms differ radically from the other. Millennia later, it could be found in Uganda, in the Benu Valley, along the Guinea coast, and down into Rhodesia. Prototypes some of the bird and animal deities of the Egyptians have been traced back to the desert rock art of Negro Africans in the Tassili Mountains. Even the ceremonial costumes of the pharaohs blossomed out of sartorial styles displayed by some figures on these rocks. Anthropologist Henry Lotte has brought the Saharan art to the world's attention. The beautifully drawn herds and herders, bird-headed goddesses, the hunters dressed in animal heads and tails, people of Negroid type 
claims Lote, were painting men and women with a beautiful and sensitive realism before 3000 BC and were among the originators of naturalistic human portraiture. Pottery is now known to have been made by black Africans as early as 7000 BC in a fishing hunting community near Khartoum. The people of this community fired pottery and combed it with a catfish spine to give it a basket effect. The oldest ivory figurines found in ancient Egypt were sculpted by the Badari, a negroid race of the Egyptians. Another form of art found among the Egyptians which came up from the Sudan and points to a domestication of cattle as early as 4500 BC by black Africans are the rock paintings of cattle with intricately twisted horns. The fanciful shapes of these horns reappear in the temple and tomb paintings of dynastic Egypt. Discoveries of this nature are of the greatest significance. They give the lie to the Hamitic hypothesis which made claims still believed by many historians of Africa that pastoral science, the skills of cattle rearing, came into Africa through Caucasoid Hamites. Thus, C. G. Seligman, the most bigoted and influential British exponent of this racial theory, stated in a book originally published in 1930 and reprinted without change as late as 1966 that quote the incoming Hamites were pastoral Europeans arriving wave after wave quicker witted than the dark agricultural Negroes end quote the earliest agricultural settlement in the Negro Sudan that of the Fayum shows that pastoral and agricultural science existed side by side. British archaeologist A.J. Arkell excavated two sides along the Nile, one near Khartoum, south of Egypt, where the Nile splits, and one in the Fayum area. In the Fayum site, there was clear evidence that people were growing grain and minding cattle as early as 4500 BC, while in the Khartoum site the blacks were cultivating crops and making pottery. Arkell found something even more interesting, something that connected these two sites to an African source west of the Nile, deep in the Sahara. In both sites were considerable quantities of Amazon stone beads microline feldspar from the Eghe Mountains north of Tibetsi in the Sahara. In the Khartoum site was found dotted wavy line pottery identical with pottery in the Tibetsi area. What this indicates is that Tibetsi was a dispersal area of cultural influences moving up the Nile from the Sahara and that when that desert, once a fertile plain, ended its wet phase and began to dry up, black Africans started moving north and east, following the shrinking tributaries of the Nile until they reached the flood plain, thereby colonizing Egypt. Every new archaeological find seems to be pushing the agricultural breakthrough in Africa further and further back in time and the influence of this breakthrough on the ancient Egyptians should not be underestimated since the great and early civilizations were built only after mankind had reached the settled agricultural stage. It has been assumed that Africans were late in the day in this respect and since the Asian agricultural complex was among the earliest the agricultural science of Egypt was thought to be largely Asian in origin. The American anthropologist George Peter Murdoch has reclassified the great agricultural complexes in the ancient world. 
the Southwest Asian Complex, Caucasoid, the Southeast Asian Complex, Mongoloid, the Middle American Complex, American Indian, and the Sudanic Complex, West African. The Sudanic complex was completely ignored until recently. Russian botan botanist Vavilov, who listed all plants in the three non-African complexes, never visited black Africa. Hence, he and others made serious misclassifications, especially with regard to indigenous African crops that had traveled to India and were thought to have originated in Asia. Murdoch, by use of geographical and linguistic distribution of plants and plant names, as well as recent agricultural finds, has been able to prepare a classification of plants belonging to the Sudanic complex. He has shown that the Mande people of West Africa created a center of plant domestication around the headwaters of the River Niger, circa 4500 BC. He has also shown that while Egypt gave nothing in the way of plants to black Africa, black Africans contributed the bottle gourd, the watermelon, the tamarind fruit, and cultivated cotton to Egypt. Murdoch's claim that crops move north and east across the African continent from this center of plant domestication in the western Sudan is borne out by a study of Nubian agriculture. Nubia, the black state on the southern boundaries of Egypt, in spite of its long passage under the dynastic Egyptians, has little in the way of crops that it owes to Egypt. Its basic crops were Sudanic in origin. It seems, whatever the reason, that whereas West African crops traveled up the Nile and took root in Egypt and its colonial outposts, Egyptian crops are not to be seen in sites west and south of the Nile. In one of the fire holes of the 4500 BC settlement near Khartoum, excavated by Arkel, the charred fragment of an oil palm fruit, an indigenous West African plant was found located far north and east of its original home, the agricultural complex of the nuclear mandate. Moving in an Egyptian direction, no comparable find indicating the southward or westward movement of an indigenous Egyptian plant exists. C. Wrigley is critical of specific points in the Murdoch thesis but concludes nonetheless that plant domestication must have occurred very early in Africa. He argues that the existence of wide networks of languages which are only remotely related. Fine pottery dating back to 5000 BC in East Africa and livestock in the Eastern Sudan in 4000 BC attest to an equally early emergence of food producers in sub-Saharan Africa. Roland Porteres presents as evidence of ancient African agriculture the fact that India as early as 1300 BC had imported a number of indigenous African crops. Botanist Edgar Anderson operating by wholly different methods and using different evidence arrives at roughly the same conclusion as Murdoch. He agrees that there was a separate African origin of agriculture around the headwaters of the Niger. The investigations of Delcroix and Vorfrey provide archaeological support for this hypothesis of an early independent center of agricultural domestication in West Africa. Among the numerous archaeological materials that they have studied from the West and Central Africa, they identify the Tumbien of Guinea and the Paratumbien of the neighboring Sudan as the remains of early simple agriculturalists. Carl Schwerin suggests that the Tumbien culture began somewhere close to 5000 
BC. Radiocarbon dates for these sites have not yet been attained, but Professor Davies has provided radiocarbon dates for later sites in the Niger area which, while not as early as the Arkel dates in the Sudan, show that the general consensus among these botanists, archaeologists, and anthropologists has a basis in fact. For the Tenere Neolithic, a later agricultural phase in the Niger, he gives a date of 5140 BC, plus or minus 170 years. As I have indicated before, the drying up of the Sahara pushed black Africans northward up from the central Sahara and the Sudan toward the Nile floodplain. This they occupied in fairly dense concentrations in the pre-dynastic period. It is this northern migration of the black African into the basin of the Nile that made the land of Kem, Egypt, essentially an African colonization. Thus, the blacks in the pre-dynastic period hugging the banks of the Nile were responsible for major agricultural innovations along that ancient river. The blacks dominated a land from the 29th parallel north to the 10th parallel south by circa 3400 BC. This land was the old Ethiopian Empire in the north from above the 29th parallel to the Mediterranean there was a slice of land one-fourth of Lower Egypt into which Asians and a sprinkle of Caucasians trickled. These foreigners waged wars with black Africans until the Africans won a decisive victory over them circa 3400 BC under the African king Manes. It is from this point that real Egyptian history begins because it was then that the African king joined the two lands, Uazit with Neghabit. Negheb was the old black capital. It is at this point too that the winged disc motif developed as a political symbol signifying the unification of the two lands. Menes laid the foundation of a city which was to become the capital of the Egyptian kings for 3,000 years named after him. During one of the longest reigns in history, Menes brought about the kind of stability that not only provided a solid foundation for a first dynasty, but also the economic and social conditions necessary for a far more uniform expansion of religion, the arts and crafts, and the mathematical sciences. Here too is where Mesopotamia, Palestine, and Greece although not as advanced, may have made cultural contributions to the Africans and received much from them in return. The unification of the lands led to the mixing of Asians and Africans in the north. The African script, language, the character of the royal dynasties became a composite of African and Asian elements. In other words, Lower Egypt, the north, became physically and culturally a Quote, mulatto Egypt. Asians married African princesses and the integration of the two peoples proceeded apace. Hence the emergence of pharaohs with both Negroid and Asian physical characteristics. Some of the royal portraits and sculptures are highly stylized with the headgear, the false beards, etc. often obscuring the racial detail. It is often necessary to look at other royal representations of the same period to fully appreciate this. But conventional historians have ignored the African beginnings, the African political and administrative structure, the unique African form of the divine king concept, the African agricultural contribution on the Nile, the African science of mathematics and mummification, all the elements that laid the basis for the first four dynasties. They make no mention of the fact that the Sphinx was a portrait statue of the black pharaoh Khafre, also called Sephirin. Nor 
that the greatest of all the pyramids was built during the reign of the African Khufu, Second Dynasty, 2590 to 2567 B.C., nor that the religious cults of Seth and Ammon were African. They bypassed all the Negro African figures in the dynasties or disguised them with blanket classifications, laying emphasis only on the Asian elements, the men who came in from the north as tent-dwelling nomads. They credit all the genius of the dynastic period to these infiltrators, inheritors of an African cultural, scientific, and even physical legacy. When the blacks are mentioned at all, they are confined to the 25th dynasty, which is called the, quote, the Ethiopian dynasty, end quote. Even that, as we shall show in our next chapter, has been in dispute until recently, and when it was not contained within a footnote, it was classified in such a way as to render it insignificant and unworthy of serious consideration. Labels like, quote, period of decline, end quote, are clapped onto these periods. Inscriptions are defaced, Negro African heads are lopped off, noses are chiseled down, photographs are taken from misleading angles or through misleading filters. Nomenclatures meant to confuse are pasted over the archaeological and documentary evidence. One comes upon the scene of history as though a witness to a massive cultural genocide, the perpetrators of which have nevertheless left tell-tale clues in the graveyard where a subterranean current and electric truth galvanizes still the surviving skeletons and sculptures. A largely mixed North Afro-Asian mulattoes and a largely black South Negro African sums up the racial picture of Egypt from about 3000 BC down to the period just before the birth of Christ in all her periods of upheaval, when the north was threatened by chaos or the invasion of foreigners, Egypt was rescued and reunited by powerful men from the black south. When it fell into anarchy during the latter years of Pepi II and was divided into feudal baronies during what is known as the First Intermediate Period, 2200 to 2050 BC, a Nubian southerner men to Hotep the first reunited Egypt when in 1770 BC the north was invaded and conquered by the Hyksos and Asiatic people the black south remained strong and took into its arms the fleeing mulattoes from the north transfusing a new stream of Negro African blood into the mixed pool of the northern Egyptians when in the 12th when in the 25th dynasty, 800 to 654 BC, the Assyrians, the power of Western Asia, had made vassals of the northern Egyptian kings, it was the black kings of the south who reunified Egypt under their rule once again and held the Assyrians at bay for nearly a century, ushering a renaissance, not a decline of the Egyptian culture and spirit. It is important to understand that modern Egypt and modern Egyptians are not the direct successors of these ancient peoples. With the fall of Egyptian civilization in the last phase of the pre-Christian era and the massive Arab movement into the north, the sack of Alexandria and the founding of Cairo, northern Egypt and indeed all northern Africa changed in its physical and cultural appearance. It is to the last great phase of Egyptian history before this radical change begins that we shall now turn our attention. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 The Black Kings of the 25th Dynasty As one gathers eggs that have been abandoned in fright have I gathered the whole earth? Sennacherib, the Assyrian king. And then he, Sennacherib, heard say of Terhaka, king of Ethiopia, Behold, he is come out to fight against thee. 
Book 2 Kings Chapter 19 Verse 9 At the far end of the Dongola Reach As the Nile bends and swings upward Streaming north toward the fourth cataract It flows through the province of Napata Where in the towns of Karu and of Nori lie the ancient graves of kings. These are the graves of the forgotten kings of Cush, the black Valhalla, through whose ghostly fields may still be heard the distant din of wars, the clash of Nubian and Libyan, of Nubian and Assyrian, over the ailing body of Egypt. Here lay in their trappings of silver and bronze, the mummified horses of Pianki, Shabaka, Shabataka, and Taharka, or Tirhaka. Here lay the black princes of the 25th dynasty, who from circa 751 to 654 BC threw their shadow across the length and breadth of the Egyptian Empire, from the shores of the Mediterranean to the borders of modern Ethiopia, almost a quarter of the African continent. They were among the last of the great sun kings of the ancient world. These kings formed the last bastion of ancient Egyptian civilization against the advance of the alien. Black Nubian troops of Kush not only brought Osorkan III, a Libyan king of Upper Egypt, to his knees, but crushed the rebellion of the petty kings of Egypt under Tafnek, and, seizing power over both Lower and Upper Egypt, rescued it from vassalage to the Assyrians holding that great power at bay for nearly a century until they were eventually outclassed by the heavier concentration of iron weaponry in the Assyrian forces. For one brief century they restored Egypt to her former glory, renovated her temples and gave new life and moral authority to the sun god Amun-Ra, who had become in that time the chief god among both Nubians and Egyptians. In the towns of Kuru and Nori lie the graves of these ancient kings at the foot of the pure mountain. Jebel Barkal in the temple of Ammon lay many of their weapons and jewels, statues and stella. Their graves, though plundered, their mummies, though stolen, their stellae, though partially defaced, give proof, nonetheless, of their true ancestry and origin. Why then are they not represented as black, or, even when so conceited, relegated to a footnote in the conventional histories of the ancient world? We have seen the attempts to deny black Africa's contribution to the rise of civilization in ancient Egypt. It was difficult for Europeans during the era of the Africans' enslavement, when the myth of his fundamental inferiority made his subjugation easier to carry on the Christian conscience, to admit that he once stood on the upper branches in the tree of world civilization. But the seeds black Africa planted, which cross-pollinated with those of the mixed Mediterranean races meeting on the Nile, flowered into that tree under whose branches and feeding on whose fruit Greece, Rome, and Britain later grew. As in the beginning, so in the last great phase of the Egyptian world, the black African gained ascendancy. To see him in this light as a power in the dawn and in the sunset of ancient Egypt was anathema to the ruling prejudices of imperial scholars. Thus, Reisner and Brugge Bay, Dryton, Van Dier, 
and Moray, to mention just a few. And even more recently, Arkel and Shinny seek to bypass the blackness of these kings. Dr. Birch Bay, in his book, A History of Egypt Under the Pharaohs, published nearly a hundred years ago, advanced the theory that the kings of the black lands of Nubia and Kush, who rose to power in the 8th and 7th centuries BC, were not really black at all, but came from outside to give leadership and guidance to, quote, these imperfectly developed people, end quote. He claimed, and later, Triton and Vandier supported the claim that the royal family of Cush were descended from a certain high priest of Thebes, Herhor. This Herhor, also spelled Herihor, had been the founder of the 21st dynasty. He had seized the Egyptian throne in 945 BC and made himself the first prophet of Ammon. But his successors, after 150 years of rule, were eventually overthrown and forced to flee Egypt sometime around 800 BC. It was around this time that a great national passion was stirring in Nubia. Nubia, in which was based the Kingdom of Cush, which was later to expand and embrace the whole Egyptian world, had already begun to feel her native strength, to assert her national independence. Egyptianized though she was in many respects from long colonization, she had gained self-government during the troubled period through which Egypt was passing. Yet these scholars would have us believe that at the crest of this spirit of self-pride and national ambition, the black Nubians, credited at that time with having the finest militia in Africa, without a murmur of protest, with not the slightest show of resistance, allowed the fleeing priests of the house of Herhor, men who had lost all power and prestige, impotent, defeated refugees, to establish a new domination over them. Brooks Bay reveals the racial attitude behind this absurd suggestion when he speaks of Nubia and Ethiopia as places, quote, where the minds of an imperfectly developed people must needs show themselves pliable and submissive to a dominant priest caste. End quote. The only thread of evidence for the theory presented by these historians was the fact that Pianchi, the first important king of the 25th dynasty, had adopted a name which was the same as that used by his son and successor of Herhor. Yankee is Egyptian for the living one, and considering the number of Egyptian customs, names, and religious rituals surviving among the ex-colonials, it was flimsy evidence indeed. Excavations in 1919 by G. A. Reisner, which led to the discovery of the graves of the kings, put an end to this hypothesis. The evidence of the graves made it clear that the kings of Cush could not have been native Egyptians, but Reisner then advanced a new and equally misleading theory. After a cursory examination of stone arrowheads, which he found in several of the graves at Kuru, he decided that some with recessed bases were of Libyan type. With this preconceived notion of a Libyan link, he was led into the misreading of a word on the stele of Queen Tabiri, one of Pianchi's queens, as Temehu. This word means southern Libyans, and he therefore thought she was, quote, great chieftainess of the Temehu, end quote. On this slender evidence, he concluded that, quote, while the northern Libyans were entering the delta or soon after, the southern Libyans the Temehu pushed into the Nile Valley. End quote. Reisner then began to invent a Libyan chief who settled at Kuru and whose family, according to him, obtained the domination of Ethiopia. A. J. Arkel, in A History of the Sudan, dismisses this in one sentence. 
which was all it really needed. The evidence for this, he declares, is, quote, non-existent. The theory, however, gained ground for many years and in several histories of Egypt, such as Alexander Moray's The Nile and Egyptian Civilization, the kings of Cush are represented as Libyans, although placed in the confusing category Ethiopian dynasty. I say confusing, for the word Ethiopian was used in a very general way in ancient times. Ethiops, literally burnt face, was a broad catch-all word for dark people. That was why Peter Martyr referred to the mysterious blacks Balboa came upon in the Isthmus of Darien as Ethiopians. It is also confusing if we think of Ethiopian as an exclusive referent to the people of modern Abyssinia. The Ethiopian dynasty, a label given by the Egyptian historian Manetho to the black power period of Egypt is really the dynasty founded by the kings of Cush with its base at Napata in Nubia. The old notion that the ancestors of the Cushite royal family were Libyans has been abandoned. Most modern authorities now agree that they were of native Nubian origin. The way they were buried is one of the several clues to their native roots. The burial practices are not only non-Egyptian but also very different from anything found among the Libyans. In spite of the Egyptian cultural influence, and the graves of the kings give clear evidence of this, the manner of the royal burial is distinctive. The black kings are buried on beds rather than in coffins. A coffin bench is constructed with niches cut out of near its corners for the legs of the funerary bed, the frame of which rested on the bench in one of the queen's tombs, two bronze bed legs were found still in place. This type of burial was practiced by the Nubians a thousand years earlier. While the furnishing and iconi iconography of the royal tombs in most respects follow the standard Egyptian practice of the period, they, the kings of Kush, were reluctant to abandon their ancestral form of burial. What is even more interesting is that we find close by the royal burials the graves of people who worked under the black kings, priests, artists, craftsmen, scribes, some of whom were Egyptian, buried in the Egyptian fashion, bodies in coffins without beds. These graves of typically Egyptian style belong to people of lower status than the kings. The pits where these bodies lie are much narrower and very poorly furnished. Another difference between Egyptian burial and that of the black kings of Kush should be noted. The mound form a superstructure which occurs in the royal graves at Kuru had been characteristic of Lower Nubia since 2000 BC. This evidence has convinced professors Arkell and Shinny, as indeed it would convince anyone who has had to examine it, that the chieftains of Kush were native. But having come step by step through each archaeological advance to an admission that natives, not foreigners, provided the power behind the kingdom of Kush, we find that the question dramatically shifts from what is the racial origin of the kings of Kush to what is the racial origin of the natives of Kush. This, says Arkell, contradicting his earlier clarity and certainty on other related matters is, quote, wrapped in obscurity." End quote. His pupil and protege, P. L. Shinny, is equally cautious. The results should be treated with reserve, he declares. When faced with the findings of excavators at Karanog that clearly indicated that the overwhelming majority of skeletons in the Nubian area during this period were Negroid. We are witnessing again the same Negrophobia that afflicted so many European scholars during the heyday of the Hamitic hypothesis. That myth has now been bludgeoned to death, but its mutilated, mutilated ghost still lingers, particularly within the unconscious racial reflex of British scholars. 
when the Nubians were paying tribute and bearing gifts to the pharaohs, there was no doubt, whatever, as to their racial identity. Their blackness was not, quote, wrapped in obscurity. There is a representation of Negro Nubian princes in an Egyptian wall painting in the tomb of Hai at Thebes. This painting has been well circulated. It appears in countless histories of Egypt and owes its popularity to the fact that it flatters the generally accepted notion of the black as colonial or vassal. Little or no use is made of equally instructive paintings of ancient Egypt in which the Caucasoid or Asiatic figure is depicted as bound captive and slave. The Nubian princes are seen in the painting sitting in ox-drawn chariots shaded by parasols. Both they and their attendants are predominantly Negroid. Why then should skeletal surveys which show the natives of this area to be predominantly Negroid be treated with reserve? Has the Neg Nubian become faintly Negroid? To use Sini's shamefaced phrase, as he leaves the role of vassal behind him and aggressively assumes the double crown of Egypt. Both Arkel and Sheni seek to deny the Negroness of the Nubian king Taharqa. Arkel says that, quote, it is most improbable that Taharqa was a Negro, though he may have had some Negroid blood in his veins, end quote. Fortunately, we do not have to depend on these gentlemen for proof on the point. We can go to the records of Taharqa's enemies themselves, the Assyrians, his contemporaries who on several occasions, both in times of trouble, peace, and on the brutal field of war, met him and his predecessors face to face. They left a vivid portrait of Taharqa, who haunted their sleep as they had haunted the sleep of the Egyptians for generations. They met his predecessor, Shabaka, brother of Pianki, when their ambassadors came to hold peace talks between him and the Assyrian king, Sennacherib. Impressions of Shabaka's clay seal have been found side by side with that of Sennacherib in the royal archives of Cunulek and Nineveh. They saw Taharqa for the first time when, circa 701 BC, he appeared as a young man on the battlefield near Jerusalem, coming to the aid of Hezekiah of Judah. Taharqa's appearance on the field of battle is mentioned in the Hebrew chronicles of that period. He was not yet king, but he had been sent out to head the Nubian contingent of the allied Nubian Egyptian army in preference to his elder but weaker brothers. The Assyrians clashed with him again in the Delta in 673 BC when he repulsed the forces of their king Esarhaddon, and at Memphis in 671 BC when Esarhaddon drove him south. They faced him finally in 666 BC when he regrouped his forces, reoccupied Upper Egypt, and forced Ezrahaddon's son, Ashur Bani Pal, to march on him once more. Taharqa was routed and retreated further south, but maintained control of Upper Egypt and Nubia until 663 BC, when, in the last year of his life, he began to share his throne with a nephew, Tanu Tatman. Kings like Taharqa would appear in the van of their forces, riding on swift chariots. He made a spectacular sight. His horses were brilliantly caparisoned. The Nubian kings of Kush made a fetish out of horses. They were buried alongside the royal families, even as the earlier Egyptian pharaohs had buried their favorite Basenji dogs. To see the black king, Taharqa, galloping across the battlefields of Jerusalem at Tunis in the Delta and in the sacred city of Thebes was never to forget him. The people of Judah saw him and took heart when Hezekiah was wavering in his mind as to whether he should submit to the Assyrian Sennacherib or lean on Egypt for support. The Assyrians have immortalized him. Ezra Haddon had a portrait of him carved upon a stele at Sinjirli which clearly represents him as Negroid. Arkel says 
that they depicted him thus to show their quote oriental contempt end quote forgetting that this would have been an anachronistic pathology in that period J. H. Breasted in his history of Egypt points out quote he was the son of a Nubian woman and his features as preserved in contemporary sculptures show unmistakable Negroid characteristics. An outline of events in the Eastern Mediterranean during the reign of these black kings is of great significance in the matter we are examining. It may help to illuminate the state of the time and reveal to us the nature of the pressures as well as capacities within the Nubian Egyptian world which led to the embarkation of a ship or ships down the Mediterranean toward North Africa circa 800 to 671 BC. A ship or ships carrying Nubian, Nubian troops in command, one or two Phoenician navigators or merchantmen, and a crew of craftsmen and peasants of both Negroid and mixed Egyptian ancestry, including a few women. The motives for this journey, which never got to the place intended but left indisputable traces at its point of destination, will become obvious as a historical outline of the period unfolds. Nubia had been moving toward her independence since the 10th century BC, but it was not until some time between 800 and 750 BC when taking advantage of the schisms within Egypt, a royal house founded at Napata threw up a king who felt strong enough to extend his power over the south of Egypt, that is, Upper Egypt. This was Kashta. He pushed the Libyan king, Osorkan III, out of the south and made himself master of the gold mines and the Nubian militia. Pianki 751 to 716 BC, the son of Kashta, pushed further north into Egypt. Egypt in his reign became a shuttlecock between the Syrian kings of Western Asia and the black kings of Nubia. Lower Egypt, north, was not occupied by Assyrian forces, but its kings paid tribute to the Assyrians and acted as their vassals. Upper Egypt, south, was solidly within the black sphere of power. Middle Egypt, like a kind of no man's land, vacillated between both powers, now playing to the Assyrians, now to the blacks as power shifted. The Assyrians were like a great deepening shadow upon the horizon of the Middle East. They were the Huns or Hitlers of that era. They had invaded Iraq, Iran, the Hittite country, and Syria. The Assyrian king Sargon marched into Samaria and transported the Jews and changed from Israel to Iraq. The world was at war. The Asiatics were moving their iron-powered army into the Mediterranean and Africa, but the Assyrians had bitten off more than they could chew. While they had made vassals of many of the native Egyptian kings of the north, they had to be content with merely seeking tribute. They were too tied up, holding their ground elsewhere to occupy and consolidate their hold on Lower Egypt, the northern provinces. Sensing the Assyrian weakness, a local petty king, Tafnak, prince of Sais, a district in the north, rebelled and started to take control of Lower Egypt, forcing allegiance from the other petty kings. But Tafnak did not stop at usurping Assyrian power. He reversed the gains of Pianki and made the kings who paid the black king tribute dogs at his feet. It was at this point that the battles which were to lead to the total conquest of Egypt by the blacks began. Naval engagements were fought on the Nile. Sieges were laid to Egyptian cities. Tafnak was pushed back and back and back, his vassals submitting one by one until Pianki 
like the great pharaohs before him, donned the double serpent crown of Upper and Lower Egypt. In the last great battle of the campaign, at the siege of Memphis, the Black King marshaled every kind of watercraft, barges, passenger ships, cargo vessels, using the yard arms as bridges and ladders to scale the walls. Tafnak was forced to retreat to an island within the northern reaches of the Nile. Battles in themselves may be quite meaningless, victories ephemeral and hollow, but something had begun to happen here that gave relative stability in spite of the fighting that was still to follow to the black dynasty that was emerging. Pianchi, like his father, established unswerving obedience to his command by both the Nubians and native Egyptians through his fanatic devotion to the god Amun-Ra at Thebes. He baptized his vast army in the river before proceeding into battle, in a time of chaos and disorder when Egypt was indeed like a bruised reed. The kings of Cush introduced or reinforced the practice of direct divine intervention into the state of affairs, turning Amun-Ra into an oracle so that their orders seemed to come straight from the mouth of God thereby establishing divine sanction for their dynasty. The statue of Ammon was jointed, a priest being especially appointed to work it, and in the sanctuaries hiding places were arranged in the thickness of the wall from which an efficient skillfully caused the oracular voice of the god to be heard. The black kings inspired a renaissance of the classical Egyptian spirit. They renovated the temples, they restored royal mummification and pyramid building, which had lapsed for generations. Though they built only one kind of pyramid, the truncated step pyramid, they even restored the concept of solar blood. Whereas Egyptian pharaohs had abandoned this custom and had begun marrying Mitannian wives from the hither Asia. The Nubians reinstituted royal incest to preserve the line of the sons of the sun god. Nubia behaved in some ways toward Egypt as America toward Britain. Finding herself 200 years after independence, the chrysalis of an empire in her own right, powerful and free, yet striving, however awkwardly, sometimes with a naive idealism, to enshrine and preserve the traditions she has inherited, and in which, through military might, she alone is equipped to defend and protect, becoming in effect a keeper and conscience of her former lord. Nubia, through Pianchi, and after him, Miamam Nut, who fought with Tafnak's son, Bokoris, and after him, Shabaka, who burnt Bokoris alive, and after him, Shabitku, who passed over all his brothers for the strongest, Taharka, who had already proven his courage in the van of the allied Nubian Egyptian forces in Jerusalem, all these men fought in an unsettled time in a divided world to weld Egypt once more into a unity by virtue of unifying religious faith. They were all distinguished, in spite of their warlike reigns, by the zeal and piety of men who honestly believe they are agents of a spiritual power. The double serpent motif dominated the dream life of these kings, and such dreams are described in the stele of King Nut and King Tana Taman, a son of Shabitku, to Harker's elder brother, and Qualhata, to Harker's sister. These dreams gave them a single-minded intensity, a sense of mission, of destiny. Thus did their followers fight as fanatically, pursue their enemies as relentlessly, kill with as great a sense of Puritan sanctity as did the Christians and Muslims in the later eras of their holy wars. No petty Egyptian king like Tafnak or Bokoris could arrogate himself the divine titles which these black kings, through their pious dedication to Ammon, commanded and assumed. 
All factions fell, therefore, before the holy march. City after city bowed down in fear and trembling before the messengers of Ammon, until from the northernmost head of the Mediterranean down to the southern juncture of the Nile where she splits, branching wide her white and blue legs, the body of the Egyptian empire submitted to the kings of Cush. The Assyrians continued to threaten Egypt. They saw the northern provinces fall into the hands of Cush, but even while the battles raged, they seemed unable to take advantage of Egypt's internal upheaval and attack her. They too were embroiled on many fronts and dared not overreach themselves, preferring to consolidate their power in Western Asia before risking another naked confrontation with such a powerful adversary. Many years passed before the inevitable happened. The blacks instituted a policy of detente with Assyria. King Shabaka, Pianki's brother, came to some understanding with the Assyrian king Sennacherib. Like America and Russia, each decided to observe or present, pretend to observe the other's military and political fife or sphere of influence. Like the modern great powers, they also tried to avert the inevitable clash as long as possible while conspiring secretly to undermine the other through its satellites and occasionally fighting limited wars not on their ground but on satellite battlefields. Hence Taharka's appearance on behalf of Hezekiah at Jerusalem. How the battle for the little state of Judah might have ended had it not been for the mysterious epidemic that broke out among the Assyrians, no one can tell. The Assyrians were not to meet the blacks face to face again on the field of battle for thirty years. Thus their cold war lasted roughly as long as ours has so far. But Taharka was not idle in those years. He left Upper Egypt, the southern lands, in charge of the black Sudanese high priest Men Tuhemet. Then Taharka came up north to Tanis in the delta and established his palace in Lower Egypt, where he could be in the swim of things, sensitive to all that was happening in the Mediterranean and Western Asia. He became king in 688 BC, and while playing the policy of detente, conspired with the Phoenicians in Tyre and Sidon against the common enemy, the Assyrians. The Phoenicians at that time were vassals of Assyria. They were a defeated but rebellious people paying tribute to their masters but quietly plotting revenge. So dangerous was the conspiracy they hatched with Taharka that when at last it was discovered the Assyrians unleashed massive and brutal retaliation against both Phoenicia and Egypt. The Phoenician king of Sidon was executed. An insurrection in Tyre, which broke out soon after, was savagely put down. The Cold War between Egypt and Assyria came to an end. Esarhaddon, the son of Sennacherib, marched into Egypt and met Taharka's army at Memphis in 671 BC. The relationship between the blacks and the Phoenicians, and their common interest in the face of the Assyrians, is an important factor in this period. It may help to explain how a Mediterranean figure with flowing beard and turned up shoes appears in association with the Negroid figures in ancient Mexico and certain elements of Phoenician artifacts such as a model of the Phoenician god Melkart have been unearthed in America in archaeological context related to the African Egyptian presence. Egypt had been trading with Phoenicians for centuries. These people had once been nomads of the desert but had eventually settled on islands in the Mediterranean. They were, however, a people with nomadic urges and soon made of the sea what they had once made of the desert, a field for their restless wanderings. They were extremely poor in metals and so dependent for these on their maritime trade, going to Hattus, a Hittite seaport, or to an island later called Cyprus for copper to the Iberian Peninsula for silver, also to Egypt for the same and Nubian gold dust, and as far as Cornwall and the British Isles right out into the North Atlantic for their tin. 
Although their boats were smaller than those of the Egyptian, 70 feet long was the average, they were extremely maneuverable and equipped with both oar and sail. From their native islands, they carried linen cloth and wool, fine jewelry, cedar, from which some Egyptian ships were made, perfume and spices, and from their major seaports, Tyre, Sidon, and Byblos, things were rare, things that were rare and treasured in the ancient world, a purple dye, which came to be known as Tyrian purple, and was reserved as the color of royalty in the Mediterranean, exquisite glass from Sidon, papyrus from Byblos, which the Egyptians used to write their very first books. Yet compared to the Egyptians, the Phoenicians were semi-illiterates and have left very few written records. Some scholars have claimed it was not so much a matter of their literacy as a reluctance to put things down, a secretiveness about their markets, sea routes, and navigational signs. They were always afraid of losing their advantage at sea, for this was their only strength. In spite of their restless energy and enterprise, they were a very vulnerable people. They lay within the valley of the giants and became the vassals of many powers, Egyptians, Assyrians, Persians, etc. But the Egyptians, Herodotus tells us, even when they made subjects of the Phoenicians, did not stifle their maritime trade. It was as vital to Egypt as it was to them. The more riches they amassed from this trade, the more tribute they could pay to Egypt. The practical wisdom of this laissez-faire policy toward the Phoenicians appealed to the Assyrians also, and so it was that they gave military protection to the Phoenician caravans on land while allowing them to move freely at sea. From one end of the Mediterranean to the other, although they were a subject race, a lot of Egyptian trade was carried on in Phoenician ships. The Phoenicians were, although merchants in their own right, often mercenary seamen of the Egyptians. As late as circa 600 BC, when Assyrian power had waned and the Phoenicians were once more under the heel of the Egyptians, the pharaoh Necho II hired them to circle Africa by ship. In the era of Nubian domination of Egypt, vast supplies of copper and tin were required to provide bronze weaponry for the armies. Phoenicians, as poor in metals as Egypt, made fortunes out of the maritime metal trade. There was something even more important and urgent about the search for metal supplies in this period. The Bronze Age was coming to an end. The Age of Iron had been ushered in swiftly and terribly by the march of the Assyrians, whose armies owed their superiority to a heavier concentration of iron weaponry. The blacks of Cush had learned of the process of iron smelting, but Egypt was poor in iron. Taharqa is credited in the history of the Sudan with having introduced the ironworks in Nubia at a place called Moro, but this was after his retreat from Egypt. The sites of the blacks in this period of their ascendancy lay in the north, where they could realize their dreams of dominating Egypt not in the south, their homeland, until their armies were irre irrevocably pushed back by the Assyrians. The discovery of iron, therefore, in their own heartland and in considerable quality did not come until around 650 BC, when it was too late to make any real difference in the military struggles. The techniques of iron smelting were not the monopoly of the Assyrians. These techniques had been developed among the Hittites before their conquest by the Assyrians and may have diffused to Egypt and Nubia through Hittite refugees fleeing their bases in the Mediterranean as the great armies of the alien overpowered them. The Hittites fled also to Phoenicia. They became a dispersed people, settling in tiny pockets in Egypt, Phoenicia and elsewhere intermarrying with and becoming incorporated into the culture of their neighbors. Thus we have a picture of the culture complex of this period and the pressures which made it necessary for Taharqa to intrigue with the Phoenicians under the noses of the Assyrians. 
It is during this period that we find at La Venta, in the Gulf of Mexico, a complex of figures that were associated in the Nubian, Egyptian, Mediterranean, Milu of that period. Four massive Negroid stone heads, in Egyptian type helmets and a Mediterranean type figure standing beside them carved out on a stele with a flowing beard, Semitic nose and turned up shoes. Phoenician merchant captain? Also we find overwhelming evidence of African Egyptian cultural features some of which had lapsed in Egypt for central, centuries but enjoyed a revival in the Nubian period features which had a long and complex evolution in the Mediterranean but seem to have emerged full-born with no archaeological layer of antecedents in the American world. We are later to find bits and pieces dispersing from this initial point of contact. A model of the Phoenician god Melkart in Rio Balsas. Mexico, identification of Hittite glyphs on obsidian disk or coins by Mrs. Verrill in the state of Utah, but also in the most remarkable of combinations and in one single place, a number of reliefs of Negroid dancers side by side with reliefs in Assyrian style, which style was introduced among the Nubian Egyptian models of gods at Thebes by Taharqa's black deputy in the south, Mentu Emhat. A representation of the god Ra in its bird aspect and a sculpture of the Egyptian Sphinx. These were found in a single spot at Monte Alban in the first phase of that civilization, which evolved from the last phase of the Olmec world. What an apparently incongruous combination of elements Negro, Nubian, Egyptian, Assyrian. We can see quite clearly from our outline of history how natural to that period was such a cultural fusion. But it led Egon Kish, a German journalist, to cry out in rhetorical despair. Quote, Is there any other spot on earth so completely enwrapped in darkness, so mute in the face of all our questions? What tribe, what race, once dwelt at the foot of Monte Alban? Who were the builders? Who were the architects of these pagan temples? What were the tools of the stonemasons made of? How to explain why several of the urn figures seem to depict an Egyptian sphinx, another the bird-headed god Ra, and why the reliefs in the gallery of the dancers are partly in Assyrian style, partly the portrayal of Negroid types? How? Why? Whence? These elements in combination suggest a crew with Nubian Egyptian troops in command, a navigator of Phoenician ancestry, probably a Hittite or two, a number of Egyptian assistants, such as attended the black kings at Thebes and Memphis, a number of women, like the black Egyptian woman from the pre-classic era of American terracottas, whose resemblance to the Negroid queen Thai, Professor von Wutenau has remarked on. This was a crew that set out on an important mission, therefore was a fair representative or cultural microcosm of the society and place from which it embarked. Did this ship or ships set out to seek iron ore deposits along the vast iron shield of Africa or other conventional metals, all of which because of the war were sorely needed? and got lost by force or storm or treacherous current on the North Atlantic? Or was it a flotilla of refugees fleeing the wrath of the Assyrian Esarhaddon after the discovery of the Nubian Phoenician conspiracy? The quest for metals is the most likely and logical of all possible explanations. For refugees of Phoenicia had no need to flee beyond the pillars of Hercules. The Assyrians lacked the capacity to pursue them to the western extremity of the Mediterranean. Furthermore, Taharqa, facing the first full-scale assault of the Assyrians, would never have committed his badly needed troops to the protection of Phoenicians retreating into the distance of an unknown land. The quest for metals, however, could easily have taken them out into the Atlantic, since it had already taken them to quarry the tin stone of Cornwall. 
This need for metals transcended all other needs. What oil and uranium are to us today, so was iron to the survival of the Egyptian Empire in that time. Iron was to change the world. Egypt's inability to redeem her lack of it was the largest single cause of her defeat. Taharqa and his successor fought, fell back, regrouped and fought again. But the initiative had been lost. The doom of an iron-poor Egypt was imminent. The Bronze Age was over, and with it Egypt's position of preeminence in the ancient world. End of chapter 8「They came before Columbus, the African presence in ancient America」by Ivan Van Sertema Chapter 9 – African-Egyptian Presences in Ancient America Is there any other spot on earth so completely enwrapped in darkness, so mute in the face of all our questions? How to explain while several of the urn figures seem to depict an Egyptian sphinx, another the bird-headed god Ra, and why the reliefs in the gallery of the dancers are partly in Assyrian style, partly the portrayal of Negroid types. How? Why? Whence? Egon Erwin Kish and Dekugan in Mexico we can trace the progress of man in Mexico without noting any definite Old World influence during this period, 1000 to 650 BC, except a strong Negroid substratum connected with the magicians. Frederick A. Peterson, Ancient Mexico. In 1938, Dr. Matthew Sterling led a joint team from the Smithsonian Institution and the National Geographic Society into the Gulf of Mexico to an obscure spot about a mile outside the village of Tre Zipotes. There, a year earlier, following up a rumor that some Mexican peasants had come upon a huge stonehead in 1858 but had left it to sink back into its grave, Sterling uncovered what looked like the helmeted dome of that head. Spying out the land within the vicinity of this find, Sterling realized that the head was not buried in isolation, but, as certain large mounds indicated, in the company of other huge and probably related objects. To uncover all these would call for a major digging operation. Sterling therefore returned home to raise money and a team to do the digging. That team which he brought back with him into the jungles of Veracruz in 1939 was to unearth some of the most startling archaeological finds in American history. Sterling's description of these finds is steeped in his excitement and wonder. When the first head had completely emerged from the dark alluvial soil, he found it, in spite of its great size, to be carved from a single block of basalt and to be a head only resting upon a prepared foundation of unworked slabs of stone. Cleared of the surrounding earth, it presented an awe-inspiring spectacle. Despite its great size, the workmanship is delicate and sure, and proportions perfect. Unique in character among Aboriginal American sculptures, it is remarkable for its realistic treatment. The features are bold and amazingly Negroid in character. This Negroid head was found only ten miles away from the source of the stone from which it was made. The basalt had come from the base of Mount Tuxtla, but was extraordinarily was that the single block of stone from which Native Americans had chiseled this portrait was six feet high and eighteen feet in circumference, weighing over ten tons. To bring it from the base of the mountain to the place where it was found called for it to be transported over a 30-foot deep gorge. 
This problem, remarked Sterling, would tax the ingenuity of an engineer with the benefit of modern machinery. The ancient engineers, however, performed the feat of successfully quarrying a flawless block of basalt and transporting it in perfect condition without the aid of the wheel or domestic animals. As the diggings at this location continued, a long slab of stone was found, a stele, with dots and crosses, which, when deciphered, yielded a precise date, November 4, 291 B.C. This dating caused an uproar in archaeological circles, and the Herbert Spenden scale for calculating American time inscriptions, which had been used to arrive at this date, was vigorously challenged. Ten years later, carbon dating, which were only introduced as late as 1946 into archaeological studies, were made at a different site, Tikal in Guatemala, and these proved that the spending reading of American dots and crosses in no way overestimated the antiquity of objects. It was far more accurate, these carbon-14 tests established, than the Goodman-Martinez-Thompson scale, which had given much later dates. The year 291 B.C. was startling enough. It was the earliest date then known for any American cultural find, but greater supply prizes were in store. Larger heads, earlier dates, more important sites were revealed as the diggings in Middle America were extended and intensified. They exposed the false, frail ground upon which the historical outlines of pre-Columbian American history had so far been built. Fourteen years before Sterling's expedition to trade Sabotes, a team from Tulane University had found a giant stone head pushing out of the ground at La Venta in the Mexican state of Tabasco, about 18 miles inland from the Gulf of Mexico. The Tulane team, headed by Franz Blom and Oliver Lafarge, was only passing through the area and did not have time to dig, but it recorded its find in a photograph. Sterling was struck by something in this photograph. Although only the top of the head could be seen, the dome-like helmet on this buried figure seemed to match the one he had excavated at Tres Sapotes. Suspecting a link, he headed toward La Venta on his next expedition. What he found there not only confirmed his suspicions, but made his work at the former site seem minor in comparison. When, after a relentless search, this head eventually emerged, it was found to be eight feet high, and like the one at Tres Sapotes, vividly negroid. A native boy, observing the diggings, had seen outcroppings of stone not far from his father's place and led the expedition to that spot. Three more negroid heads were uncovered. Two of them were so realistic in detail that they even had their teeth carved out, a very unusual thing in American art. Massive, military, menacing, they stood, faces of pure basalt stone, dominating the vast ceremonial plaza in which they were found. The lines of cheek and jaw, the fullness of the lips, the broadly fleshed noses, the acutely observed and faithfully reproduced facial contour and particulars bore eloquent witness to a Negro African presence. One of the Negroi colossi, eight and a half feet high and twenty-two feet in circumference, wore earplugs with a cross carved in each. They all wore headdresses that were foreign and distinctive, domed helmets like those of ancient soldiers. They all faced east, staring into the Atlantic. Four Negroid heads in all were excavated at La Venta, the largest of the four, nine feet high, had its dome top flattened so that it could function as an altar. A speaking tube was found going in at the ear and out of the mouth. It was used as an oracle, a talking god. It was also, according to Sterling, associated with the first construction phase of the ceremonial court, which went through three phases or alterations. 
The significance of this and of other objects found on the site could not be assessed until some very hard dating by scientific methods could be obtained. It was not until excavations in 1955 and 1956 by members of a National Geographic Smithsonian University of California expedition that the carbon-14 datings began. These were published in 1957. They were astonishing. At the place where the Negroid figures in association with the Caucasoid figure with the beard were found, the La Venta ceremonial court, nine samples of wood charcoal were taken. Five of these samples related to the original construction of the court. They gave an average reading of 814 BC, plus or minus 134 years. In other words, the living human figures upon which these heads were modeled could not have appeared at La Venta later than 680 BC and could have entered the Gulf of Mexico any time between the average 800 BC date and the 680 BC date, a period which roughly spans the 25th dynasty of Egypt. Carbon datings cannot be contested, but they must allow for a margin of error about a century either way from the date assessed from the samples of organic material. Most Americanists using other yardsticks to narrow down this margin, agree on 800 B.C. as the earliest date for the Leventa site. A study of the known history of the period spanned by these dates, illuminated by other data, for example aspects of their attire, the relationship of the figures found in juxtaposition, the incidence of foreign cultural elements, may help us to arrive at a more specific dating. I would put it within the nine years between 688 BC, the year of Taharqa's assumption of the double crown of Egypt, his movement north, the beginning of his construction of a new pharaonic palace and gardens at Memphis, the first place of his diplomatic campaign of alliances and military preparation against the Assyrians, and the year 680 BC, the latest possible date for the foreigners to be represented in the first phase of the construction of the ceremonial court. Let it be noted, however, that this is simply a selection of the likeliest period and the likeliest set of circumstances. The capacities, the pressures, the potential maritime trading relationship between the black rulers of Egypt and the Phoenician vassals of Assyria existed all through the period 730 BC to 650 BC. From Pianchi's assumption of power over both Upper and Lower Egypt to the sack of Thebes and the final defeat of Taharqa and his nephew Tanu Taman by the Assyrian king Ashur Bani Pal, the Nubian militia was also a major determinant in Egyptian power politics for centuries preceding the emergence of this black dynasty. Nubia, by her wealth and the power of her army, became a decisive factor in the power politics of Egypt as early as 1085 BC, even before the actual conquest of Egypt by the black kings of Kush. That these aliens entered the Gulf of Mexico during the original construction of the ceremonial court, not later than 680 BC, is borne out by several factors. One was Sterling's discovery of evidence which indicated that the oracular Negroid stone face with the altar on the dome of its head was among the oldest of the figures at the Leventa ceremonial site. Another was the fact that this face and the others were so huge and dominating that they must have affected the shape and size of the ceremonial court itself, presumably built to accommodate and venerate them. La Venta culture itself, or rather, the culture of the Omex, runs from circa 800 to circa 400 BC. The original court was renovated and altered three times, and it is from the sampling of the original construction phase and the three renovation phases that the archaeologists who did the test, Philip Drucker, Robert Heiser, and Robert Squire, 
were able to arrive at the earliest and latest limits of Olmec civilization. During these site construction phases, there is no evidence that any significant culture change occurred. In other words, what began to shape Olmec culture at La Venta in the first construction phase dominated it to the last, 400 to 325 BC, when the Olmecs abandoned the site. This fact is important in establishing the arrival of foreigners in the first phase, not later than 680 BC. For if they arrived afterward, the massive reconstruction work that the sudden and spectacular introduction of the massive stone sculptures would have imposed on the original site and the changes it would have wrought upon the culture would have shown up very clearly in the archaeological evidence. We wish to emphasize says the joint report of the Drucker Heiser Squire team that these later dates refer to site construction phases only not cultural stages we found no evidence of cultural change during the time complex A the ceremonial site was in use the Olmecs were a people of three faces that is a people formed from three main sources or influences one of these faces was mongoloid. Elements of this mongoloid strain may have come into America from Asia even after the famous glacial migration across the Bering Straits. But they would have blended indistinguishably with the Ice Age Americans. The second face or influence was negroid. The third suggests a trace of Mediterranean Caucasoids, some with Semitic noses, probably Phoenician. But this will be shown to be related historically to the second. These faces became one face, to which the broad name Olmec was given. I think it is necessary to make it clear, since partisan and ethnocentric scholarship seems to be the order of the day, that the emergence of the Negroid face, which the archaeological and cultural data overwhelmingly confirms, in no way presupposes the lack of a native originality, the absence of other influences, or the automatic eclipse of other faces. Fusion is the marriage, not the fatal collision of cultures. Leventa was not alone in its depiction of Negroid faces in stone. Apart from the four found there, two were excavated in Tres Sepotes and five at San Lorenzo and Veracruz, one of which, the largest known, is 9 feet 4 inches high. Further archaeological evidence of the Negroid presence in ancient America is found in stone reliefs associated with an American culture which in its first phase was contemporaneous with the last phase of Olmec culture and strongly influenced by it. This was the culture of the Monte Alban located southwest of Leventa in what is known as the Temple of the Danzantes dancing figures a stone faced platform contemporary with the first occupation of Monte Alban is found in a series of base relief figures on large stone slabs over 140 of these figures most of them Negroid types and Negroid mongoloid mixtures seem to be swimming or dancing in a viscous fluid. Some of them are old bearded men. They all have closed eyes, open mouths, and are completely nude. On closer inspection we find that this is no ritual dance at all but men crumpled into grotesque postures by mortal agony. As Michael Cole has pointed out the curiously distorted posture of the limbs, the open mouth, and closed eyes indicate that they are corpses. Other evidence, such as the mutilation of the sex on some of the figures, with a depiction of blood streaming in flowery patterns from the severed part, suggest that they were violently killed. The fact that these corpses were given greater prominence than any other figures at Monte Alban is partly responsible for Michael Cole's assertion that they were undoubtedly chiefs and kings slain by the earliest rulers of Monte Alban. 
We are therefore left with a picture of a group of Negroid and Negroid Mongoloid elements, a second or third generation of the original visitors to La Venta migrating southwest to Monte Alban, only to meet with a violent end. Whatever happened to this migratory group? It did not spell the end to the influence of the Negroid element in early American cultures. This influence, as marked by the distribution of the Negroid colossi, radiated outward from La Venta into Tres Zapotes and San Lorenzo and Veracruz. In the southeastern corner of Veracruz, the state where the largest of the Negroid colossi were found, archaeologists have turned up an Egyptian bas relief carving of a Semite on the back of a Totonac slate mirror. In Monte Alban itself, where the Negroid dancers or death figures were engraved, carvings closely resembling an Egyptian sphinx and the Egyptian god Ra in its bird aspect appear at the same location. Furthermore, when we move with the wave of Olmec culture sweeping slowly down through that narrow corridor of land that joins the two Americas, linking Mexico in the north with the world of Peru in the south, we come upon the most concrete evidence of an Egyptian presence. This is a find of patently Egyptian statuettes, buried three meters deep in the eastern beaches of Acajutla in San Salvador. John Sorensen has documented the find, which is now on exhibit in the Museo Nacional, David J. Guzman, San Salvador. A stratum three meters deep brings us clearly within the centuries of the Negro-Egyptian contact with the Olmec world. What has been made of all this? What theories have been advanced to account for the presence of Negroes in ancient America and for Egyptian and Mediterranean elements in the Olmec heartland? Speculations about an Egyptian influence on pre-Christian America go back almost to the beginnings of Egyptology, long before the discovery and dating of the Negroid heads and Egyptian statuettes in Middle America. These speculations sprang, however, from the pens of Romantics, dazzled by sensational legends of the lost city of Atlantis, or facile diffusionists who saw the world as one vast ecumeny and made sweeping claims for all kinds of old world presences in America, building up their case on the most superficial resemblances, cultural items drawn from all time levels and all possible and impossible places. In their own game of fantasy, they jumped at a hundred items belonging to no one cultural milieu or social complex, no particular or definitive period in old world history. The truth was that until 1955-1956, when carbon datings were at last obtained at the Laventa site, these impatient gentlemen were pounding at a closed door. We were given the keys to this mysterious chamber of history only three decades ago. Constance Irving was the first writer to make known to the general public some of the implications of these discoveries. Before her book appeared in 1963, only a few archaeologists knew about these heads, and the information was relegated to technical journals. Some scholars, finding it embarrassing to their already settled notions of American history, chose to ignore its existence. Some concentrated on the Caucasoid type figure, nicknamed Uncle Sam, rejoicing in the belief that they had at last found proof of a white god of civilization, turning a blind eye on the massive Negroid figure standing beside him. Some picked upon the one smiling Negroid face among the quaternity of heads, nicknaming it Baby Face so as to blur the obvious and inescapable distinction between the colossal 
realistic representations of the aliens in stone and the smooth dwarf-like mongoloid figures in clay and jadeite littered beside them. These little figures, in contrast, were stylized in the typical jaguar motif of the Olmecs, with snarling feline mouths, sexless bodies, and infantile faces. Thus has a generation of scholars contrived to silence and sidestep these uncomfortable discoveries. Irwin stepped into the breach with a bold and plausible theory which seemed at first to tie up most of the pieces. She began by looking closely at strange cultural items on these figures. The blacks wore dome-shaped covers on their heads which looked like quote, football helmets or upturned kettles end quote. The large Caucasoid figure nicknamed Uncle Sam by archaeologists wore quote, turned up shoes end quote. with respect to the latter Irwin pointed out that there were only three peoples in the ancient world during this time that wore turned up shoes these were the Etruscans the Hittites and the Phoenicians the Etruscans she claimed though she hedged this with qualifiers were quote, the least likely to have found their way to American shores. The Hittites were landbound, but apart from that, their empire had disintegrated at the critical period of contact, and they were dispersed in refugee pockets among their neighbors in the Mediterranean, with whom they not only intermingled, but intermarried. Among their neighbors were the Phoenicians, to whom the Hittite custom of turned up shoes diffused. The Phoenicians were, by simple process of elimination, the most logical choice for the identity of the Mediterranean type figure at La Venta. Moreover, they had a good navy. They were trading along the Mediterranean, seeking metal supplies from places far distant from their island complex. To cap it all, a model of the ancient Phoenician god Melkart had turned up in Rio Balsas. Mexico. Miss Irwin then posed the critical question. What did the Phoenicians have to do with the Negroid figures dominating the Laventa ceremonial site? For the answer she turned to an Assyrian source which described Phoenician ambassadors and their servants coming to pay tribute to the Assyrian court circa 849 BC. The source describes the headgear of the servants who, quote, bore kettles on their heads like caps, end quote. Since one or two people had casually mentioned that the Negroid stone figures at La Venta were what looked like upturned kettles, Irwin pounced on the image and suggested that these figures were, quote, a cargo of captured blacks, end quote whom the Phoenicians had turned into their servants, hence the kettle-like caps. Let us look at her source closely. Nowhere does it mention blacks as servants of the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians, in this quotation, came to pay tribute to their Assyrian overlords. They were in a state of humble vassalage during the period dated by the quotation, circa 849 B.C. When the Nubian blacks had gained full independence from Egypt, these blacks in this historical period were servants of no one. The Phoenicians remained in that lowly state all during the time the blacks moved to a position of ascendancy from the 9th to the 7th century BC. The Phoenicians, in fact, during the whole phase of Leventa culture, first phase of Leventa culture, right down to 6 80 BC were either vassals of Assyria or mercenaries and protected traders of a Nubian controlled Egypt. What is more, the quotation has been ingeniously stretched to convey the impression that the kettles were worn rather than born. 
A full, unprejudiced reading simply shows us that every available carrying space on these porter servants was weighted down with tribute. They bore trays of sweetmeats in their hands, boxes laden with blue wool and ingots of gold, silver, and lead on their shoulders and kettles, that is, receptacles of liquid or solid food, on their heads. They bore not war these kettles and the word like in the phrase like caps comes to mean in place of in the manner of and not serving the same function as this style of porterage in which the head is covered or capped by pots or kettles or saucepans of food is quite common to many cultures one does not have to be a clever linguist to see how forced and inauthentic the association is. But there is something else that led to Irvin's assumption that these Negroes were, quote, a car cargo of captured blacks, end quote. After the Assyrians drove the Nubians out of Egypt, they installed a vassal king, Nico. His successor, Nico II, 609-593 BC, assumed mastery of Egypt when Assyrian power was on the decline. He hired Phoenician navigators to circle Africa to see if such a thing were possible. They started out from the Red Sea port of Ezion Geber, proceeded down along the east coast of Africa, rounded the Cape, sailed up along the west coast, and entered the Mediterranean through the Straits of Gibraltar, returning thus to Egypt. The round trip took them three years. Evidence for the authenticity of this trip lies in a very strange reading of the sun's position taken when rounding the Cape, a reading which could not have been invented, the validity of which has been cross-checked by later navigators. What Irwin is suggesting is that somewhere around this time, 613 to 580 BC, her dates, when the Phoenicians were getting acquainted with Africa, they took some West Africans captive, brought them aboard a ship, turned them into their servants, put on the kettle cap, and got themselves blown off course to America. There are three objections to this story. First of all, it is nearly a hundred years later than the latest possible date for the arrival of the Negroid figures at La Venta, 680, not 580 BC. Her downdating is largely influenced by the fact that it was a more favorable period for Phoenician enterprise at sea. I have already pointed to Sterling's evidence that the oracular Negroid figure belongs to the first phase of the construction of the ceremonial site and to the joint report of Drucker, Heiser, and Squire indicating that there was no significant change of culture in the succeeding phases. To place the arrival of the outsiders and their cultural impact in the second phase therefore is irresponsible. Second, if the Phoenicians had made servants of the blacks, why were those so-called captives and servants given such prominence among the Native Americans, dwarfing their so-called masters? There were eleven Negroid colossi in all found in the Olmec world. Four of these dominated the Leventa site. Against these massive figures was one major Mediterranean-type Caucasoid. The Mediterranean figure with a beard is seven feet in height, carved on a stele, which he shares with a headless companion. This is a flat representation or drawing, whereas the Negroid heads are full-bodied, realistic sculptures of great size, nearly ten times larger than life. Do people build monuments and altars and oracles to slaves which surpass in significance, size, and number those representing their masters? 
Here is no attempt whatever to perceive the relationship created by the historical realities of the period. All we have, in spite of a revolutionary pre-Columbian find, is a reactionary post-Columbian reflex. Black man found standing beside white man. Relationship? Black man obviously servant or captive or slave. White man obviously master. History in this conception has not changed one whit. 676 BC, AD 1976. Races and people seemed frozen in an immemorial, immemorial stance. Third, the very kettle cap, which was conveniently clamped upon the heads of the black colossi to bring them down to size as, quote, servants, unquote, turns out upon examination to be the type of battle helmet the Nubians and Egyptians wore in the contact period. This may be demonstrated by a relief from the temple of Ramses III at Medinet Habu, Thebes where a naval battle is in progress between the Egyptians, who wear these helmets with ear flaps, while the enemy wear crests, the Philistine soldiers, and horn helmets, the Sheridan soldiers. James Bailey recognizes these helmets as military apparel, but falls by virtue of the same automatic racial reflex into the same trap as Irwin. He conceives of the blacks in ancient America as, quote, mercenary troops, end quote, of the Phoenicians. It does not occur to him that the Phoenicians were the mercenaries of the Egyptians, and that in that period, in question, they were in no position to make mercenaries of anyone, least of all the blacks, who, as then rulers of Egypt, were their protectors against a common enemy, the Assyrians. He talks glibly about the planting of Phoenician colonies along the seaboard of West Africa, circa 425 BC. Not only is the period too late for our consideration, but the kind of quote, master mercenary unquote, relationship he envisions between the Phoenicians and the blacks has no foundation in history. Moreover, a great number of these so-called colonizers of West Africa were killed, absorbed, or turned into captive and slaves. Even if, to flatter his fantasy, we were to assume that the Phoenicians paid Africans to join their fleet and fight Native Americans for their territory, why should these people, crushed and humiliated by black mercenaries, build altars and monuments to them? out of gratitude for being, quote, civilized? It's the old colonial fairy story. Its patent absurdity may not strike a man who can refer with insensitive and myopic dogmatism to, quote, Africa that never outside Egypt came to anything momentous, end quote. One cannot deny, however, the imagination and scholarship of these two writers. Irwin is sound and cautious on most things. James Bailey, though he traffics in sensational superficialities, has done some impressive research. He throws a wide net over Bronze Age civilizations and brings up a rich catch of relevant and irrelevant oddities. Both share, however, the same basic weakness, an inability to look through the window of ancient history with eyes untinted by the ethnocentric dyes of their day. They and others have begun to provide a new script for the pre-Columbian drama of America. All the characters in the old world seem to have been given new lines, all except the Negro. What was the impact of these aliens, the Negroid and Mediterranean figures, upon Olmec culture? How can we distinguish between what they found on their arrival and what they brought with them? 
how can a responsible list of loans be drawn up that we may deem a reliable index of cultural contact and influence? Vague coincidences abound. We must be wary. Facile comparisons have led romantic diffusionists to claim an old world origin for almost everything found on American soil, from the universal legend of the flood down to the simple bow and arrow. How can we avoid the scylla of radical diffusionism on the one hand and the charbatus of reactionary isolationism on the other? A fairly safe guideline may be set up to pilot us through this perilous minefield. This guideline counsels us to be time specific and culture specific to cite evidence where possible of a long evolution of the habit, artifact, system, or technique in the area of the donor and to demonstrate a lack of known antecedents in that of the recipient. To consider levels of identity in complexity as against superficial stylistic similarity. To think in terms not of single traits but of complexes or clusters of interlocking parallels. A number of important items may be seen to survive this critical test. Let us consider first of all the pyramids. They have a very long history in the Mediterranean world. The type found in America, the step pyramid, may be traced to ancient Babylon and Egypt. It is also known by the name of ziggurat. The ziggurat, step pyramid or stepped temple, is a distinctive, a type of religious architecture as a Chinese pagoda or a Mohammedan mosque. It has been found nowhere in the old world without clear and incontestable proof of diffusion. It goes back 3,000 years before Christ. Among the most noted Egyptian step periods, pyramids are the Pyramid of Djoser at Saqqara, 2750 BC, and the Pyramid of Medum, built for the Pharaoh Seneferu, 2700 BC. There were no pyramids in America before the contact period, 800 to 680 BC. The very first American pyramid or stepped temple appears at La Venta, the site of the colossal Negroid heads and the stele on which is carved the Mediterranean type figure with beard and turned up shoes. Other notable step pyramids in America are the Pyramid of Cholula, dedicated to Quetzalcoatl, 150 BC, and the Pyramid of the Sun at Teotihuacan, near Mexico City. We should also mention the Cerro Colorado Pyramid in the Chicama Valley in northern Peru, where the influence of the visitors to the Gulf of Mexico later diffused. It would appear from the above that the major criterion has been met. There is clear evidence of long evolution of a unique architectural configuration in the area from which the aliens are presumed to have come, and no evidence of antecedents in the area where they landed. Suddenly, in the contact period, the ziggurat or steep temple, a particular kind of Babylonian Egyptian pyramid, begins to appear in America. And not only is the design identical, but like its presumed prototype, it is sun-star oriented and encircled by a precinct. Not only are the shape and religious function the same, but also the astronomical and spatial relationships. There is, however, one serious objection. The Egyptians, it would appear, have stopped building pyramids since 1600 BC particularly this kind of pyramid. In other words, the American pyramid, if it was influenced by aliens in the contact period, would have had to come from an architect in the migrant group who was nostalg nostalgically returning to classical 
or early Egyptian architecture. The heyday of the Egyptian step pyramid was long over. Over in Egypt, yes, but not in Nubia. The black kings of Nubia built the last of the Egyptian type pyramids above their tombs, small but elegant copies, and the last of the steeped temples for sun worship. They also rebuilt and restored a great number of temples which had fallen into disrepair. Nostalgia for the religious and architectural past of Egypt was so strong in Pianchi and Taharka. Pianchi rebuilt the great temple of Ammon, originally built by Thutmosis III and IV, with additions by Ramses II. Taharka erected a magnificent colonnade in the great forecourt of the temple at Karnak. One of these columns is still standing today. He also restored halls of hypostyle columns in the great temple of Amun-Ra at Jebel Barkal. The hypostyle or forest of columns is another architectural feature which we find appearing in America after the contact period. Like the Egyptians and the Native Americans, the Nubians oriented all their religious structures on earth to cardinal points in the heavens. To assist in his architectural schemes, Taharqa in 684 BC called in four experts in reckoning the time by star transits and their astronomical instruments are mentioned. Many of these temples have been beaten into the dust by time. But even as late as 593 BC, a successor of Taharqa, Espelta, built the Sun Temple at Moro, which Herodotus calls the Table of the Sun. It is the steeped type of temple, and fragments of its ruins may still be found. A flight of stone steps or Jacob's Ladder takes us up to the platform at the summit and a colonnade encloses the sanctuary. Reliefs on the walls of this sun temple have motifs that occur on similar temples in ancient Egypt and America, like those showing conquered prisoners supporting the royal foot. Mummification is another extremely interesting case which merits close examination. Few mummies have been unearthed in ancient Mexico because of the corrosive humidity, but we have indisputable proof of Mexican mummification nonetheless. One of the best examples is the mummified figure in the sarcophagus at Palenque. Three features of this Palenque burial indicate an Egyptian influence. The jade mask on the face of the dead, the fact of mummification itself, and the flared base of the sarcophagus. With respect to the latter, it should be noted that Egyptians made sarcophagi with a flared base to enable them to stand them up because their bur burials were vertical. The Egyptians built their mummy cases of wood, and these cases were often stood on end. The flared base feature affording them stability in the standing position. The Mexicans, like the Nubians, buried in a horizontal position, yet at Palenque the flared base is retained although it serves no function. The retention of such a non-functional element, especially when, as in this case, considerable time and effort went into chiseling the flared base out of stone, is among the clearest indications of an influence. A borrowed artifact often goes through an initial period of slavish imitation before it is restructured to suit local needs. Both horizontal and vertical burials occur in the royal graveyards of Nubia. Egyptian and native Nubian burial customs coexist for a while and then fuse. Arkel has noted that more Egyptian, the burial, the poor, poorer are the grave furnishings, indicating that the black kings whose tombs, though plundered, are obviously much richer, reta retaining around them a nucleus of Egyptian assistance, 
architects, scribes, priests. Egyptian mummification techniques, which originated in pre-dynastic black Africa and were developed and refined in the dynastic period, are most in evidence in Peru. There, in the desert sands, we find very specific and ample evidence of the Egyptian influence. Evidence of mummification, however, is widespread in ancient North America as the practice diffused from the Mexican heartland. The Indian tribes of Virginia, of North Carolina, the Congarese of South Carolina, the Indians of the Northwest Coast of Central America, and those of Florida practiced this custom as well as the Incas. In Colombia, the inhabitants of Darien used to remove the viscera and fill the body cavity with resin. Afterwards, they smoked that is, fumigated the body and preserved it in their houses. The Muiscas, the Aleutians, the inhabitants of Yucatan and Chiapas also embalmed the bodies of their kings, of their chiefs, and of their priests by similar methods. Dr. Haddon, in 1908, showed that certain refined techniques in mummification, which were later found in America, and also in East and West Africa and the Canary Islands were not adopted in Egypt until the time of the 21st dynasty 1090 to 945 BC some scholars have claimed that the practice of mummification diffused to America from Asia but Elliot Smith has very ably demonstrated the early spread of this practice to the Far East from Egypt as we shall go on to show the identity of the Egyptian with the American technical formula in some places rules out an Asian middleman preceding the Nubian Egyptian because it is not simply the act or practice of mummification which is in question but the transmission of an identity and complexity of the technical formula mummification as a chemical process had been taken to such a state of refinement in Egypt that in March 1963 biologists at the University of Oklahoma confirmed that the skin cells of the ancient Egyptian princess many were capable of living. The ancient Egyptians after thousands of years had come close to the threshold of the secret of physical immortality. The chemical formula by which this remarkable state of preserving Princess Many was achieved had been arrived at through centuries of experimentation. Yet we find in Peru not only the same manner of evisceration through the anus and the same manner of swaddling the corpse in ritual bandages, but according to Professor L. Ruder, who has made an analysis of embalming mixtures in Peru, the antiseptic substances used in embalming are identical with those used in ancient Egypt. Balsam, menthol, salt, tannin, alkaloids, saponins, and undetermined resins. The ingredients are common enough. The formula is very complex and elusive. What is perhaps even more astonishing is that the Egyptians buried parts of the corpse in four canopic jars. These were called Horus jars, since they were dedicated to the Horuses of the four cardinal points. Certain internal organs were placed in the north jar, small viscera, the south jar, stomach and large intestines, the west jar, liver and gall, and the east jar heart and lungs. Colors were associated to these cardinal points. This color configuration associated with the Horus jars reappears in the cardinal color scheme of ancient Mexico. Thus we have a red north in ancient Egypt and Mexico, a white south, a dark west, black in Egypt, blue in Mexico, and a golden east yellow is the equivalent color for gold in Mexico. This is no simple accident. 
Chinese and other Asian Aboriginal color schemes differ radically in this connection. Moreover, mummies examined in ancient Peru toward the end of the Olmec phase of civilization show that foreign elements, both Negroid and Caucasoid, seem to have entered the native South American population, 400 to 300 BC. Dr. M. Trotter, doing a hair analysis on pieces of a scalp from Paracas mummies in Peru, reported in 1953 that the cross-section form shows so much divergency between the different mummies that they cover all divisions of hair form. Dr. Trotter, under cross-questioning by Thor Heyerdahl, indicated that hair color and texture need alter only slightly through post-mortem dehydration and fading. Also, an examination of skeletons in the area, simultaneously conducted by T.D. Stewart, demonstrated the presence of races of greater average height and a different cephalic index head shape than the Aboriginal Americans. Heyerdahl's questioning of Trotter and his interview with the mummy specialist W.R. Dawson elicited information that can clearly establish the Mediterranean presence in America through these mummies. But his overwhelming desire to prove the Europoid presence, probably Phoenician, makes him defensively selective in presenting his information, which equally suggests Negroid elements, mulatto, curly-haired Egyptians, and a good deal of racial intermixtures. Dogs were also mummified by the Egyptian pharaohs. The Nubian kings, on the other hand, were fascinated by horses, and Pianchi, who raged after his victory at Hermopolis because his horses had been badly fed during the siege, started burying horses in the royal graves instead. The full team of four that drew the royal chariot were buried beside the king, and through the grave, though the grave robbers stripped the chariots of their useful parts, remains of the rich trappings were found, including plume carriers, silver headbands, beads, and amulets. Yet, in spite of this departure from the Egyptian type of burial, the coexistence of the two cultures was preserved by a symbolic Nubian homage to the dog. The Egyptian dog-headed god Anubis graces the Nubian funerary offering tables. These offering tables found in the graves with invocations to the gods written in the Nubian script, Morotic, show the god Nephthys and the dog-headed god Anubis both concerned with the cult of the dead, pouring libations. In this very period, the Olmecs began to sculpt little clay dogs attached to wheels or to tiny chariots with wheels. In this particular blend of dog and chariot lies virtually their only use of the wheel. The lack of the horse or other draught animals of comparable size precluded a more practical use. How they struck upon this ritual association, dog, wheel, chariot, is an intriguing question. The full-blown Egyptian practice, however, of mummifying dogs has been found in Peru. What is even more intriguing is that these dogs mummified in Peru do not all look like the typical American Spitz and Husky types. Some look uncannily like the Basenji, the species of Egyptian dog worshipped by the pharaohs. The only surviving species of this dog is found today in Africa, where it is used by the pygmies of the Itori forest to track and chase game. It is a very distinctive type and with regal appearance. It stands with feet well apart and ears so taut that they look like webbed antennae. This dog became a great pet in ancient Egypt because it has no body odor and it makes no noise. It is known as the barkless dog. It is upon this animal that the dog-headed god of Egypt and Nubia was modeled. 
Columbus reports a species of barkless dog during his voyages to the Caribbean. The Basenji answers to the description in his journals. Other similarities in burial customs have been noted such as twisted rope designs on sarcophagi, golden mummy mask such as the Chimu mask of Peru, and a small hole in the top slabs of death chambers for the release of the soul or the flight of the bird of death. Twisted rope designs are first noted in America on altar one of the Laventa site and they later appear on Mexican coffins. The style, according to one investigator, barely, is quote-unquote North Syrian. The resemblance is rather superficial, although it is not difficult to conceive of a member of the ancient party carrying it over from that area which neighbored the Egyptian Phoenician states. With respect to the golden mummy mask, coffins cast in Nubian gold with the detailed features of the mummified kings are not unknown in Egypt. An example is the golden coffin of Tutankhamun with elaborate facial detail. The golden mummy mask as such however is not common to either Egypt or Nubia. Though in the latter case these masks might have disappeared with the plundered mummies since the golden mummy mask as a ritual practice appears later in the tombs of African chiefs and kings, Irwin has suggested a Phoenician influence for the golden mummy mask in Mexico, and this cannot be ruled out. Phoenicians, though mercenary seamen in this period, in the pay of the Nubian Egyptian forces, were an element in the mixed party. While they were obviously of a lower order of importance, as the Olmec sculptures suggest, they must have had some influence. Golden mummy masks appear in some of the Phoenician tombs, though mummification was practiced in Phoenicia only occasionally and in a much cruder form than in Egypt. The holes in death chambers for the flight of the soul or death bird are not on the same level of uniqueness or ritual complexity as other burial customs we have discussed and could quite easily have been a coincidence. One other burial practice common to ancient Egypt and Mexico is worth mentioning, if only for the sake of showing how carefully we must apply our test in the study of cultural similarities. This burial ritual involved the placing of a green stone in the mouth of the corpse. Both the Egyptians and the Mexicans saw this green stone as a symbol of the heart and as the prolonger of life. The Egyptians, among whom it took the form of a green scarab, addressed it thus, quote, My heart, my mother, my heart, whereby I came into being. End quote. The Mexicans placed the Chalchiltu, green amulet, between the lips of the deceased, and they also associated it with life restorative properties. In fact, they called it Quote, the principle of life, unquote. The green stone in the mouth of the dead, however, is a very primitive ritual indeed. One may even say primordial. It precedes Egyptian civilization by thousands of years. It was found between the teeth of some of the Cro-Magnon skeletons in the Grimaldi caves near Menton. The very ancient Chinese also placed green jade amulets in the mouth to preserve the body from decay. Pearls and shells as mouth amulets of the dead were substituted for jade. Pearls for feudal laws, lords, shells for ordinary officials, jade reserved for stuffing the mouths of dead emperors. Since we find such a custom in vogue even as far back as the origination stage of Cro-Magnon culture, it might well have traveled from Asia to America in the glacial epoch, when the very first Americans crossed over to this continent on the bridge of ice in their two major migrations, now calculated to be 40 and 25,000 years ago. Some ritual practices that are almost identical in America and Egypt which we may safely date from the Olmecs onward 
and which point to an outside influence are the wearing of false beards by high priests. The ritual use of a purple as an exclusively royal and priestly color, incest between royal siblings, and a complex of royal paraphernalia such as the ceremonial umbrella and litter and the bird serpent motif and coats of arms and royal diadems. Here we have not one but a cluster of closely linked parallels, some of which are unique to these two areas, and some of which, like the wearing of artificial beards, are highly unusual among the beardless American Indians. Heyerdahl has, with a graphic brilliance, indicated the statistical improbability of so many parallels occurring in two culture areas independently, especially when they are known to be joined by a marine conveyor belt. A single culture element found to appear at both ends of a natural sea route, wrote Heyerdahl, may very well be the result of coincidence or independent evolution along parallel lines. To become a reasonable indicator of conduct, contact, a whole array of identities or similarities of extraordinary nature must be concentrated in the two areas linked by land bridge or marine conveyor belt. What confronts us on both sides of the Atlantic are arrays of cultural parallels and when these are dealt with as complexes, we are faced by amazing statistical indications. When the whole list of Mediterranean American parallels are considered together as an entity, then the probability of diffusion rather than independent development does not increase arithmetically but exponentially. For instance, a cluster of 12 parallels grouped together, say, in Mesopotamia and Mexico, does not weigh 12 times heavier in the discussion than a single parallel, but rather, according to the laws of probability, has increased its significance by a truly astronomical amount. Among other things, this means that the isolationist technique of negating these parallels one by one by labeling them coincidence is mathematically invalid. The artificial beard worn by kings and priests is one of the ancient mysteries of Mexico. For the native Mexican as we know him has no hair on his chin. The Ainu of Japan are hairy Asiatics and there is evidence for a pre-Columbian presence of Japanese in America. The Ainu could have been one of the earliest American races emigrating to this continent from Asia. Also, the black stream, the Koru Siwu, has occasionally cast remnants of J Japanese crews onto the American Pacific coast. White bearded figures hunted down in a part of 16th century South America were found to be Japanese. And there is evidence, Jomon pottery, for a late pre-Columbian Japanese influence in Ecuador. All this, however, does not seem to explain the high ritual value placed upon the beard. The pharaohs and sometimes the high priests of Egypt and Nubia wore false beards. These were highly stylized appendages, smooth, long, and terminating in a blunt, square tuft. The abstract idea of the beard as a badge of high office may have been influenced by Nubian Egyptian culture, but the literal image of the beard, textured and tapered, as it is usually represented, was inspired no doubt by quite ordinary human figures. Figures most likely from the same party of foreigners. Among these we may consider the Mediterranean Caucasoid figure at Laventa. In fact, 
he is the only one who so far has been considered as a likely candidate for the influence of the un-American beard. We should also bear in mind that the smooth-chinned Negroid figures in stone are not the only type of Negro African who came in during this period. Von Wuthenau has demonstrated through, through his terracottas that there were other ancient Negroid figures in America equipped with beards. Another practice common to Egypt, Nubia, and Mexico is that of royal incest. It is unique to these societies. Royal incest among siblings, brother and sister, is the rarest social institution in the world. In spite of the horror incest arouses in all human societies, secret incestuous relationships may be fairly common. But there are only three societies in the world, Egypt, Nubia, and Mexico, where incest was actively encouraged in the royal family, incest between full-blooded brother and sister. The black Nubian king, Tanutamen, was succeeded who succeeded Taharka was the product of such an incestuous union. See chapter 8. Egyptian royal incest belongs to an earlier period, and therefore we may say that only two societies in the world at the time, 800 to 700 BC, practiced royal incest between siblings, Nubia and Mexico. The Egyptians who had practiced it, practiced it in the belief that they were kings of the sun and that it would keep solar blood from dilution had abandoned the practice before the contact period. The Egyptian pharaohs started to marry Mitannian wives from hither Asia and thus broke with the purity of solar blood. Thus we find solar blood diluted in the veins of the pharaohs at the end of the 23rd dynasty. The black kings of Kush resurrected this custom and for the very same reason as it was practiced earlier in Egypt and later in Mexico. Other practices common to the two culture areas are the use of the umbrella and litter as royal prerogatives. Today these items are so common and have such vulgar functions the umbrella for weather protection the litter for the sick or wounded that it is difficult to conceive of their unique ritual use and value as an index of high rank in the Egyptian Nubian and Mexican worlds Professor Varin has demonstrated the use of the umbrella as an emblem of dignity and power in ancient times and a visual comparison of the Mexican royal umbrella with that hovering over the black Nubian princess in the tomb painting of Hoy, also of the litters used for transport of royalty in Mexico with those used in Mesopotamia. Prototypes of the Egyptian litters startled by their identity of appearance and function. The religious value of Morex purple and its use to distinguish priests and kings and people of high rank from the common herd has its origins in the Mediterranean. First evidence of the extraction of the purple dye from the Morex shell occurs in Crete in 1600 BC, but the religious value attached to it was a consequence of the peculiar behavior of the Nile. In ancient Egypt, the riddle of life was read in the Nile, which, as it rose in the flood, turned green, red, and yellowish, and then blue. The fluid of the Morex shell, barring a tin or two, behaved in almost the same way, turning from a yellowish cream to green, then blue like the Nile, before acquiring its final fixed purple. It thus revealed by its sequence of colors, green, yellowish, blue, the various attributes of the Nile deity. This accounts for the enormous sanctity attached to shell purple, which according to Besnier was considered not only a noble and sacred color by the Egyptians, but emblematic of the power of the gods. 
The Phoenicians of Tyre and Sidon adopted the industry and Tyrian purple became famous in the Mediterranean, particularly in Egypt, with which the Phoenicians did most of their trade. It thenceforth diffused through the old world. Purple yielding shells were searched for far and wide and in the western Mediterranean. Purple dye centers were established. The Phoenicians obtained from the British Isles while shipping for their tin in Cornwall a dark shade of shell purple called black purple. Kitchen middens in Cornwall have yielded traces of the ancient industry. Traces of the ancient people Ancient purple industry have also been found in Mexico, and here the same value and function is attached to it. Also the same extraordinary association with the conch shell trumpet to summon the deity. Zelia Nuttall has published a paper entitled A Curious Survival in Mexico of the Use of the Purpura Shellfish for dying. She shows in the Natal Codex pictures of no fewer than 13 women of rank in Mexico wearing purple skirts and five with capes and jackets of the same color. In addition, 45 chieftains are figured with short fringed rounded purple waist cloths and there are also three examples of the use of a close fitting purple cap purple yielding shells broken for the dyeing industry have also been taken from the Inia graves excuse me Inca graves in North Chile purple is one of those colors that do not come naturally and easily as J Wilford Jackson points out in shells as evidence of the migration of early cultures the method of its production is a complex and difficult process. Moreover, the ancient purple industry, because of its marine nature, was conducted by Mediterranean mariners and became associated with pearl fishing and the use of the artificially devised conch shell trumpet. The earliest use of the conch shell trumpet, according to Professor Smith, was in the Minoan worship in Crete where the purple industry started. Thence it spread far and wide until it came to play a part in religious services in the Mediterranean, in India and in Central Asia, in Indonesia and Japan, in Oceania and America. It was supposed to have the definite ritual object of summoning the deity. In addition to the ritual use of the conch shell trumpet, identical in the Egyptian and American worlds, Jackson finds an intimate relationship between this purple industry and conch shell trumpets and weaving, as well as mining, working, and trafficking in metals, gold, silver, copper. In Mexico and Peru, the purple industry was also associated with these pursuits. The ritual use of purple as an index of rank, therefore, and the extraction of purple and the religious use of the artificial conch shell to summon the deity, and the further association of all this with weaving and metalworking, is one of the most remarkable complexes of interlocking parallels found between Mediterranean and ancient New World civilizations. The Phoenician Egyptian Nubian link and the joint influence in the mixed crew of shipwrecks is almost clearly seen in this connection. The Egyptian Nubian religious link to the Nile, which gave the Morex purple shell its sanctity, the Phoenician maritime enterprise, which exploited the Cretan discovery of the shell milk as an indelible dye and the conch shell trumpet as a summoner of the divine the use of Tyrian purple among the pharaohs and high priests of Egypt and Nubia are all seen in the later duplication of this royal and priestly use of purple 
which with all of its complex associations by the Mexicans and Peruvians. Since weaving and metalworking were among the pursuits associated with the purple dye manufacturers, weaving techniques such as the loom and metallurgical techniques such as the refined metal casting process known as the lost wax technique were carried from one end of the Mediterranean to the other and so diffused through the old world. An examination of these two technological achievements in the old world and the new provides us with further proof of an influence. Although Native Americans in Peru were weaving cloth as early as 2500 BC, they were not using the loom. Dr. Junius Bird discovered cotton fabrics at Huaca Prieta in Peru, carbon dated 2500 BC. But 78% of the 3,000 pieces of cotton cloth examined were twined and the rest netted. Two of the simplest methods of producing fabrics without a loom. When a loom of the horizontal type appeared in Peru, it was found to be identical with a horizontal loom depicted in an Egyptian tomb. When the vertical loom appeared in Peru, it was identical with those found in a tomb at Thebes. The Sacred Capital of the Black Kings Both the New World and Old World looms had the same 11 working parts. To be even more specific, it has been shown that the vertical frame loom with two warp beams used by the Incas was the same as that used in Egypt in the New Kingdom, 18th to 20th Dynasty, circa 1400 to 1100 BC. The second of the two types of Peruvian looms, the horizontal loom staked out on the ground as used in the Titicaca Basin was also the same as that of ancient Egypt. Spindle whorls also used in weaving were so identical in Egypt, the Mexican capital of Tula and in Peru that laid side by side, even an expert can scare, scarcely tell them apart. The metal casting technique known as the lost wax or Sire Perdue method is far more complex than the loom and far more unlikely to appear in a place where metals were just luxuries, having a ritual rather than a utilitarian value. Metals in Egypt and Nubia could make all the difference to success and defeat in battle. Metal trafficking was one of the mainstays of Phoenician trade. Metal hunger was the inspiration of many maritime explorations and migrations, but the ancient Americans, as Frederick Dellenbaugh has pointed out, were unacquainted with the common use of metals. They worked metals all right, silver, gold, and copper, but to a limited extent and in an ornamental way. Ancient American weapons are not of copper and bronze, but of flint and obsidian and stone. Metals were mainly used to protect and animate the living and the dead, and were offered as gems to the gods. There is no archaeological witness to the stages preceding their sudden leap into highly refined casting techniques developed by people producing metals in vast quantities for a mass utility purpose. It took centuries of experimentation in the Mediterranean, for example, to reduce tin simply to a subsidiary element or alloy in the production of bronze from its sovereignty as a metal in itself. Yet there is not a single object made entirely of tin by the ancient Americans. The Americans jumped that step mysteriously and we find them according to C. W. Mead, a curator of Peruvian archaeology 
who has analyzed bronze pieces in ancient Peruvian graves, using only 6 or 7% of tin in their bronzes, a technical achievement re reached by only the best of the Mediterranean bronze workers. The ancient European bronzes had an average of tin alloys as high as 10%. As for the lost wax technique used in Egypt and Nubia from where it diffused to the Yoruba and Bini of Nigeria via Moro, capital of the Black Kings after their retreat from Egypt, it is a technique that appears nowhere in the Old World without some indication of diffusion from the Mediterranean center. Metal casting is a highly technical operation and the lost wax me method is far superior to the common sand process. It is considered especially good for reproducing faithfully delicate and intricate detail. The following brief summary of the technique is presented to give some impression of the complexity of the process which has been found copied by the ancient metal casters of the New World. The first step in the lost wax method of casting is the making of a mold which bears in reverse the details of the object to be cast. This is usually dusted with finely ground charcoal and made ready for the wax cast. The inside of the mold is painted with molten wax which is then reinforced with sheets of warm wax pressed against it. The thickness of the wax must be controlled so that it does not exceed the desired thickness of the final cast in bronze, gold or silver. The mold is then taken off leaving a hollow wax replica. An opening or vent is made in the object to carry off the melting wax during the baking of the final mold. This final mold is made of a heat resisting semi-liquid compound poured into the wax mold to form the core and built up around the outside to form a jacket. The whole thing is put into a blast furnace. Even this has been found to be identical in design in Egypt and America and baked for a couple of days until the wax has melted away. The mold is then removed from the furnace. Molten gold, bronze or silver is poured into the opening in the mold and fills the space left empty by the melting of the lost wax cast. When the metal cools the jacket is broken away and the job is done. Many of the Mediterranean type technical processes burial customs and royal priestly rituals that mark Olmec culture in the Mexico of the north are found in the Chavin Kapisnik culture in the Peru of the south. These are contemporary centers of American civilization. Early Chavin levels have been carbon dated 848 plus or minus 167 years BC and the movement of major aspects of culture from the one to the other has been clearly established. They even share the central feline motif. An Egyptian surgical procedure found in both ancient Mexico and Peruvian civilization is trepanning or trepanation. It was performed on the skulls of Egyptian Nubian soldiers among others to relieve pressure caused by blows on the skull. Hippocrates recommended it in an essay on injuries of the head. Doctors in ancient Egypt, Mexico and Peru removed plaques of bone from the skull and in many cases the operation was remarkably successful. Skulls examined in Peru indicate absence of signs of infection and a new growth of normal bone in and about the wound. There are very few cases in which post-operative infection of the skull set in, leading to lethal decay, indicated by a vast cavity. An examination of skulls in Egypt, Mexico, and Peru 
upon which this operation was performed showed square and circular holes in the skull. The skull bone was penetrated by scraping, cutting, or drilling the bone. The Egyptians have left us their surgical papyri. The surgical books of the New World lie in the thousands of skulls examined in America, particularly in Peru, where the paleontological evidence is more ample. Skull deformation, deliberately practiced by the Egyptian and ancient American upper class to distinguish them physically from their subjects, is another remarkable trait which seems restricted to these two culture areas. Another shared feature often noted and calling for serious examination is that of fitting megalithic masonry. The finest examples are found at Giza in Egypt, at Lixis in Morocco where it diffused, at Sac Sahuaman in Cuzco in Peru, and across the Pacific from Peru and on Easter Island. The technique calls for considerable skill since the massive stone blocks fitted together are not of any regular shape or size, not cut into conventional squares for example, but display the complex regularity of patterns or designs in a jigsaw puzzle. No cement is used in the building of these massive blocks, so wonderfully exact is the masonry work of which they are composed. The identical methods of quarrying in the New and Old Worlds, which Seaton Lloyd's study has demonstrated, may account for this extraordinary building technique. Both the ancient Egyptians and Americans quarried stone by driving wooden wedges into natural faults in the stone, which cracked when the wedges filled with water. It may be that a whole natural wall of stone or a cliff face was transported in its entirety from the quarry and its separate bits and pieces. This would account for the irregularly divided blocks being put together again by the masons into a tightly fitting pattern. These pieces or blocks were probably broken off the quarry wall at these points where natural forts were exploited to break up the stone. They were then reconstructed as one reconstructs the irregularly shaped but naturally fitting pieces of a jigsaw. Similar responses to a similar problem may lead to an independent but similar solution. There may have been no other practical method by which massive stone blocks could have been quarried in the old world through fitted megalithic masonry in itself is unique to an area in the old world where a certain complex of cultural traits has been found, while the method of quarrying stone therefore might have been coincidental, this method of building walls and fortifications certainly was not. The identical technique occurred to no other people outside of this interconnected complex. Far more arbitrary, however, than a construction technique of this unusual nature is the construction of certain of the world's calendars. Even if astronomical science was as advanced in the Olmec world as it was in Egypt and Nubia before the 800 and 700 BC contact, it could not have led to the whole series of coincidences to be observed in one of the Mexican calendars. The Abbe Hervas, a Franciscan priest writing to the historian Clavigero, highlights the remarkable conformity between the ancient Egyptian and Mexican calendars. The Mexican year, the Abbe Hervas wrote, began upon the 26th of February, a day celebrated in the era of Nabu Nassar which was fixed by the Egyptians 747 years before the Christian era. For the beginning of their month, Toth corresponded with the meridian of the same day. If those periods fixed also on this day as an epoch, because it was celebrated in Egypt, we have here the Mexican calendar agreeing with the Egyptian. 
but independent of this, it is certain that the Mexican calendar conformed greatly with the Egyptian. On this subject, Herodotus says that the year was first regulated by the Egyptians who gave to it twelve months of thirty days and added five days to every year that the circle of the year might revolve regularly. That the principal gods of the Egyptians were twelve in number and that each month was under the tutelage and protection of one of these gods. The Mexi Mexicans also added to every year five days, which they called Nemontemi, or useless, because during these days they did nothing. Plutarch says that on such days the Egyptians celebrated the festival of the birth of the gods. The Abbey Hervas goes on to show that the Mexican month was in ancient times like the Egyptian, but for some reason the time reckoning was later altered. The Mexic Mexicans received the lunar month from their ancestors, but for certain purposes instituted another. Under the first and older system, dating like the Egyptian from February 26, 747 BC, the Mexicans arrived at the same total for the year as did the ancient Egyptians. 360 days, a number as the Abbey Hervas points out, which from time immemorial has ruled in geometry and astronomy, and is of the utmost particularity on account of its relation to the circle which is divided into 360 parts or degrees. The Egyptian influence may be traced not only to those three aspects we have noted, namely the time the Me Mexicans began to count the years, February 26, 747 BC, the 12 lunar manches corresponding to the 12 Egyptian gods, the five useless or dateless festival days, it may also be seen in the symbols of the Mexi Mexican months. Respecting the symbols of the Mexican months and year, the Abbey Hervis observes, they discover ideas entirely conformable with those of the ancient Egyptian. The latter distinguished as appears from their monuments each month or part of the zodiac where the sun stood, which characterized figures of that which happened in every season of the year. Therefore we see the signs of Aries, Taurus, and the two young goats, which are now Gemini, used to mark the months of the birth of those animals. The signs of Cancer, Leo, and Virgo with the ear of corn for those months in which the sun goes backwards like a crab in which there is greater heat and in which the harvests are reaped. The sign of the scorpion which in the Egyptian sphere occupied the space which at present is occupied by the sign of Libra and that of Sagittarius in the months of virulent or contagious distempers, and lastly, the signs of Capricorn, Aquarius, and Pisces, in those months in which the sun begins to ascend toward others, in which it rains much, and in which there is abundant fishing. These ideas are similar to those which the Me Mexicans associated with their clime. Other symbols, extremely arbitrary symbols, have been found in use by both the ancient Egyptians and the Mexicans. The sun devoured or encircled by a serpent is one of these. In the Mexican symbol, we see the sun as it were eclipsed by the moon and surrounded with the serpent which makes four twists and embraces the four periods of thirteen years. This very idea of the serpent, which the sun has from time immemorial, 
signified the periodical or annual course of the sun. We know that in astronomy the points where the eclipses happen have from time immemorial been called the head and tail of the dragon. The Egyptians agree with the Mex Mexicans for, for to symbolize the sun they employed a circle with one or two serpents. The symbol of the serpent is a thing totally arbitrary to signify the sun with which it has no physical relation. Wherefore then I ask have nations which have had no reciprocal intercourse agreed in using one same symbol so arbitrary and chose to express it by the same object. This then is the case for contact between Egypt and the New World in the 800 to 700 BC period, a period in which the blacks of Nubia had gained ascendancy over the Egyptian Empire and appeared according to carbon-14 datings in the Olmec world of Mexico as monumental figures, venerated and revered. These are some of the important influences this alien crew of shipwrecks left upon the face of ancient American culture. Many other claims have been made, but we have confined ourselves to those that can pass a rigorous test and eliminated those such as the Egyptian sandal of coiled rope, the Egyptian throwing stick, the simple fish hook and blowgun, also all so called similarities in art styles and such or symbols without a complex history rooted in particular circumstances originating in the Egyptian Mediterranean world. A critical but open-minded skepticism is needed in these comparative studies if we are to lift the tenor of the debate on pre-Columbian context between Africa and the New World from the level of the fanciful and the romantic. All the features of Egyptian culture noted above were duplicated in the Nubian Egyptian culture complex of the 25th dynasty. This phenomenon of separate yet parallel identity emerges with a great clarity when the historical and archaeological data of the period are closely examined. The master-colonial relationship between Egypt and Nubia had ceased. Nubia became the inheritor and custodian of a culture which took as much from black Africa as black Africa was later to take from it. Nubia was so much a part of Egypt that, as Professors Steindorf and Seal have pointed out, it tenaciously held fast to Egyptian culture in latter times when Egypt herself succumbed to foreign influences. When the Greeks came into the valley of the Nile in the 7th century BC, it was Nubia which was considered the seat of orthodox Egyptian character. End of chapter 9 They Came Before Columbus, The African Presence in Ancient America by Ivan Van Schertema Chapter 10 Plants and Transplants The adoption of a new plant is no simple matter. It requires the adoption of a whole complex of knowledge about the plant's ecological requirements and often also about the human usages of the plant. The presence of even one transferred plant means that a quite effective contact has been made between two peoples. G. F. Carter, Movement of People and Ideas in Plants and Migrations, edited by J. Barrow. If someone could only prove that even a few of the basic crop plants of American origin were universally distributed in cultivation in both hemispheres in pre-Columbian times, one might be more lenient in judging the matter. E. D. Merrill Observations on Cultivated Plants with Reference to Certain American Problems 
Part 1 African Ancestors of American Cotton Professor Stevens peered into the pale super, superqueous light of the tank. Three weeks had now passed since the cotton seeds were taken out of cold storage and set afloat on the artificial seawater. It was impossible, of course, to simulate all the complex conditions of the ocean in a laboratory tank. The ocean had its own inimitable surfaces, the calm of glass, the turbulence of lava, its own tones of utter darkness, and soft subterranean lights, its billion fins and flow, its drift, its detritus. But the important thing in this experiment was the salination and temperature of the water, and he had tried to reproduce this as best he could by adding 35 grams of common table salt to each liter of water and by varying the temperature between 25 and 31 degrees centigrade. He had also changed the water at monthly intervals and not, as in 1964, kept the seeds in a tank under constant aeration forcing air into the system by means of a small aquarium pump. This aeration had had a curious effect on some of the fibers still attached to the cotton seeds, charging them with air bubbles. He had not counted on that, and he had assured himself it might actually help flotation enhance, perhaps, the buoyancy of the seeds. The experiment, however, had ended rather disappointingly. He had abandoned it after two months, since by that time there were hardly any seeds afloat. The new 1965 experiment was more complex. He had introduced a number of things, including tests on the viability of the seeds, their capacity to germinate even after sinking. His eyes moved slowly from one container to the other, studying closely each seed in the critical samples. There were 50 seeds to each sample. Several botanists had collected them from various parts of the world. Doctors Godillo, Kerr, Fosberg, Martorell, Gilham, and himself from the Pacific Islands, the Caribbean, and the African Atlantic coast. The direction and speed of currents in the oceans and the points of possible departure and arrival had been carefully studied. The purpose of the experiment was to discover whether the various types of cotton got from one point to the other through simple drift across the surface of the oceans. In the first experiment, he had been primarily concerned with wild forms of cotton found in the South Pacific Islands and the Caribbean. A variety of the New World species, Gossipium hirsutum, had been found growing wild on several Caribbean islands from a point on the coast of Venezuela right through the Antillean chain to the Yucatan Peninsula and the Florida Keys. Their distribution seemed to follow the path of the Gulf Stream current and he wanted to find out if they could have drifted unaided by man from the coast of South America to their farthest points west and north. The entire journey was more than a thousand miles, but the distances between the islands were quite short. Island hopping on the warm, fast-moving belt of the Gulf Stream made it a manageable problem. Far more problematic, however, was the movement of the South Pacific cottons, which, while of the same New World species, Hirsutum, differed enough from the Caribbean variety of the species to suggest that they started their migration into the Pacific from some other center in the New World, in all likelihood from a Central American base, for them to have made it from there to places like the Marquesas Islands and Hawaii, they would have had to drift along several branches of the Pacific currents, taking in some cases more than a year to arrive at their present locations. Could they have floated all that time? And even if they had, would they have survived intact and potent after so many months of salt water immersion? It was all very well and good for Professor Watt to have determined in his salt water tanks that the cotton variety Darwini 
of the New World species Gossypium barbadensa had drifted to the Galapagos Islands unaided by man from the coast of South America floating on the Peru current. That was no big drift. It was like the island hopping of Hirsutum in the Caribbean. Island hopping was one thing. Dispersal of seeds over vast tracts of ocean was another. Stevens frowned. In this new experiment he was involved in an even more critical issue than that of the Pacific cottons. He had introduced two samples of African cottons into the containers. One of these, Anomalum, although it had remarkably tough seed coats and close affinities with the other variety, had fared very badly. That morning the last floating seed in the sample had sunk. Still the matter was far from settled. There was another important sample collected from the southern part of Africa, which was doing quite well. On it hung many hopes, for it was a wild variety of Gossypium herbaceum, the reputed ancestor of America's cultivated cottons. The grandfather, perhaps of both species, Hirsutum and Barbadensa. It lay at the very center of the controversy over the origins of the world's cultivated cottons. Thirty years before Stevens had started his experiment, Professor Harland analyzed the nature of the distinctions between the species of the world's cultivated cottons. Harland's work led to the acceptance of four species, and four only, to embrace the vast diversity of cultivated cottons. Of these four species, two are known as tetraploids and were formed in the New World. Two are known as diploids and originated in the tropical and subtropical areas of the Old World. But the genetic structure of the two New World tetraploids, G. hirsutum and G. barbadensa, indicates that they are the result of an ancient crossing between an Old World diploid and a wild New World type. Half of the 26 chromosomes found in the New World tetraploids are homologous with the complement of the Old World diploids and half with the complement of species of the genus growing wild in the New World. These Old World diploids are G. herbaceum and G. arboreum. G. herbaceum is an African diploid cotton and it is now recognized that G. arboreum common to Pacific Asia arose through a mutation of a species of G. herbaceum from Africa. The African G. herbaceum has emerged as the only likely diploid cotton which could have crossed with a wild New World type to form the New World tetraploids. Where the sample of herbaceum had been collected, however, by Dr. Gilham in southern Rhodesia, it would have taken five months at least if unaided by man to float across the Atlantic from Africa along the South Atlantic equatorial current to South America or the Caribbean. It would have had to drift nearly 3,000 nautical miles at the snail's pace of 20 miles a day. It would be of great interest therefore to know whether the seeds could have survived for this length of time. In the second month, however, the herbaceum seeds began to sink. While they might sink below the surface of the water, Stevens argued, reluctant to relinquish hope, they might still remain within the effective belt of the current, probably supported by drifting bits of timber dislodged from coastal forest or vegetation mats. The final test lay not with buoyancy, perhaps, but with viability. Would the seeds remain alive, submerged or not? That was the question. He therefore removed ten seeds from those that had sunk and air dried them in a desiccator. These seeds were then acid delinted. Their seeds coats were removed and the seeds were placed on germinating pads. His hunch was right. They were still healthy 
fertile seeds. But his excitement over this was short-lived. When he repeated it with some more seeds a little later, he had to admit that the hypothesis that African cotton seeds had drifted unaided across the Atlantic to America could not be supported. The herbaceum seeds were all dead. Test of seed buoyancy and seed viability in experimental tanks of salt water, wrote Stevens in his report on these experiments, indicate that the upper time limit for seed buoyancy is a little over two months. This is sufficient to affect the transport of seeds over relatively short distances, e.g. throughout the Caribbean islands and from mainland South America to the Galapagos Islands, but totally inadequate for transatlantic or transpacific dispersal. Stevens' contribution, however, was extremely valuable. He had shown the limited applicability of the Watt experiment. He had forced botanists to look again at this troubling question. The question concerning the origin of the amphidiploid cottons as a whole, since their putative parents are confined to Africa and America respectively. By what means then had the links been made between the two cotton strains? for he had at least dismissed the possibility of unaided oceanic drift. Some botanists working on problems unrelated to the cotton controversy have considered the possibility of birds retaining seeds in their digestive tracts over long periods and depositing them on alien shores after transoceanic flights. This hypothesis has been examined by V. W. Proctor and while it has been found that seeds of some plant species can remain viable in the intestinal tract of some shorebirds long enough to be transported thousands of miles, this can offer no explanation in the case of cotton. The cotton bowl is not one of the seeds birds feed on. Even if the bowl was swallowed by accident and regurgitated or excreted after an extended flight, it would retain neither form nor potency. Botanists have tried other ways to account for the meeting of the Old World and New World cottons. Since tropical parts of Asia, India, Pakistan have imported an African type of cotton, presumably in a wild state, and the domestication of cotton in Asia was thought to be, until very recently, of much greater antiquity than that in Africa it was suggested that the Pacific was the key to the problem. The fragment of a fiber and string was reported in excavations at Mohenjo Daro in Sindh, Pakistan by A. M. Gulati and A. J. Turner in 1928. This fragment is dated about 3000 BC and it indicates a knowledge of cotton weaving. Now, a movement from Asia across the Pacific to America, not from outlying islands, but from the Indian Ocean, is a far more problematic proposition than the African-American journey, not only from the point of view of distance, but from the disposition of worldwide winds and currents. It was a desperate suggestion to deal with an inexplicable problem. Harland first advanced the Ocean Pacific hypothesis, going so far as to postulate a land bridge across the Pacific Ocean. No evidence has been found for any such land bridge, and botanists later suggested that the link was provided by civilized men migrating eastward from the Old World, that is Asia, and taking his cottons with him. What lent credence to this theory was not only the known antiquity of Asian cottons, but the fact that coastal Peru, which is on the Pacific side, appeared at one time to be the home of the American cottons. The search for ancient New World cotton in Peru was inspired by this hypothesis of an eastward migration to the Pacific mainland of South America and led to the discovery in 1948 by Dr. Junius Bird of the oldest known cotton textiles in the New World in the caves of Hawaka Prieta. 
the Waka Prieta site in Peru yielded materials dating back to 2500 BC. The discovery, however, did not prove that an old world cotton from the Pacific had fused with a new world species in Peru. An examination of seeds, carpels, and lint from the early Waka Prieta deposits revealed nothing to suggest the presence of an Asian diploid cotton. Certain evidence seems to point to an Eastern South American origin for these Peruvian cottons, although they are distributed west of the Continental Divide. F. Engel, according to Hutchinson, reported groundnuts. Among the crops of the ancient pre-ceramic cotton using cultures of the Peruvian coast. These groundnuts originated east of the Andes, probably in northwestern Argentina, suggesting that the cultivators reached the coast from the mountains and not from the Pacific. If they came over the mountains, they presumably brought their cotton with them. This takes us back to the Atlantic. But other alternatives have to be examined. G. L. Stebbins has suggested that the diploid Old World parent of the New World cottons came to this hemisphere by way of China and Alaska across the Antarctic route. Sir Joseph Hutchinson, a world authority on cotton, has shown that this could not be so because cotton is a round-the-year shrub adapted to the arid tropics. According to Hutchinson, no member of the genus would grow in an ecological situation where temperate woodlands existed and no member of the genus would survive in a climate of winter frost. It is therefore reasonable to conclude that contact between the Old World and New World species did not come about by migration round the Pacific, either by a northern or southern route. Evidence has been presented recently which seemed for a while to rule out the possibility of human transport across the Atlantic from Africa as the origin of the American cottons. Botanist C. E. Smith and R. S. McNeish claimed in 1964 to have found even earlier evidence for the existence of cultivated cotton in the New World than that found by Byrd. Excavations in caves in the Tehuacan Valley area of southeastern Puebla show they claimed that cotton and other plants were cultivated as long as 7,000 years ago. That would be circa 5,000 BC. Smith and McNeese say the most remarkable cotton find is two segments of a cotton bowl excavated in Coxcatlan Cave in Zone 16 and El Riego floor level date between 7200 BC and 5000 BC. Three carbon 14 dates for Zone 16 are all around 5800 BC. These claims have been disputed by botanist Carl Schwerin and S. G. Stevens. Schwerin contends that in spite of McNeish's claim for an earlier appearance, he has only one specimen from the El Riego floor level, dated between 7200 and 5000 BC, and absolutely no evidence of cotton in the intervening Coxcatlan phase, 5000 to 3400 BC. The best explanation for this apparent anomaly, Schwerin argues, is that that single specimen was intrusive from a higher level. The most recent discussion of the find, Stevens reports, that this specimen was indeed unearthed in a disturbed level of the Coxcatlan cave. This interpretation is further supported by Stevens' observations that the specimen is nearly identical to modern cultivated upland cotton and very unlike feral or wild cottons. It seems more likely that cotton did not appear in Mexico before 3400 BC 
the next level on which specimens were found. Smith and McNeese have suggested that because of this early find of New World cotton, corrected and dated down by Schwerin and Stevens to read 3400 BC at the earliest, botanists should no longer look for an old world ancestor of the American hybrid cottons, but for some native wild American ancestor, genetically similar to the reputed old world ancestor. These gentlemen, however, despair of ever finding such a native ancestor and try to close the argument by saying that although the human transport theory is untenable, they must confess that the parental stocks contributing to the original hybridization may never be found. Work on the other side of the Atlantic Basin, however in Africa itself, has shown that the agricultural revolution came to West Africa and particularly to the Mandate people, much earlier than was formerly supposed, as early as 5000 BC, and that cotton cultivation in Sudanic Africa was of considerable antiquity. This therefore puts Africa back into the picture. Schwerin's condition that if Africa is to be considered a potential area of the old world from which this introduction may have been made, it would require a domestication not later than the 5th millennium BC, seems to have been met. Agriculture was independently developed, circa 5000 BC, by the Negroes of West Africa, says George Peter Murdoch, an American anthropologist in his book, Africa, Its Peoples and Their Culture History. This was, moreover, a genuine invention, not a borrowing from other people. Furthermore, the assemblage of cultivated plants ennobled from wild forms in Negro Africa ranks as one of the four major agricultural complexes evolved in the entire course of human history. The invention of agriculture in Negro Africa is most probably to be credited to the Mandate peoples around the headquarters of the Niger in the extreme western part of the Sudan, less than 1,000 miles from the shores of the Atlantic Ocean. Several botanists still believe that African cotton was introduced into India in a wild form and was domesticated there, but Murdoch, undertaking a tremendous interpretive task based upon the available literature, claims that one of the major contributions of the nuclear mandate people to the welfare of mankind was the domestication of cotton. Originally ennobled in the western Sudan, this textile plant was transmitted early to India, but did not reach Egypt until the 6th, 6th century BC. In the last few years, several researchers, Wrigley, Porteris, Anderson, Delcroix, and Vorfrey, Sharon Davies have supported the main thrust of Murdoch's thesis and have shown that agriculture, settled village life, and a number of impressive cultural achievements have considerable antiquity in Africa. This has led to a more favorable reception to the African Atlantic hypothesis and an abandonment of the Pacific ad advocacy. During the 50s, Schwerin notes, Thor Heyerdahl alone suggested the probability that cotton reached the Americas by way of the Atlantic, although he believed it was carried by Near Eastern sailors. Since that time it has been shown that G. arboreum, common to Pacific Asia, arose through mutation of a species of G. herbaceum from Africa. Furthermore, the African herbaceum itself is more closely related to the New World cottons than is G. arboreum. This has led several authorities to suggest that the Old World parent may have come to the Americas across the Atlantic from Africa rather than across the Pacific from Asia. Even Hutchinson, who formerly favored a Pacific crossing, has agreed that the odds as well as the difficulties are equally good for a transatlantic introduction. 
In fact, Pacific advocates who are so eager to ignore or dismiss the African Atlantic hypothesis should bear in mind a number of things that argue strongly against their case, but not against the African proposition. The winds and currents in the Pacific do not favor a crossing from Asia to America. The main currents, in fact, run the opposite way and would be more likely to propel a craft from the Americas to Asia rather than from Asia to the Americas. The prevailing winds, the northeast and southeast trade winds, blow in the same direction as these currents, the north and south equatorial currents, and make it extremely difficult for a craft without great power to approach the Americas in low latitudes. Furthermore, if the voyage were an accidental drift voyage, it would have been almost impossible for the drifting craft to hold to a steady course right across the Pacific without being blown or pulled off course to the north or the south and carried back toward Asia, or at least into one of the chains of islands in the Pacific. It is clear from the above that the Asia to America journey is a veritable nightmare for accidental drift voyages. The direct, simple, relatively short, almost inescapable West Africa to South America route is so free of these problems that only centuries of blindness to the cultures of the African has made the contemplation of the infinitely more complex drift journey from Asia in a prehistoric time more acceptable and attractive. Again, it must be noted that cultivated cotton appeared later in Asia than America. As Schwerin points out, it did not reach China until the 7th century AD. It was unknown to the original Austronesians at the time of their immigration into the Pacific and Indian Oceans. Furthermore, the cottons of the Indian subcontinent and of East Asia belong to a species, G. arboreum, which, on cytogenetic grounds, is unlikely to have been ancestral to the New World cottons. Finally, while there are many grounds of similarity between African and American agricultural techniques, it has been demonstrated that the techniques of American agriculture are markedly different from those of Eurasia. All roads of argument lead back to Africa. A drift voyage by African fisher folks in the 4th millennium BC is the answer. The great antiquity of African agriculture which began several centuries before that date. The very early ennobling of cotton, as Murdoch puts it, in the ancient Sudanic agricultural complex and the proven capacity of very small, unsophisticated craft to make it across the Atlantic. All these factors make this suggestion of Schwerin's tenable. Pre-Columbian contact between Africa and America in the latter half of the 15th century has also been proven by another aspect of the cotton evidence. There were Haitian reports of large boats from Guinea trading with them before Columbus. These reports would seem to be supported by evidence that these African Atlantic traders on one of their return voyages about the year 1462 brought back a species of New World cotton with them and introduced it into the Cape Verde Islands. Europeans first became acquainted with the Cape Verde Islands, according to Ribeiro, between the years 1460 and 1462, in which time there were no signs of former habitations. This was approximately 30 years before Columbus sailed to the New World. The botanist S. G. Stevens reports, Attempts at settlement of the Cape Verde Islands quickly followed, and by 1466, Cottons from Guinea had been introduced and had already become semi-feral. During the subsequent colonial period, cotton was collected in the wild and also grown under primitive cultivation for export. Today, according to Teixeira and Barbosa, 1958, it occurs in a wild, subspontaneous state in the arid areas of most of the islands. It is a New World cotton. G. Hirsutum their punctatum. It is clear that if the wild cottons of today 
of the descendants of the cottons introduced from Guinea between 1462 and 1466, then a New World cotton must have been established in Africa before Columbus's first voyage. This, then, is the case for cotton. After 50 years of speculation, archaeological discovery, and botanical debate, Africa has not been dismissed as the source of the ancestor of the New World tetraploids, nor have the African Atlantic journey and the human transport theory become less tenable. Several things are clear. First, that an African diploid cotton, G. herbaceum, crossed with a wild New World cotton several thousand years ago to form the New World tetraploid cottons, G. hirsutum and G. barbadensa. Second, that seeds of the African diploid cotton could not have drifted by themselves across the ocean, but had to come to the New World in the hands of African man. Third, that African man bearing cottons made the drift journey to the Americas in the fourth millennium BC. Finally, that in another series of African-American contexts in the 15th century, Africans took a tetraploid cotton from the New World, G. hirsutum ver punctatum, which was introduced into the Cape Verde Islands between 1462 and 1466. Part 2 Pre-Columbian Bananas and Peruvian Graves As he looked down from the rim of the grave on the top of the mountain, the mourners seemed like a mass of ants writhing their way upward with a heavy burden and morsel. The slow beat of the drum sounded at measured intervals. The plaintive flute call made all the more melancholy the ceaseless wail and lamentation of the women. Guayana Capa was dead. A king of the Incas had fallen. The digger leaned on his spade, waiting on the edge of the pit for the body of the great lord. He had dug many graves. Death, the burial of the dead, was mere routine. This time, however, he felt, after hours of labor in the sun, the chill of ice in his bones. He had heard tales of the death of kings. At their passing, hundreds of people of all ages were ritually slain. There was no telling who would be called upon today to follow the king on his journey to the afterworld. Slowly to the pit they came, and he could see the shining skulls of the king's wives, shaved clean out of grief and respect. Some of them had already gone wild, and their wails were no longer in tune with the grieving chorus. They broke from the mass of mourners, uttering shrieks of incredible anguish and terror, hoping, lunging at phantoms, rolling upon the rock and pebbled grass of the ground. The great mummy pack containing the king was lowered into the pit. A sadness that had nothing to do with grief smote him. There in the deepest pit he had ever seen dug, they were burying some of the finest treasures in the world. That pack, he knew, contained not only food and drink, that the king might not suffer hunger and thirst on his journey, but the most marvelous jewels and plumes, the richest, finest cloth, and that all that was needed to ensure a happy passage were his pets and his companions. The digger braced himself. The time for filling the pit had come. Some of the king's wives leaped into the bowels of the earth and lay still at the feet of their beloved lord, waiting to be covered. Others were pushed over the side. Some had to be dragged and beaten as they struggled, bludgeoned and kicked as they tried to scramble their way up the steep sides of the pit. 
He began with the rest of the diggers to hurl the earth full and fast at them, spade after spade, until he could see only the quake and convulsion of living bodies in the ground. Their terrible faces had vanished. These burials in the lofty parts of the mountains had not fully ceased when the Spanish came. It was with Guayana Capa, however, that the ritual slaughter of wives on the death of a king was last recorded. This ancient practice probably passed with his passing, but the burial of the dead with food and drink, jewels and textiles, and even arms continue up to Colombian contact times. It was not the reserve of kings, but became widespread among the common people, who kept their dead relatives happy by renewing their food and clothes and drink. There is no graveyard on this continent more steeped in mystery and antiquity than the necropolis of Ancon in Peru. Here lie the bodies of Inca kings and nobles, their treasures, their retinues, and their wives. Some of these ancient graves were opened before the coming of the Spanish, and their grave contents renewed. Among these later contents of medieval vintage, which excavators have unearthed, there are items which have never been explained. One of these is the banana. Banana leaves and fruit, the fruit being seedless and belonging therefore to the cultivated species of the banana were identified by botanists who examined mummy packs in Ancon tombs. No native species of the Musa paradisiaca, the banana and its sister variety, the plantain, from which this grave fruit could have evolved, can be traced to America. How then did the banana, an old world plant, arrive in Peru before Columbus? The botanist E. D. Merrill proposed that the banana was first introduced into the New World by the Portuguese via the Cape Verde Islands off Africa. This has since been accepted as the official version and Thomas D. Berlanga, Bishop of Panama, has been credited with the introduction of this plant into the Americas in the year 1516. Both Historical and archaeological evidence, however, refute Merrill's theory and those of his followers. This evidence is presented here, evidence which points not only to the pre-Columbian presence of the banana in America, but to its introduction from an African Atlantic source. Although the Musa Paradisiaca did not originate in Africa and only diffused to Africa by way of the Arabs as late as the 13th century, it was definitely in cultivation in West Africa before the Mandingo journey of 1310 and its transference to South America by the Mandingo explorers in the 14th century and or the Songhai traders of the 15th. 1462 to 1492 is the most likely explanation for its pre-Columbian presence in this hemisphere. Among 16th century chroniclers and historians who claim the presence of a pre-Columbian banana plantain in Peru were Father Montesinos, Guamain Poma, Father J. Da Acosta, Blas Valera and the half Inca historian Garcilaso de la Vega. Alphonse de Candoye, in his celebrated botanical classic Origin of Cultivated Plants, dismisses all such claims, particularly the arguments advanced in their favor by the famous explorer Alexander von Humboldt. De Candoye assumed that if these assertions were correct, there would have to be a case for a native banana plant. No such case, he demonstrated forcefully, could be established. Humboldt had argued for a native species on the grounds that there were Native American names for the banana. This claim, however, has no validity. 
Quite apart from any of De Candolier's arguments, we can show that the names he cites are derivations of common Arab African banana names. The case for a pre-Columbian banana in South America does not rest, however, on the statements of a few historians or on the arguments of Humboldt. Notwithstanding de Candolier's dismissal of these, extensive excavations by Sisak and Savitaire in the necropolis of Ancon, the sacred cemeteries of Peru, unearthed evidence on behalf of the banana. The botanist A.T. de Rochebrun reported on the discovery of both banana leaves and fruit in a tomb at Ancon. The fruit being seedless and therefore belonging to the cultivated species of Musa paradisiaca. It was the custom of the Peruvian Indians to bury their chiefs in the way the Egyptians buried their pharaohs. Their wives, attendants, pets, treasures, clothing, food and wine were placed in the graves so as to be close at hand for use in the afterlife. Pedro Cieza de Leon, who traveled in Peru from 1532 to 1550 and who, according to C.R. Markham, examined every part of the empire of the Incas within a few years of the conquest, gives an account of how the native Indians buried their dead caciques, chiefs. When a chief dies, De Leon reported, they make a very deep sepulchre in the lofty parts of the mountains, and after much lamentation, they put the body in it, wrapped in many rich cloths, with arms on one side and plenty of food on the other, great jars of wine, plumes, and gold ornaments. At his feet, they bury some of his most beloved and beautiful women alive, holding it for certain that he will come to life and make use of what they have placed around him. Undegardo, another authority on Peru, details the burial ceremonies of the common people. It is easy to see from this why bananas and other kinds of fruit and food were found preserved in the mummy packs. The people believed that the souls suffer hunger, thirst, or other inconveniences. And so they offer in the sepulchres chica and food, silver, clothes, wool, and other things which may be useful to the deceased. The sacred cemeteries in Peru date back more than 2,000 years. At Ancon, however, numerous mummies have been found at various depths, dating from AD 200. The great antiquity of the graves could prove misleading. For the objects within the mummy packs are much more recent, particularly the food and the textiles, 13th, 14th, and 15th century. They are of a relatively modern period, says Gonzalez de la Rosa, but in any case anterior to when the Spanish came. No Spanish objects have been found in these graves. The relative recency of the food and textiles is accounted for by the unusual burial practices in Peru. The Hawakas, houses of the dead, were like ancestral shrines, although in many respects the way the great chiefs of Peru were buried closely parallels the way the pharaohs of ancient Egypt were buried. The Peruvian burial customs were later vulgarized. That is, they ceased to be the prerogative of chiefs and were indulged in by almost everyone. In ancient Egypt, there had been a great obsession with the royal dead. Hundreds were slaughtered when a pharaoh died. Likewise, at the death of Guayanacapa, the last Inca, 1,000 persons of all ages were killed. But whatever sacrifices were made at the time of the death of the pharaohs, However monumental were the tombs built for them, at least they lay in peace for thousands of years before man began invading the privacy of the pyramids. This was not the case in Peru. 
and Peru, there was an obsession with the bodies of the dead, not only the royal dead, but the family dead. The dead were buried and reburied, clothed and reclothed, fed and refed. These people would open the tombs, renew the clothing and the food placed in them, and in many instances gather the remains of the dead together and reinter them. This led to the inadvertent or intentional regrouping of ancestors. X-ray pictures taken by A. Bassler of mummy packs in the Royal Museum of Anthropo Anthropology in Berlin show the remains of several skeletons bundled into one mummy pack. These practices were discontinued under the Spanish. The CSAC and Savatira excavations with unearthed, which unearthed the bananas in the Peruvian graves also unearthed yams. It is interesting to note that Leo Wiener accepts the yams as African introductions but not the bananas. This is due to a misreading of the stems and African banana names which led him to conclude that the banana was introduced late into West Africa by the Portuguese. Wiener was not alone in making this linguistic error. M.D.W. Jeffries has shown how S.W. Coeli 1854, J.W. Christaller, 1933, and Roland Porteres, 1959, mistook, like Wiener, the Boro and Poro stems in West African words as reference for the Portuguese. They regarded, for example, the Poro in Porobana the Vi name for banana as proof that the banana was a Portuguese post-Columbian introduction into Africa. The Arabs introduced the banana into Spain where it was cultivated in the 12th century and it passed into the Arab African trade not much later. Several West African tribes the Mano, Kisi, Chishi, Uwe, Ga, Fanta, and Crepe all have Boro and its variants prefixing their names for the banana. Bolo, Blofo, Borofo, Bolo, etc. They in no way confirm a European, that is, a Portuguese introduction. These prefixes were used by West Africans as terms for the Arabs long before the coming of the Europeans, as P. K. Reynolds points out. The Arabs were instrumental in distributing this fruit across equatorial Africa. The banana was gradually carried westward by the native tribes and was well established on the Guinea coast when the Portuguese first explored there in 1469. If the banana seen in Peru by the early Spaniards and excavated in the pre-Columbian cemeteries of the Incas did not come from pre-Columbian visitors to America, only one other possibility remains to be established. That possibility, as Humboldt contended, is that there was a native variety of the Musa Paradisiaca, which, what facts support this contention? Humboldt claimed that there were native words for the banana plant. He points to banana words among two American tribal groups and languages. The name Paruru in the Tamanaco language and the name Arata among the Maipuri Indians. These words seem at first to be far removed from the universal words for the banana and the plantain. The Platana and Platano of the Arabs, Africans, and Spanish. But when we look at their variants as they pass through a number of American languages, we realize that they are intimately connected with the main source after all, and are not native, as Humboldt claims, to these two American tribes and languages. We see Paruru, for example, very close to. Paratunu, another banana word in another American language. 
paratonal to paratonal, paratonal to paratona, paratana to pratina, pratania to platania, platania to platinal. The last of these being the source of most of the banana words found throughout Africa and the Arab and Spanish worlds. When we look at the Maipuri word for the banana, arata, we see clearly its relationship to pi arata no, which brings us back again to paratana, pratana, platana, platano. All these little steps of sound on the staircase of words, which we can climb up and down through the House of American Languages, leads us back to the ground words in banana and plantain culture. A spiral of steps winding its way from the main staircase may be seen in other American words for banana, the small variety, derived from the African bacoco. Thus we have in the American language Galibi, the banana word Bakuku, in the Oyapak language the banana word Bako, in Oyampi the word Bakome, in Tupi the word Pakoba, in Apiakis the word Pakoa, in Puri the word Bajo, in Karoda, the word Bakuing. The African banana word runs right through these American languages. This word stands for a small African variety of banana, and it is a small African variety that is one of the keys to the question. There seem to have been two main varieties of banana introduced into Africa. The small variety was an offshoot of the Arab transplant in the centuries prior to Columbus, and a larger variety became widespread in the Sudan and the Congo through Spanish and Portuguese influence in the later period. It is this small variety, popular in pre-Columbian Africa, which de, de Acosta probably describes when he identifies a small white and delicate banana in Peru during the first decade of the conquest. Da Acosta testifies that these bananas were grown in Haiti, not Peru, and that they were brought into Peru across the Andes, which fits in with the African-Caribbean contact. Haiti was the first of the islands to report pre-Columbian trade with the Africans, as well as with an African settlement or settlements cultivating this crop along the Atlantic seaboard. No native variety, as Humboldt claimed, has ever been established. The only other claim of this nature was made by Liano y Zapata, who reported in 1761 that in addition to the bananas introduced into America from the Cape Verde in 1516 and from Guinea in 1605, there was yet another cordio or white species of banana. As we have shown, this small white banana, as Da Acosta describes it, is the African species brought into Peru across the Andes from the direction of the Caribbean. The Peruvians, in fact, have an oral tradition which tells of blacks coming to them from across the Andes. Asa Gray and J. Hammond Trumbull in their critique of the first revised volume of Alphonse de Candolier's Origin of Cultivated Plants, reopened the issue of the banana. The Scandinavians, who had carried their expeditions to the northern United States, and the Basque of the Middle Ages, who had extended their whaling voyages perhaps to America, would appear not to have transported a single cultivated species. The Gulf Stream has equally been without effect. Between America and Asia, two transplants may have been effected. One by man, botatas, the sweet potato, the other either by man or by the sea, the coconut. Perhaps the banana should be ranked with the above in this regard. 
like Hyredal after them, Gray and Trumbull were suggesting a Pacific origin for the pre-Columbian banana found in America. This suggestion does not fit any of the known facts. The heaviest concentrations of banana and plantain cultivation found in places where the Spanish had not yet penetrated were along the upper reaches of the Amazon River, Atlantic side. Bananas were found only in small ritual deposits but not in cultivation on the Pacific side. The earliest chronicle which makes reference to a pre-Columbian banana such as the Acostas points to an Atlantic source. All the names of American bananas post or pre-Columbian are of Arab, African, not Polynesian or New Guinean origin. American bananas, we must conclude, both pre- and post-Columbian dispersed from African sources, as the distribution of names for the American varieties of the Musa paradisiaca clearly shows. The banana, although it did not originate in Africa, was introduced there very early in Spain, as early as the 12th century, into Africa not much later, at least by the 13th through the Arab caravan trade in the Sudan and through the Asian and Arab maritime trade with East Africa. The research by Reynolds into early banana culture establishes the pre-Columbian cultivation of the banana in West Africa. No extended trip contemplated by the Africans in 1310 or 1311 or later in their trade with the Caribbean in the mid 15th century could have excluded bananas or plantain, the sister variety of the Musa paradisiaca. It seems that a small variety of banana was in popular cultivation in West Africa before the coming of the Europeans, Portuguese, who made a larger variety widespread in the Congo and the Sudan. It was a small variety similar to the West African pre-Columbian banana that was reported in Haiti and Peru at the time of the contact by Spanish and Portuguese historians. The explorer Orellana encountered the plantain variety of the species in great abundance all along the upper reaches of the Amazon where he drifted down the river, the longest jungle river in the world, to its mouth in 1540-1541. The plant geographer Carl Sauer has shown how difficult it is for the plantain variety to spread quickly without a very active human crusade on its behalf. Its multiplication is a lot more difficult than that of a seed bearing plant which practically spreads itself. The mature root stocks of the plantain, Sauer points out, need to be dug up, divided, preferably dried for a while and then replanted. This species is an extraordinarily poor volunteer, and its spread must have been almost entirely by deliberate and rather careful planning. It is clear from the above that those who still insist on a post-Columbian introduction of the banana by Europeans as the origin of its presence in America ignore not only the eyewitness accounts of the early chroniclers, and the archaeological evidence of the Ancon graves, but also the intensive cultivation and extraordinary dispersal of the plant and its sister variety on the Atlantic side of the continent, and the extremely dependent and slow spreading nature of the plant itself. He was drawn to the dome shaped object bobbing up and down on the current not far from his feet. It looked at first like the head of a bald man with a solitary tuft of hair done up in a curious knot in the middle of his skull. He guided it in with a stick and picked it up. It was larger and lighter than a human head and the mysterious knot in the center of the skull was a stem. After the day's hunt he took it back with him to his cave. He tried to break it open with a stone to see if it was indeed a fruit and if the flesh within was good and sweet. The stone made only slight indentations in the brittle shell, which was as protective and tough as the hide of an animal. 
In a rage, he threw it down and stamped on it. It broke into two halves. It was quite hollow inside. A film of flesh, which may have once been soft, still clung to the inner rim of the shell. It seemed infested with seeds. The man spat. It was certainly not good for meat, but perhaps, perhaps, the thought was to return to him much later, more complete. But this time he simply threw the gourd down on the trash heap. The bottle gourd picked up on the beach by this aboriginal American is an ancient plant. It is among man's first cultivated plants. It served many functions before man be began making pots from clay. It could be used as a float, a container, a scoop, and a dipper and was probably used for all these purposes by prehistoric fishermen. Gourds occur very early in both the Old and New Worlds, but in spite of the differences in the shape of the seeds from the two hemispheres, the varieties are known to branch from a single species. This species originated in tropical Africa, and according to the botanist, Burkhill and Oaks Ames was originally domesticated there. Thomas Whitaker, the leading authority on the cultivated cucurbits, also leans toward that view. The early branching off from the African legionaria has produced New World seeds of the bottle gourd that are small, narrow, and without wings, while seeds of the African gourd are usually broad and corky. There are, however, New World seeds of the gourd found in early archaeological sites, from Peru to Baja California, Mexico, that are broad, just as there are African types that resemble the slender, hard, and wingless seeds of the New World. Most botanists hold that the bottle gourd was introduced into the Americas by natural drift across the ocean. Carl Schwerin suggests that in some prehistoric time, beginning about 9,000 years ago, bottle gourds got caught up in the pull of currents from the African coast and drifted to America across the Atlantic. Experiments have shown that such a drift voyage could in fact occur. Thomas Whitaker and G.F. Carter showed that gourds are capable of floating in seawater for at least seven months, long enough to reach South America from Africa without appreciable loss of seed viability. Salt water does not harm these seeds, just the opposite. Direct immersion of legionaria seeds for up to 14 weeks actually seems to have a stimulating effect. As we have seen, this kind of occurrence would have been impossible for the African cotton seeds. The botanist S.G. Stevens demonstrated this in laboratory tests. Only man could have transported African cotton seeds across the Atlantic. Man, it would appear, was not really necessary for the diffusion of the bottle gourd. There is, nonetheless, one problem in connection with the gourd that has caused several authorities, including Whitaker, to add the cautionary note that introduction by human transportation remains a distinct possibility. The bottle gourd is not a littoral plant. That is, it does not grow along the shoreline of the Atlantic, where it would have landed after its long slow drift. If it is true that African gourds simply got lost and drifted westward until they hit the American mainland, why did they never appear in cultivation along the waterline or littoral, but only far inland? This has led to the speculation that an ancient American may have picked up the gourd on the seashore, taking it inland with him to a settlement and breaking it open, inadvertently dispersed the seeds, which then took root in the New World. This seems a plausible explanation. Bottle gourds appear so early in America that it would be rash to claim unequivocally a direct introduction by African man. In fact, as Whitaker at one point suggests, the diffusion of the gourd from one continent to another may have even 
preceded its domestication by man. On the northern borders of Mesoamerica, the gourd is reported at Tamaulipas in Mexico from strata radiocarbon dated at 7000 to 5500 BC. It occurs much later in South America. The earliest firm date in South America is 3000 BC at Huaca Prieta on the northern coast of Peru. Other crops of definite African origin which have turned up in pre-Columbian strata in the New World include a species of jack bean. The result of an ancient crossing between African and American beans and a West African yam. Dioscoria cayenensis. Some scholars have argued for an introduction of both the bottle gourd and the jack bean from Asia. This is hardly worth consideration. First of all, they are both found earliest in America on the Atlantic side. Second, bottle gourds and beans appear in much later archaeological context in Asia than they do in America. Third, the Asiatic jack bean, Canavalia gladiata, is quite distinct from the New World species. The member of the bean family we are considering, the jack bean, Canavalia, grew from an early marriage between African and New World beans. Red seeds from Africa, Canavalia virosa, hybridized around 4000 BC with white seeds, Canavalia plagiosperma. These mottled seeds, when carried into the Amazon lowland, a habitat like that of the ancestral red seeds of Africa, C. virosa, gave rise through repeated back crossing to brown seeds, C. papyri. Beans, unlike gourds, could not have survived a transatlantic drift. The red seeds can float for a short time, but they are not impermeable to water and so swell up and sink. Other Canavalia beans are neither buoyant nor impervious to the effects of water, and so the explanations put forward for the pre-Columbian transfers from Africa to America of the jack bean include 1. A sealed gourd with the seeds packed inside, 2. Storm-driven fishermen bringing the beans, and 3. An abandoned watercraft with the beans on board. The sealed gourd explanation is highly improbable. Why should Africans seal a gourd packed with jack beans and set it adrift? And with respect to the abandoned watercraft, one has to imagine that the Americans who found the craft knew the usefulness of the beans and the technique of their cultivation. That men came in on the watercraft, surviving the long drift journey is not to be dismissed as improbable in view of what is now known of the seaworthiness of small craft. The currents traversing the floor of the Atlantic and the capacity for storm-driven fishermen to survive much longer accidental ocean voyages, utilizing their equipment, which turns the ocean into a mobile food store. These men, moreover, would know both the usefulness of the plants and the technique of propagating them. The journeys of these prehistoric fisherfolk, as Schwerin has pointed out, are matched in improbability only by other explanations. Because fishing cultures are uncommon in Western, Western Africa, they have been neglected ethnographically. Yet, fishermen have probably been important as specialists for a long time, catching and drying great quantities of fish which could be traded long distances inland. Indigenous peoples of West Africa were no strangers to travel on the open sea prior to European contact, and fishing in the open sea has continued among scattered West African groups down to the present. Very early drift voyages without man are postulated for the diffusion to America of the African bottle gourd, and with man for a species of cannavalia bean. Yams, however, were a much more recent introduction and their pre-Columbian presence in the Americas may be seen as further evidence of the medieval African contact with America. The Spanish naturalist G. F. D. Oviedo 
makes it clear that yams were not native to America. Their name, pronounced nayam, is a foreign fruit, writes Ovedio, and not native to these Indies, having been brought to this Hispaniola, Haiti, and to other parts of the Indies. It came with the Negroes, and it was taken well and is profitable and good sustenance for the Negroes. These Nayams look like the Ayes, the sweet potato, but they are not and generally are larger than the Ayes. They cut them in pieces and plant them a hand's distance from the ground, and they grow. Yams were another of the cultigious found preserved in the mummy packs of the Incas in Peru. One of the problems that has arisen in discussions of the yam is the confusion over its name. Wiener says, Aye is the original name of the yam and not of the sweet potato, but throughout the world the two were confused and the same name often served for both. After reviewing many of the early chronicles on this point, Schwerin is convinced that the Ayes reported by Oviedo, Las Casas, and others represent a species of yam, Dioscorea. He holds that a species of yam that may have been introduced into America in a pre-Columbian time is Dioscorea cayenensis, which is widespread in tropical America and which most authorities consider had its original home in West Africa. End of chapter 10 They came before Columbus, the African presence in ancient America, by Ivan Van Sertema. Chapter 11 Smoking, Tobacco and Pipes in Africa and America. Quote, the black people have practiced the same manner and use of the tobacco as ye Indians have. End quote. En Monardes, joyful news out of the newfound world. Quote, the people of Africa have surpassed every other people in inventing various contrivances for smoking, rising from the very simplest apparatus to the most elaborate. End quote. G. Schweinfurth, The Heart of Africa. Quote, there is a decidedly classical character about them. Brackets. A shanty pipes and brackets as if started from Roman lamps and Pompeian ideas end quote. R. T. Pritchett Smokiana one smoke cures smoke words and the origin of smoking Jean Nicot French ambassador to Portugal stood on the balcony of his house looking out on the garden. He was struck by the luxuriance of the new plant which the keeper of the royal prisons in Portugal had sent him. It had come in recently from Florida, a place somewhere in the new dominions of Spain. He had heard of a plant like this among the Moors used for curing the Nolimi Tangier, but he had dismissed this as irrelevant. All he wanted of the plant was for it to adorn his garden. It was almost as tall as a man, full of leaves, large and long bearded. He felt, indeed, as if he had acquired from some secret garden a rare and exotic flower of the newfound world. Later that day, a friend of Nicole's, page boy, walking and talking in the garden, felt a sharp itching on his cheek, 
by the side of his nose. It was an ugly little growth, halfway between a purulent boil and a cold wart, vexing him continually, and because he had nothing on hand, he impulsively tore a leaf from Master Nicole's prized plant and rubbed the spot. A slimy, sticky substance came out of the leaf, but it cooled and tightened the skin like an astringent. To his astonishment, the itching stopped for all that day and the next. The page boy told Nicole of this. He called the young man in, and for a week and a half every day he squeezed the viscous juice of the leaf onto his face. The growth completely vanished. But this was only the beginning. In the kitchen of the embassy a week later, one of the cooks nearly severed his thumb with a great chopping knife. The steward of the house dressed the wound quickly, using the leaves of this plant as a bandage. The thumb was good within a month. News like this travels with the wind people flocked to the embassy as to the miracle waters of lords. There was the page boy's father, who had a chronic ulcer in his leg, and a woman whose face was so completely disfigured by the ringworm that it looked as if she wore a visor of boils. The juice of this extraordinary plant was applied. Within two weeks, the ulcers, the ringworms, dried up. The sufferers were pronounced healed. It began to be known as the ambassador's herb. Nicole called in doctors to confirm the cures. He wrote to King Francis II and prescribed it for all nobles in the French court. The Lord of Arnac, governor of Rogel, a close personal friend, was so impressed by the reports that he had the juice of the plant distilled and drunk at the queen's table, claiming that it cured short breath. What has become the king of vices, the sovereign lord of tooth and lung decay, of dentine tartars and pulmonary cancers, was once from Greco-Roman to medieval times, a sovereign remedy, killer of all aches and worms that attacked tooth or lung, liver or skin, bladder or brain. Thus tobacco began about two thousand years as one of the great cures of all ills, and evolved in what it is today, one of the great killers of all times. Smoking in ancient times, however, was no pleasant after-dinner custom. Like the modern enema, the smoke was sometimes funneled into the body through the anus, and smoking through other apertures, like the mouth and nose, was like taking an emergency draught of oxygen in rarefied atmospheres. Various viscous substances were burned in a vessel and the fumes, rising in a hot thrust, would pass up through a funnel into a distilling cup or glass. The fumes, distilled and condensed in that cup, were used to fumigate, smoke the patient. They were let out of the distilling cup by way of another tube into some opening, mouth, nose, or anus, to heat, soothe, and clean the affected parts. In that funneling tube, or ambicus, as the alchemist called it, lay the beginnings of our pipe stem. In that receiving cup of distilled vapors, the ambix, or masterion, lay the beginnings of our pipe bowl. The alchemist looked upon their distilling apparatus in a very novel way, as a union of male and female. They saw the masterion as a uterus, and nipple-like appendages studded this container. The funnel, or ambucus, as a penis, 
the hot power of the fumes charging up the impugus as the male sperm which has transformed into the new chemical combination deposited in the glass vessel at the end of the tube of the masterion. This distilling apparatus or smoking machine reappears in the most ancient pipes found so far. These are taken from Roman graves and are described by B. Reber in Le Pipes Antiques de la Suisse. A glass at the pipes shows they are masteria turned upside down, and the large pipe bowls seem to feature a knob or nipple like the masterion of the alchemist. The pipe stems come out of the bowl at such an angle as would suggest they were intended to be set into a distilling glass. It is hard to escape the conclusion, particularly when one looks at the survival of the nipple or knob and the lids on some of the bowls, no longer utilitarian, that these pipes are, as Leo Weiner claims, a direct development of the distilling apparatus of the alchemist. These substances used for medicinal smoking in these early times did not include tobacco. Henbane and alanomium, a substance close to what is now in use in the manufacture of pipe heads, were the favorites in smoke medicine. In the Salerno School of Medicine, henbane was as popular a pain reliever as aspirin is today. The Catholica Magistri Salerni, a medical textbook, says, Henbane seed wrapped in a little wax may be put on hot coal and the smoke should be drawn into the tooth and the worms will soon be killed. There is also a poem on the toothache, which appears in textbooks of the Salerno School. This is a free translation of the Latin verse. To treat bad teeth that ache and rot, put grains of leek into a pot, mix well and burn with henbane root, then heat with smoke the ailing tooth. Smoke was also recommended for troubles of the chest, especially coughing. According to one medical treatise, also of the Salerno school, the smoke of colt's foot, a plant taken through an empicus into the mouth, would cure a cough. The ancient Greeks also used the inhalation of smoke through a reed for medicinal purposes and they knew of this remedy for coughs. Thus Pliny wrote of Coltsfoot, the smoke of this plant in a dry state, inhaled by the aid of a reed and swallowed, is curative of chronic cough. It is necessary, however, at each inhalation of the smoke to take a draught of raisin wine. Though Pliny and other Greek writers, like Dioscorides, a clear picture emerges of the early smoking apparatus and the many cures attributed to smoke inhalation or fumigation. But the best description of an ancient pipe evolving from this process is given by a Roman, Marcellus Empiricus. Speaking of colt's foot for an old cough, he tells how it is gathered in the old moon dried on Thursday and then put in a new vessel with burning coals. The top closed carefully with clay and a reed inserted, and through it the humor or hot smoke is drawn into the mouth until it penetrates all the arteries and the stomach. Many substances were smoked and many cures were affected. These substances, although as various as the ailments they were concocted to cure had to be fatty and viscous so as to emit a smoke that was not only strong but of a consistent intensity and duration. Powders in themselves, it was found, did
did not yield, in the words of medieval surgeon Ambrose Paré, so strong and so long a fume. But when a viscous substance was mixed and burned with powders, it doth yield them a body and firm consistence. Paré describes smoking cures for obstructions of the brain, ulcers of the lungs, chronic coughs, pains in the ears, pains of the sides, pains of the womb, and even Louis Venaria, venereal disease, which called for a thorough smoking out of the whole body through all of its openings. The smoking cures of Greco-Roman medicine were passed on to the Arabs, and so was the smoking apparatus. The Arabs, however, although using some of the substances made popular by the Greek and Roman doctors, developed their own smoke medicine chests. This included the viscous and gluey leaf and juice of a plant which came to be known as the tubac. This word was chosen because it is derived from the Syrian word for viscum and glue, dubak. It is in an Arabic medical treatise that one first becomes aware of tubak, a species of tree growing upon the mountains of Mecca, having long, slender green leaves which slip between the fingers when squeezed applied as a dressing to a fracture, which, remaining upon it, they consolidate. It is beneficial as an antidote against poisons, taken internally or applied as a dressing, and as a remedy for the manage or scab, and the itch, and fevers of long continuance, and colic, and jaundice, and obstructions of the liver. The Arab physician Ibn al Baitar also adds in his description of the Arab species of tobacco plant that it attains the size of a man, lives in groups, one never finds one alone. The word tubak, as used by the Arabs, was not restricted to this plant, but was extended to apply to a number of viscous substances used in medicinal smoking. The Arabs alerted Africans to the value of tobacco as a smoke medicine, yet they were not responsible for introducing the plant itself into Africa. The Africans already had tobacco. An indigenous species was growing wild and plentiful there. As this plant, however, was initially associated with Arab smoke medicine, even though it was later used by the African medicine men and magicians for other purposes, it became known by the Arab smoke word today, Tubak, and this name was disseminated over a great part of the Sudan. Thus we have the roots Taba, Tawa, Tama, in the Mandi languages. A pre-Columbian poem on smoking in Africa documents the early use of tobacco. At Kubaka, Captain Banger wrote, tobacco serves also for money. By singular homophony with the European name, the inhabitants of the Darfur call it in their language Taba. Moreover, this is the usual name in the Sudan, in Fezan, and at Tripoli, in Barbary, it is called Tabga. I have read a Kasida, or poem, composed by a Bakrid, or descendant of the Caliph Abu Bakr to prove that smoking is no sin. These verses, I think, date back to the ninth century of the Hegira. That would be circa 1450. It would imply, however, a much earlier invention of tobacco smoking in the western Sudan 
before it spread to the north and seduced Muslims. One of the verses of the poem quoted by Benger is a defense of the newfound habit of smoking against possible Islamic injunctions. A later reference by O. Hudas shows that Africans introduced oral smoking of tobacco for pleasure and relaxation among the Arabs of North Africa. As the result of the arrival of an elephant from the Sudan in the city of El Mansur, the use of the dire plant called tobacco was introduced into the Maghreb, since the Negroes who had brought the elephant also had brought tobacco, which they smoked, claiming that the use of it offered great advantages. The habit of smoking which they brought them with them became general in the Dra, later at Morocco, and at last in the whole Maghreb. An important distinction should be pointed out here. Tobacco, as such, was not new to the Arab world. A species of the tobacco plant had been used by the Arabs in early medieval smoke medicine. The medical uses of this plant and other viscous-like substances, grouped under the general name of tubac, had differed to the Africans. But the Africans not only introduced their own brand of tubac, along with other aromatic herbs they imported, as did the Arabs for that matter, along with what they inherited from the Greco-Roman medicine chest, they also introduced a range of new functions. They used tobacco for all sorts of things, money, magic, meditation. Among Africans, smoking the tubac did not remain a painful fumigation of the insides in times of illness, rather from their emphasis on oral smoking and their refinements on the pipe. Smoking became a source of great meditative and tranquilizing pleasure. It was this latter function that spread to the Arab world as an innovation and an influence. The Arabs had also smoked for the pleasure that they, that the burning and inhalation of hallucinatory or narcotic substances brings, but they knew this function only in relation to hemp and opium. Tobacco was simply medicine to them, smoked or raw. It is remarkable that the word tubac, which was used in pre-Columbian Africa, should be found at the time of the Spanish contact already in use among the American Indians for the smoking weed and the act of smoking. Tubac, as the name for the plant, did not originate in America, as later scholars have assumed for the plant at the time of Columbus's arrival, was not called tubac by the natives. The Mexican word ticketel was among the several Native American words for the plant, although Wiener claims the word has an un-Mexican foundation. The initial morphine pick being found in no other Mexican word and the yeto being a possible corruption of yuli, which in several South American languages is an approximation of the Mandy word for smoke, duli. Wiener also makes a case for an Arabic derivation of the American smoke word, betum, from betum, the letters B and P are interchangeables, from bitumen. The main viscous substance in the Greco-Roman smoke medicine chest replaced by the general Arabic term for smoking substances, tubac. On the strength of his phylogical computations, Wiener insists that the plant itself was an importation into America by the Africans. The evidence, however, seems to suggest that the functions not the plant itself, 
diffused to the New World from Africa. The applications of tobacco within African and New World medieval cultures are so remarkably similar as to establish the case for a pre-Columbian diffusion of medicinal and ritual uses of tobacco. But the methods of cultivation are so different as to suggest independent origins of the tobacco plant. The Africans, for example, are reported as pounding it while it is fresh, as soon as it is picked, without curing or drying it, pressing the leaves and making them into bricks, which they then dry slowly in the shade. While the Americans are found in most cases doing the opposite, drying the tobacco first and then crushing the leaves. What was new, what was African, was the habit of smoking tobacco orally, and the instrument developed for such smoking, which is not as natural as it is assumed today. In one Caribbean island, where the habit had probably not yet fully diffused, some Americans were first seen by Columbus smoking with a Y-shaped reed through the nostrils. Hence, when oral smoking and the instrument for oral smoking, the pipe, were introduced into some parts of the Americas by the Africans, the Americans borrowed the Arab-African name, Tubac, and used it to name the act of smoking and the pipe, but not the plant itself, for which presumably they already had a native name. Observations by the naturalist G. F. D. Oviedo support this. The Indians of this island use, among other of their vices, one which is very bad, and that is smoking, which they call tobacco, in order to lose consciousness. This instrument, with which they take the smoke, the Indians call tobacco and not the herb. On their arrival, not only did the Spanish find this word tobacco used both for smoking and for the instrument used for smoking, but they also encountered another smoke word which is found in the Mande language group and in a wide range of American languages. The Malinke words meaning to smoke are diamba and diamba. These can account for the South American smoke words such as the Guipinavi, Dama, Tariana, Ema, Maypures, Jama, Guahiba, Sama, Kaberi, Sima, Baniva, Dejima, and so on. The Mandingo word Duli, to smoke which also occurs in the same form in Toma and Bambara, and in its various forms, Duli and Luli. In Mende, can be found among the American languages Carib, Arawak, Chavantes, Baniva, Aquamirin, and Gojira, Taba and Iuli, both stand for tobacco in the Carib and Arawak languages, spoken in the Guianas. Wiener has tracked down the deterioration of the Dooley words in geographical sequence. In Haiti, the word is Iuli. As one moves from the Mandango Central Base in Darien to the northeastern shore of South Africa, one finds the Arawak, Yuli, Yiori, Yari. Further to the west, in the Goa Jiva language, Yuli, Yuri, Yuri. In the interior, this further deteriorates into Ili, Iri, Wari, and Oali. The quote unquote discovery of tobacco in America did not make much difference to Europe for a long time. Specimens of the plant were brought back to or donate gardens with their fairness thereof and to give a pleasant sight. 
The curative powers known to African American medicine men did not come to the serious attention of the Europeans until about 1570, when Lebo made Jean Nicole's observations on tobacco famous. The Spanish were uneasy about the habit of smoking that was so prevalent among the African slaves. On the one hand, they encouraged tobacco cultivations on the plantations because tobacco was good for trade with the Indians, who valued it much. On the other hand, the Spanish saw smoking as the opium of the people, with possibly injurious effects on the quality of the labor force. Why does the use of tobacco became among the Indians as medicine, particularly in the form of powders, juices, leaf, poultices, and as food, in the form of tiny balls for chewing. The burning of the tobacco for oral puffing and inhalation, true smoking, was a habit only of the American Indian elite, indulged in by nearly all Africans, men and women. It was largely restricted to Indian chiefs. Wealthy Indians with many wives or the Indian priests and medicine men. The common people would usually smoke on ceremonial occasions, at a celebration or festival. Thus we learn of some Indian tribes in the far north of the American continent, now Canada, who smoked heavily at a tobaggy. Tobaggy is a word for a festival or banquet that closely resembles the Wolof word for festival. Tabasquio, or Tabasqui, quote unquote, the December feast. The Mandango, Tabasqui, and the Peul and Berber, Tabasqui, or feast of sacrifices. In 1560, the French ambassador to Portugal, Jean Nicole, became aware of the use of tobacco among the black Moors is a cure for the nole mi tangere or cancerous ulcers and fistulas he wrote to the cardinal of lorraine in april of that year i have acquired an herb of india america in these years was still being called india and the americans indians the distinction being made between oriental india in Occidental India, an herb of marvelous and approved property against the nole mi tangere and fistulas, declared incurable by the physicians, but by this herb of prompt and certain cure among the Moors. As soon as it has produced its seed, I will send it to your gardener at Moor Monster and the plant itself in a barrel with the instructions for transplanting and caring for it. As we have noted, Nicole was given this herb by the keeper of the royal prisons in Portugal. At about the same time, a specimen of one of the African species, later to be labeled Nicotiana rustica, was sent from Italy to Matthioli in Austria who falsely identified it with henbane. Nicole, partly on the scant information about the tobacco plant that was recorded from Africa and America in his own experiments on the relatives of the page boy and the cook in his embassy, quote-unquote, discovered tobacco, at least as far as Europe was concerned. After Libo published his La Agriculture et Maison Rustique in 1570, highlighting the creative wonders of the tobacco plant, the experiments of Nicole, and the manner of cultivating tobacco, which was soon followed by a book on tobacco and Sassafras by Monardes, tobacco became the rage of the time. Nicole was immortalized. Hence, the botanical labels Nicotiana tobaccum and Nicotiana rustica and the crucial element in tobacco, 
nicotine. Today, when 25 million Americans have succeeded in abandoning the tobacco smoking habit to save themselves from possible cancer, the thought of tobacco as one of the great curative herbs comes as something of a shock. What is a life taker in one preparation is a life giver in another. From the works of Lebo and Monarides, the stories of a miracle unfold. The juice of the tobacco leaf gluth together and soldereth the fresh wounds and healeth them. The filthy wounds and sores it doth cleanse and reduce to a perfect health. The Indians chew tobacco for food. When drought and hunger attack them, they can chew it for days and eat nothing else. The bear does the same thing in hibernation. Without meat or drink, he just lies and chews his paw. The circulating saliva retains body heat. Sir John Hawkins also in 1564 observed this capacity of tobacco takers to withstand hunger and thirst. However, in the experience he describes, smoking rather than chewing achieved this. The Floridians, when they travel, have a kind of herb, dried, who, with a cane and earthen cup in the end, with fire, and the dried herbs put together, do suck through the cane the smoke thereof, which smoke satisfieth their hunger, and therewith they live four or five days without meat or drink. In its various preparations, powder, juice, dried or fresh or burning leaf, tobacco was used to heal skin diseases, ringworm, acne, warts, sores, to relieve pains of the head, pains of the chest, congestion by phlegm, pains of the stomach caused by wind or gas, labor pains, constipation and vomiting, pains of the limbs, from cold, arthritic pains, toothaches, chillblains, swellings, kidney stones, and short breath. It could cure carbuncles, cankerous ulcers, shooting pains, fevers, the mange, and the itch, cold affections of the liver, the worms, dropsy, the most stubborn of old corruptions and the freshest wounds of war. Tobacco juice was a powerful antidote to the stings of scorpions and the deadly effects of poisoned arrows. Tobacco was also used as a tranquilizer in Africa and America. The black people, wrote Monarides, have practiced the same manner and use of the tobacco as ye Indians have, for when they see themselves weary, they take it at the nose and mouth, and it happeneth unto them, as unto our Indians, lying as though they were dead three or four hours, and after they remain lightened without weariness, for to labor again, and they do this with great pleasure, that although they be not weary, yet they are very desirous to do it. The use of smoking as a tranquilizer was secondary to its use for magic and sacred ritual. The first place in the magician's pharmacopoeia is occupied by the aromatic plants for burning. There is no important ceremony and no invocation of the spirits without specific instructions as to what aromatic plant is to be burned. From this use of the tubac in Africa, there arose the habit of oral smoking, that is, smoking as it is known today. Some of the ritual and divinatory uses among the American Indians are identical with those among the Africans. One of the marvels of this herb and that which bringeth most admiration is the manner how the priest of the Indians did use it. 
which was in this manner, when there was amongst the Indians any manner of business of great importance, in which the chief gentlemen called Caciques, or any of the principal people of the country, had necessities to consult with their priest in any business of importance, then they went and propounded their matter to the chief priest, forthwith in their presence. He took certain leaves of the tobacco, cast them into ye fire, and did receive the smoke of them at his mouth, and at his nose with their cane, and in taking of it he fell down upon the ground as a dead man, and remaining so according to the quantity of the smoke that he had taken. When the herb had done his work, he did revive and awake, and gave them their answers according to the visions which he saw. Swinefirth, in his book, The Heart of Africa, has commented upon the remarkable correspondences between tobacco cultures in the Old and New Worlds. Of all the plants that are cultivated by these wild people, none exist a more curious conformity among people far remote. Assuming the Africans knew nothing about tobacco in pre-Columbian times, he cannot understand how Africa took to tobacco so quickly, and how its culture was so deeply affected by it. It must be a matter of surprise, says he, that even Africa, notorious as it has ever been for excluding every sort of novelty in the way of cultivation, should have allowed the Virginian tobacco to penetrate to its very center. Not suspecting the linguistic derivation of the word from Arabic, he wonders how it is that there is not a tribe from the Niger to the Nile which has any other word but tubak to denote the plant, apart from tubak to denote both the Nicotiana tobacum, Virginia or American tobacco, and Nicotiana rustica. There are a number of African words for the Nicotiana rustica. The Nicotiana tabucum is always and only known as tubak. Swinefirth points to one exception, the Niam Niam tribe, which calls the American brand of tobacco Gunde to distinguish it from their native tubak, Nicotiana rustica. On the question of the native home of the Nicotiana rustica, which grows wild and plentiful in Africa, Swinefirth is cautious. Quite an open question, I think it is, whether the Nicotiana rustica is of American origin. Several of the African tribes had their own names for it, here amongst the Bongo, to distinguish it from the American brand they call it Mashir. Schweinfurth further points out that African Nicotiana rustica is distinguished by the extreme strength and by the intense narcotic qualities it possesses. After pondering the question of the original home of the Nicotiana rustica species, which he leaves open, Schweinfurth concludes, at all events, the people of Africa have far surpassed every other people in inventing various contrivances for smoking, rising from the very simplest apparatus to the most elaborate. He conjectures that the Africans, although they must have had their own tobacco, favored the foreign growth, Nicotiana tabacum, because smoking either of the common tobacco, Nicotiana rustica, or some other aromatic weed had in some way already been a practice among them. Swinefirth correctly assumes, like the botanist de Candole, that the wide distribution of Taba words in Africa indicates that they proceed from some common source. His mistake in placing the original source of the word in America is based on the accepted theory that it was first used there. 
but Wiener's investigation of the medical method of fumigation makes it certain, without any dispute, that the Tubac of the Arabs spread throughout Africa without any American influence. There are a number of other linguistic clues to this which have not yet been mentioned, such as the African cassette or pipe from the Arabic cassaba and bukor in the Niger Valley from the Arabic bahur, which is quote, incense smoked with tobacco for gold, end quote. Two, oral smoking and the pipe. There were hundreds of people strolling up and down the streets of Tuateluco. It was a market day and the murmur of the vast crowd was so great that after a while he could hear nothing but a humming, as though he were walking under the lake. There were women cooking on their stoves in the open air, stools and spiced maize porridge, sweetmeats made of honey, maize cakes, and those savory tamales whose steamed maize crusts were stuffed with beans and meat and pimentos. He was tempted to stop and regale himself but he wanted to get to the far end of the marketplace where they sold those quaint little smoking tubes they called tobacco. They were such exquisite things, though the best of them, such as those the priest and the caciques used, were not commonly on sale. Beyond the stall stood a black-skinned trader from the hot lands. He was selling mostly cotton mantles and kitsali feathers, but on one side, spread out on an animal hide, lay the smoking tubes. He had thought the purchase would be quick, but he was startled by the variety of the merchandise. Some were so tiny that they were lost between the fingers, some so long that one could sit by the tobacco in the cool and place the bowl of burning pisitel at one's feet. Some seemed showered in fine gold, and it was difficult to tell how this effect and sparkle was achieved. Others were blackened and polished with coal or painted in the white, bright powder of chalk. Flowers, fishes, and eagles adorned many of them, and the bowls were sometimes the vivid heads of these foreign blacks or the forms of tropical animals. He chose a cylindrical tube. The interior was stuffed with aromatic herbs and charged with something he knew, burned long and slow. He could hardly wait to light it. He drew the smoke in deep and would not let go of the vapors until he felt giddy. Then at one point there was a rich, pure flame without smoke. In this flame he saw a hidden painting, uncoiled like a snake aroused. It came and vanished in an instant. It was the body of a woman who danced into life and death as the fire started and stilled her. Our pipe smoker is taken from the early 15th century marketplace of Tlatelugo. Oral smoking in America and the instrument specifically designed for this were introduced about a century before then, but it has always been assumed that the habit and the pipe, both called tobacco in a great part of the New World, were of great antiquity in America. A re-examination of the evidence shows that this was not the case. Evidence of smoking pipes in America does not go back beyond a century and a half at most before Columbus. Some receptacles in the bowls of which certain substances were burnt were misclassified as smoking pipes 
but the orifices are too large for oil smoking, almost as large as the mouths of chimneys. An ancient Mexican painting of a man blowing out air from a trumpet-like object has been falsely identified as evidence for a very early pipe. Other so-called ancient pipes have been misdated through carelessness. A pipe with a wooden stem is featured in W.K. Moorhead's The Stone Age in North America, but this is no Stone Age pipe. It comes from the basket maker caves in Arizona. Pipes found in these caves are described in considerable detail by S.J. Guernsey and A.V. Kidder in their studies basket maker caves of northeastern Arizona and archaeological explorations in northeast Arizona. A stone pipe and part of a clay pipe were found in a plundered grave in Arizona. But according to Wiener, plundered graves cannot from the starting point for any chronology or the ascertainment of culture to which the objects belong since these pipes may have gotten much later into the open graves. As for clay pipes, these could not belong to a culture as early as that of the so-called basket makers because the ancient basket makers did not yet know how to work in clay. No specimens of true pottery, says Guernsey and Kidder, either vessel or shirt have yet been found by us under circumstances indicating that it was a basket maker's product. Clay jars found in the cave were undoubtedly cached at a comparatively late date. A broken pipe made of clay was excavated at Casa Grande and another was found on the ground. The former object has a slight enlargement of the perforation at one end. Although much of the stem is missing, there is no doubt that this pipe belongs to the type called the straight tube variety, which is considered to be the prehistoric form in the southwest. Specimens of this straight tube variety are to be found in the mound builder culture. The mound builder culture extends from Florida to the country of the Hurons, and within its wide arc are found three types of pipes having a common origin. According to J.D. McGuire, there is the monitor type, which is found in the whole Atlantic region, down to South Carolina and as far west as Missouri. The straight-based or southern mound type, which extends from Florida to North Carolina and Tennessee, and the misnamed curved base mound type found in the regions of the Great Lakes and as far east as Virginia. Whatever the difference in these pipes, they all have a flat base, contends Leo Weiner, and they are all ornamented by animal motifs. Artifacts in these mounds were thought to be of great antiquity, dating back about 2,000 years. They are now known to have been much more recent. Squire and Davis reporting on pipes found in the mounds date them as late pre-Columbian, therefore not earlier than the 14th century. A few are of contact period manufacture, that is, after Columbus. The latter dating based on the European substances used in the manufacture of these latter pipes. Why these mounds were built is still a mystery. Similar mounds were used for the protection of Mandingo trading posts. Wiener, on the strength of the similarity observed between this type of African defense structure and American mound building, argues a direct of African influence and claims the mounds are African type stockades. His comparative plates are revealing. The influence of Africa on medieval American pipes is best 
demonstrated by the animal motifs found on the pipes. Most of the sculpture monitored pipes found in the mounds represent animals. Among these are seven pipes that represent the manati or sea cow. The sculptures of this animal, say Squire and Davis, are in the same style and of like material with the others found in the mounds. One of them is of red porphyry filled with a small white and light blue granules. Another pipe, delicately carved from compact limestone, represents a toucan, a tropical bird and one not known to exist anywhere within the limits of the U.S. A pottery fragment, either from a vessel or pipe, taken from a mound in Butler County, Ohio, is an unmistakable representation of the Brazilian toucan. This would seem merely to prove that there was traffic going on between the northern and southern halves of the continent because the toucan and the manati may be found in tropical latitudes further south. But there's more to it than that. Some of these pipes, as reported by J.D. McGuire, have excellent designs of African totem animals. The elephant totem is one of these, as are the manatis frogs, serpents, alligators, and birds. Some anthropologists claim the elephant motif is an Asian influence. There is a good case for this. The others, however, though also found in tropical latitudes in South America, feature prominently as totems among the Mandingo, and their selection from a range of tropical fauna for pipe design is no accident. Captain Bender gives the following tenny or totem fetish for some of the Mandingo. The Mandy proper have the Manati as the good and bad genius. The Samanke have the elephant. The Sama Samaco the snake. The Bambara the crocodile. These totem animals on the pipes were first represented on Mandingo amulets one on the arm known as the sea bay. Only later do they appear on the monitor pipes. These totemic amulets or fetishes called by the Americans sea bay or cola sea bay are mentioned by the Franciscan priest Ramon Payne as in use among the American Indians who wore them around the neck or on the arm. They were first made of a stone resembling marble. The extraordinary flat base of the bowl of the monitor pipe and its totemic representations can be seen as a consequence of its evolution from the Mandingo amulet or sea bay. R. T. Pritchett, in his book, Smokiana, remarks on the amazing similarity between the Guinea pipes and those of the North American or Red Indians. Of the two Ashanti pipes, one of them has for ornamentation a bird looking back at the bowl. Pritchett comments on their beauty, antiquity, and possible source of inspiration in the Greco-Roman world. The light-colored red clay of the Ashanti pipes is very striking and the form of the bowl still more so. There is a decidedly classical character about them as if started from Roman lamps and Pompeian ideas. Another plate features a long Dahomey Calumet pipe with hair tuft or adornment. The hanging tufts, Pritchett comments, are of red Indian character. The human form is also frequently represented on the pipes, either the head alone or a man crouching with head turned back. 
of the first types, E.G. Squire and E.H. Davis reproduce one of which the workmanship is unsurpassed by any specimen of ancient American art which has fallen under the notice of the editors, not accepting the best production of Mexico and Peru. One of the finest crouching figures is that on the bowl of a long pipe with a large orifice. It is now in the Museum of the Historical Society of New York, but its history is unknown. The front and side views are given in L. Shores's Voyage Pittoresque Auto du Monde. The thick negroid lips and broad, generous nose of this figure are well defined. Beside the compound bracelets, five on the wrist, six on the upper part of the arm, and four on the calf of the leg, or of a type found only in Africa. The headgear consists of world figures on the right and left, and the tuft in the middle. The whole seems to be a kind of hood the flaps of which come over the neck. It is to be noted that the majority of the pre-Columbian heads on pipes have just such a tuft in the middle. Even where the bowl obliterates this tuft, we still find the two knots at the side. This African top knot, represented in an exceedingly large number of figurines, found on pre-Columbian American pipes and pottery is not the only African feature. Equally interesting are the striations or markings on the faces of the figures. Captain Bender has given elaborate tattooing tables for a large number of African tribes and some of the Manday striations are identical with the American. Negroid heads and masks in pre-Columbian American art have already been dealt with in Chapter 2. A number of other finds should be noted here. Terracotta mask that Desire Charnay, a French anthropologist, picked up on the site of the Pyramid of the Sun at Teotihuacan, Mexico, included several that are unmistakably Negroid. One of these has woolen hair and two side knots. Another has a head adornment with three excrescences. Yet another has a knot with a rosette design. All familiar characteristics of West African coiffer. In summary, the smoke medicines of the Arabs, classified under the general name Tubak, were passed on to the African medicine men. These smoke medicines had been passed on to the Arabs earlier by Greco-Roman medicine, except that for the bitumen, henbane, and other viscous plants that the Greeks and Romans used, the Arabs substituted their own herbs, particularly the tubak, as described by Ibn al-Batar. The Africans likewise used their own native tubac as a smoke medicine. Jean Nicole specifically refers to tobacco cures among the Moors before American tobacco began to be imported into Africa. From the medicinal use of tubac among the Arabs and the medical and magical use of it among the Africans, there arose the habit of oral smoking. This led to the development and refinement, if not the innovation, of pipes among the Africans. The habit of oral smoking, several medicinal and magical functions of the Tubac, smoking words and smoking pipes, some with animal motifs and mandingo totems, were transferred from the Africans to the Americans in pre-Columbian times. End of chapter 11 They came before Columbus. The African presence 
in ancient America by Ivan Van Sertema Chapter 12 The Mystery of Mulan Pai Far beyond the western sea of the Arabs' countries, Atlantic Ocean, lies the lands of Mulan Pai. The ships which sail there are the biggest of all. One ship carries a thousand men. On board are weaving looms and marketplaces. If it does not encounter favorable winds, it does not get back to port for years. Friedrich Hirth and W. W. Rockhill Chao Jukua His work on the Chinese and Arab trade in the 12th and 13th centuries At sea, circa A.D. 900 The wind dropped to a calm and the sea became quite still we lay like swans asleep on a lake of blue glass. The Ruban, or captain, gave orders to let down all six of our stone angar, or anchors. And as we did so, I saw the large white shira, her sails, of our companion ship, large as a cloud, shrivel slowly down to the foot of the dakal, or mast. Thus we lay, staring into the emptiness of the sea and the sky for three days. On the fourth day, our angar were hoisted aboard. Half a hundred men went down into the karib, or lifeboats, and ropes were attached to the stern of the ship which stretched taunt over the water as the men rode and rode. They were like ants dragging a mountain. We made one night an hour. But it stirred us back to life, and we had only done it to kindle a spark from the smoke of our souls. This, above all, we who sailed in the great ships feared most, the calms even more than the fury and violence of al the typhoon. Our ships were as large as ten houses, and we felt we were in a fortress, the walls of which were impregnable against the battering rams and catapults of the waves. It was the waiting that filled our hearts with terror, the windless silence the siege of space. We feared we would suffocate on the dry decks, drowned by the ocean of space itself, like fishes beached on the waterless sands, drowned in pure air. Allah be praised, the mercy of God on those who magnify Him for a gentle and favorable wind began to blow at last over the vast pool. Our great sails were unfurled, and once again we moved across the ocean-like clouds. There were about eight hundred men on board the two ships, and we magnified Allah, and congratulated one another, and wept from the intensity of our own happiness. Toward evening, birds came circling above us. They alighted on the lookout post at the top of the Dakal. But even as we rejoiced at the winds of the day and heard the song of the land and the shrieking banter of the birds, a shaft of lightning shone from the direction of the east. Thunder followed, and a rainstorm, and all the horizons were completely darkened. A powerful gale caught us and started to shake 
and beat upon our ship with a thousand hands. A great darkness fell upon us, a darkness so deep that for the rest of the night and far into the morning of the next day we could not see our companionship. The flashing of the waves, nor the still, far lamps of our heavenly pilots, the stars. Thus would an Arab African sailor, if he had kept a log, have written of some of his adventures on the high seas. It would be unlikely, however, that such a log would have survived the wholesale burning of Moorish documents in libraries in the squares of Grenada by Cardinal Jimenez in the late 15th century. Fortunately, in spite of all the burning of ancient and medieval manuscripts, Arab shipping in both the Mediterranean Sea and Indian Ocean is well documented. There are surviving narratives in Arabic describing voyages in ancient and medieval times. There are paintings, wrecks, or later copies of some of these ships, as well as Ramanat, or books of nautical instructions. Dafatir, sailing direct directions, and Suwar, expertly drafted sailing charts. There are historical records of splendid Arab naval victories, like the one against the Byzantine fleet, 500 ships strong, in A.D. 655. We have already drawn attention to the Arab influence on European shipping via the Mediterranean. The invention by the Arabs of the Latin sail, which Columbus and Vespucci used on their caravels. We should also make mention of the refinement and later transmission of the magnetic needle as a mariner's compass from China to the Mediterranean by the Arabs in the age of the Crusades. Their influence on European as well as on African shipping was considerable. The Mtepe is an East African version of an ancient Arab ship. Just as the main nautical instruments used by Columbus were European versions of early Arab inventions and transmissions. The Arab ship dramatized above with six stone anchors, rowing boats large enough to tow the ship in a calm crews of 400, sails as large as clouds, in ocean in the 10th century. Such ships were ten times larger than any ship Columbus sailed to the Americas. It was in the 10th century that Arab ships were reported to have visited Atlantic islands. We find this report in the works of the Nubian geographer. Idrisi. The Third Climate, A.D. 1151. The Atlantic islands referred to, however, were just the Canary Islands. There the Arabs who had set out from Lisbon found to their surprise that speakers of Arabic had already preceded them. They came upon, quote, an Arab interpreter to the king of the Canary Islands." End quote. There is evidence also that they had visited and charted all the islands in the North Atlantic, not just the Canaries, but the Cape Verde Islands and the Azores. A geography of the world published in Europe in A.D. 1350 by a Franciscan friar lists all of these islands, and they are all given Arabic names. 
This merely proves, however, that Arabs were navigating in the Atlantic. The one remarkable piece of cartographic evidence confirming pre-Columbian contact with America lies in the map of the famous Turkish admiral Piri Reis. The Piri Reis map was discovered in 1929 in the old imperial palace of Istanbul. It was painted by Piri Reis on parchment in the year 1513 from maps partially destroyed in the library at Alexandria. Parts of the reconstruction are probably not as old as the sack of Alexandria itself. Who is to say that Perry Reese did not add to the ancient materials? The question inevitably arises, could he not have inserted the South American continent since, at the time of the reconstruction of the map, South America had already been visited by Vespucci, June 1499, and Cabral, April 1500. There is something unexplainable, however, about this map. Europeans did not rediscover the technique of determining longitude until the mid-18th century. Maps drawn more than 200 years after Columbus do not show South America in its proper relationship to Africa. Yet this map, redrawn in the Arab world in 1513, features the accurately <clears throat> charted east coastline of South America in its right longitudinal relationship with the Atlantic coast of the Old World, Africa. Also, it has Cairo, capital of the Arab world, as the center and base for its global computations. The astronomical and navigational knowledge demonstrated in the Perry Rees map is so astonishing that no map until those of the 20th century surpasses it in terms of the precision of its latitudinal and longitudinal coordinates in the representation of coastlines of Africa and South America. Clearly, it was drawn by a people who saw South America before Columbus. A people, moreover, who knew how to plot latitude and longitude. Only the Chinese and the Arabs mastered this knowledge long before the era of Columbus. A recent find in South America seems to suggest an Arab presence there as early as the 8th century AD. Quote, Off the coast of Venezuela, was discovered a hoard of Mediterranean coins with so many duplicates that it cannot well be a numismatist collection, but rather a supply of cash. Nearly all the coins are Roman, from the reign of Augustus to the 4th century AD. Two of the coins, however, are Arabic of the 8th century AD. It is the latter which gives us the terminus a quo, i.e. time after which, of the collection as a whole, which cannot be earlier than the latest coins in the collection. Roman coins continued in use as a currency into medieval times. A Moorish ship seems to have crossed the Atlantic around A.D. 800. Because Roman and Arab coins were not only in use by Romans and Arabs, this evidence cannot stand alone. It is supportive but not conclusive. The evidence we shall present to establish contact is historical. Sung Dynasty Documents Agricultural The pre-Columbian transmission to Africa and Asia of American Zimes and linguistic Arab words in Africa, Asia and Europe for the maize plant as well as 77 clan names and place 
names shared by the Berbers of North Africa and a group of American Indian tribes. We shall see, however, from our examination of this evidence that the Arabs returned home rather than settle in America, and hence, like the Vikings, left a very negligible influence upon Aboriginal Americans. We shall discover also such a strong Negroid element among the Arab African mariners, an element numerically if not politically dominant, that as a consequence there are no skeletal remains or traces or cultural influence in America that can be distinguished from the earlier or later African Negro presence with but one signal exception. This exception is in the area of family and tribal names. And here we shall see the very strong possibility that the shared nomenclatures of the North American Berbers and a number of American Aboriginal tribes were as much the result of journeys by Americans to Africa as the reverse. Of these journeys by Americans to the Old World, there are four documented instances. And the American Aborigines, unlike the Arabs, lack the capacity to return home, thereby leaving a marked influence through settlement, which influence extends beyond a linguistic to a physical and architectural presence in some Berber villages. Let us first look at the case for an Arab journey to America and back. A Chinese professor, Hui Lin Lai, presented a paper to the American Oriental Society in 1961. In this paper, Professor Lai highlighted two geographical works of the Song Dynasty, the Ling Wei Teita. 1178 by Chao Chu Fei and Chu Fan Chi 1225 by Chao Zhu Kua. These are documents on the Chinese and Arab trade in the 12th and 13th centuries. Both works claim that Arab ships headed west of Tashin the extremity of the Mohammedan world, which would be the Atlantic coastline of Africa, and traveling on a great sea, sailing due west for a full 100 days, discovered a new country. The Chinese knew the Arabs as Tashi, and extended that term to embrace the dominion over which they had political or spiritual influence. Tashi came to stand for the Arab Muslims as well as the Arab Mohammedan world. The ocean west of that world would become the Atlantic. One hundred days sailing by a large, slow ship across the Atlantic from an Arab port sailing due west could only bring one to America. It should be noted that the journey takes almost twice as long as that by an African small boat. But allowance should be made for the calms. Thus, Lindemann and Bombard made it to America in African-type boats in just a little more time than it took Amerigo Vespucci in his caravel. The boats that sailed for a hundred days west of Tashi, according to the Chinese, carried several hundred men to a boat. This is no exaggeration. Buzerg has recorded that large Arab ships of this period could carry on average 400 men. Both the Sung geographers derived their information from Arab merchants who visited the trading ports of southern China Quote, translating foreign products into Chinese equivalents and transcribing foreign place names into Chinese sounds. End quote. 
they described the ships that made the journey and the things they found there, particularly plants not familiar to the Arabs or Chinese. The new country indicated in the Sung documents was known as Mulan Pai, which may be translated as land reached by great ships. These ships sailed both the southern and western seas. Hui Lin Lai, on the strength of all the references in the Sung documents, identifies the southern sea as the Indian Ocean and the western sea as the Atlantic Ocean. A sea so vast that there was nothing to be seen for a hundred days of continuous sailing and which was entered on from a seaport west of Tashi, the westernmost part of the Muslim world, a seaport just off North Africa, could only be the Atlantic. The following passage from Chao Chi Fei, translated by Friedrich Hirth and W. W. Rockhill, gives a detailed account of these large ships. The bracketed insertions are mine, but are backed upon Professor Lai's interpretations. Quote, the ships which sailed the southern sea, Indian Ocean, brackets, and south of it are like houses. When their sails are spread, they are like great clouds in the sky. Their rudders are several tens of feet long. A ship carries several hundred men. It has stored on board a year's supply of grain. The big ship with its heavy cargo has naught to fear of the great waves, but in shallow water it comes to grief. Far beyond the western sea of the Arabs' countries, brackets, Atlantic Ocean, lies the land of Mulan Pai. Its ships brackets, that is, the ships which sail there, are the biggest of all. One ship carries a thousand men. On board are weaving looms and marketplaces. If it does not encounter favorable winds, it does not get back to port for years. No ship but a very big one could make such voyages. At the present time, the term Mulan Chao is used brackets in China to designate the largest kind of ship. Hearth and Rockhill, the first translators of the Sung Dynasty documents, thought that, to judge from the reports, the crops of the new country were so exaggerated in size and abnormal appearance that they either gave them incongruous locations or dismissed them as fantasies. An assiduous reinspection of the weights, appearance, and storage properties of some of the plants seen in the land reached by these ships has helped Professor Lai to identify some of them as New World products. Of those mentioned by the first geographer, Chow, 1178, there are three which are distinctive, a large grain, a large gourd, and a strange sheep. A cereal grain three inches long, Hui Lin Lai comments, is indeed something unusual, and this one has the property of surviving long storage. This strange cereal cannot be wheat, rice, barley, or even rye or oats, all of which are not only of smaller size, but were familiar enough to both the Chinese and the Arabs at that time not to have aroused special interest. 
judging from its large size and distinctive storage properties, the grain described is apparently maize or Indian corn. Z maize, an American plant, its grains are much larger than any of the cereals of the old world, and because of its very low protein content, it can be stored for a long time. A characteristic which would certainly have impressed old world observers. Chow also describes a gigantic gourd which was, quote, big enough to feed 20 or 30 persons. This Professor Lai identifies as the pumpkin a plant of American origin. These gourds attain a great size, some varieties occasionally weighing as much as 240 pounds. There are large gourds of old world origin. Professor Lai points out such as the watermelon and the wax gourd, but these would not have been singled out for special mention because they were long known to both the Arabs and the Chinese. In addition to the strange cereal and gourd cited by Chao Chufei, 1178, the later geographer Chao Juqua, 1225, gives four other unusual plant products. A, quote, pomegranate weighing five katis, a peach weighing two katis, a citron weighing over twenty katis, and a lettuce weighing as much as over ten katis. There are a number of plants unknown to the old world at the time of Chao Juqua, with which these four items might be identified fruits of American origin, long cultivated in the northern part of South America, the avocado, the cherimoya, the sweet sop, the sour sop, the guava, the papaya, and the pineapple grow to a substantial size. Some like the pineapple, may weigh as much as six pounds. This makes the unusual weights assigned by Xiao Juqua to his several strange fruits come within reasonable bounds. Professor Lai, on the strength of the weights and descriptions, tentatively identifies the pomegranate as the several species of Anona, that is, the sweet sop, sour sop, and cherimoya, the peach as the avocado or papaya, the citron as the pineapple. With respect to the lettuce, Hui Lin Lai comments, the lettuce cited by Chow could be the South American tobacco plant. Chinese lettuce is an often leafy plant, more resembling the tobacco plant in general appearance than the lettuce plant of the Western world. It is used by the Chinese as a salad, and both the fleshy stem and the green leaves are eaten either pickled or raw. Tobacco is now known to most people in the form of the aged and processed leaves used for smoking, chewing, or snuff taking, but it should be noted that the cured leaves can also be used immediately for chewing, a practice which very likely was in more general usage among the American Indians in former times. The comparison of the tobacco plant to the lettuce plant is, therefore, not too far-fetched. In addition to the plant products, both Chow and Chow spoke of sheep of unusual height with large tails. 
Professor Lai identifies these as the llama and alpaca, which are not really sheep, but which, in some respects, so closely resemble the sheep of the Old World that they have been mistaken as such even by travelers in post-Columbian times. They are, according to Professor Lai, two domesticated breeds in South America of the wild guanaco one being bred as a beast of burden and the other for its wool. They are members of the camel family, although they lack humps. They closely resemble a sheep except for the long erect neck, which makes them look much taller than sheep. Both the llama and alpaca also have large tails. The unusual height and the large tail are features particularly emphasized by Chao Chu Fei. The strange cereal cited by the Sung geographers as three inches long and with the pro property of surviving long storage was in all likelihood Zimes or American corn as it is more popularly known. Maize or American corn has been firmly established as an indigenous American plant, but there is equally firm evidence that it traveled to the Old World in pre-Columbian times. Professor M. D. W. Jeffries, formerly attached to Whitwaterstrand University, has pursued the matter of pre-Columbian maize in the Old World for the last twenty years. He cites a number of archaeological and botanical fields and unravels a remarkable tapestry of linguistic threads running across Africa and Asia and Europe that form too consistent a web of clues to be summarily brushed aside. He dismisses, first of all, the popular assumption that the Portuguese and the Dutch introduced maize into Africa after their acquaintance with America. There seemed at first to be clear confirmation of this assumption in the names for maize distributed along the Guinea coast. These maize names which are linked to vernacular stems used by Africans to refer to Europeans strangers, white men, were thought to indicate that Europeans, the Portuguese and Dutch, had introduced maize into Africa in the early 16th century after the discovery of America. Jeffries had shown that the terms were in use long before the arrival of the Europeans and that they were used to refer to Arabs as well as Berbers and Arab Berber Arab-Negroid light-skinned mixtures. The Portuguese raid for slave on the Guinea coast in 1444, for example, records that when African captives in the mid-15th century were exposed for sale in Lagos, Portugal, it was truly a thing astonishing to behold, for among them were some well-nigh white others were black as Ethiopians. It would be absurd to assume, argues Jeffries, that these people, well nigh white, had no name among the black Africans until the latter encountered the Portuguese. The word tu rawa, for example, tur means Arab, awa means people mentioned by Ibn Battuta as early as the mid-14th century in the record of his visit to Mali is also in many West African languages Nupe, Kapa, Ebe, Hansa, Kambali, Guru, and Moni to cite just a few the general term for quote white man other popular stems and their variants found in maize names such as Boro, Boro, Poro, Puru, 
Pura, Poto, Putu, and so on, were thought to be exclusive reference to Europeans, that is, the Portuguese. Porteres interpretation of the term puto, coels of poro and wieners of aboro are all part of the same mistake. Jeffries shows that the similarity between the sound put in African vernaculars and the sound port and put in Portuguese is purely coincidental. The Arabs, for example, have clearly been established as the distributors of the plantain and banana in West Africa. The Vi, a West African tribe, called the banana Poro banana, which is the banana of the Poro, the stem Poro standing in this case for the Arab, as in later times it came to stand for the Portuguese and other Europeans. The case is amply demonstrated with both the plantain and banana names using the following tribes as test cases the Mano, Kisi, Shi, Uwa, Ga, Fante, Crepi, Ashante, and Casina. Further, the pre Columbian Arab trade in spices and the aromatic seed Afra Momum led to a number of African names for these spices and aromatics in which these stems reappear, linking their origin to the Arabs. For example, among the Yoruba and Igbo of Nigeria and the Aku of Sierra Leone stems which are terms for Arabs, Polo, Boro, Opolo, Aboru may be found in the names for a number of Arab trade items. It would be strange indeed if so many people trading in plantains, bananas, spices, peppers, and perfumes had to wait for the Portuguese to arrive before inventing names for these. No African maize name, which is usually a compound of the name for the local sorghum and the name of the people from whom maize was obtained, connects the European unequivocally with the introduction of maize. Even the Pongwe, whose word for maize is associated with a phrase meaning people of the sun, cannot be shown to have got maize from the Europeans, as Professor Porteres has claimed. The phrase people of the sun is widespread in Africa and is pre-European. It was used to refer to those Egyptian pharaohs who were light-skinned. Not only have these claims, like those of Willett and Porteres, that there is a linguistic link between the Portuguese and Maize in West Africa, been exposed by Jeffries as untenable, but historical documents of the Portuguese and the Dutch themselves show that the equally insistent claim that maize first arrived in Africa across the Atlantic, having been brought from the Guyanas and Brazil by Portuguese and Dutch vessels to the Guyanese coast, has no foundation. The discovery of Brazil by the Portuguese explorer Alvarez Cabral in 1500 makes no mention of maize, and Cabral did not sail to Guyana from Brazil, but went direct to Calicut in India, where he stayed for a while to found a trading station. Even the possibility of his taking maize to India must be ruled out, because there maize is known by the same name as in East Africa, the Sorghum of Mecca. Another Portuguese expedition visited Brazil in 1501, but not the Guinea coast. As for the Dutch, their visits to America were later still, and 1595 was the year of their first expedition to West Africa. But what of the Spanish? Surely Columbus could have brought maize grains to Spain. Brazil, after all, 
was not the exclusive home of Zimes, and the Portuguese and the Dutch were not the only potentially maize carrying Europeans to set foot on West African soil in the late 15th and early 16th centuries. Willett contends, quote, in 1493 Columbus probably introduced maize from Haiti into Spain. Certainly, Mahitz or Marichi arrived in Spain from Cuba in 1520, although its cultivation appears to have been attempted in Seville in 1500. On the first point, Jeffries shows that Columbus did not, at that date, 1493, introduced maize into Spain. He quotes P. Weatherwax, who notes that it, maize, is generally supposed to be among the New World curiosities taken back by Columbus on his return from the first voyage and purely imaginary pictures of the admirable, admiral being received by Ferdinand and Isabella sometimes show ears of corn. We have searched the old chronicles with some care on this point and have failed to find any explicit support for this quite plausible inference. Jefferies also points to this lack of evidence for a post-Columbian introduction of maize highlighted by the Italian Bertignoli, who, writing in 1881, states, quote, it is generally accepted that maize was imported from America by the Spaniards. But this opinion is not substantiated by any definite documents. End quote. Even if the Spanish had brought maize to Guyana in 1496, it could not account for what the evidence suggests. That as early as 1500, Maize was already a staple crop and regular food on the Guyana coast. By 1502, it was helping, it was being exported to San Tome. The first reference to this exportation of maize from Guyana coast was made by the Portuguese Valentin Fernandez, who in 1506 said that maize. Fernandez used the term Zaburo, which will be discussed later, was exported from the Guyana coast to San Tome and grown there for the first time in 1502. Fernandez, describing the Wolof, whose country lay between the Senegal and Gambia rivers, also remarked, quote, They eat rice of which they have little. Of maize they have much. The Mandingos, the largest group in this area, were also noted in this reference as cultivators of Milo Zaburo. Some critics of Jeffries have suggested that maize could be confused with African sorghum, and that Fernandez's use of Zaburo for maize is not conclusive. The distinction between sorghum and maize, however, was known, or rather, sorghum was too well known to be confused with maize. It had been cultivated in the Iberian Peninsula for some centuries before 1502 and acquired its own names there. Names for sorghum are mentioned by the Arab writer Debin al Awan in his treatise on agriculture in the Iberian Peninsula, Kitab al-Falawa, published in 1158 in Seville. In Spain, sorghum was and still is known as Malika, Sagina, Mazorica, Mazaroca, and in Portuguese as Sorgo or Mayora. <clears throat> Why ask Jeffries? Should Fernandez use Zaburo for sorghum, which has its own separate constellation of names? The term Zaburo was further qualified by Fernandez Milho Zaburo 
the karate. To indicate the extraordinarily large maize grain that an anonymous Portuguese pilot to Guyana, according to Sergei Salvaglot, described in 1520 as being of the size of chickpeas. Much of the early maize of West Africa, Jeffrey's notes, was flint maize, whose grains are generally large, and the only cereal in the high rainfall areas of the West African coast, which produces a grain comparable in size with chickpeas, is maize. There is also another and more serious argument against the possible confusion of sorghum with maize. Jeffries contends that cultivated sorghum is not able to grow in the rainforest regions where maize flourishes. The sorghum grains in the humid climate are rapidly attacked by mildew. The Portuguese pilot paid five visits to San Tome, describing the maize there in considerable detail. He also commented that it was everywhere. While it is true that the pilot's visits and references post-date Fernandez by about 15 years, there could not possibly have been a shift from heavy sorghum cultivation to ubiquitous maize cultivation in the intervening period. Dr. H. Lanz E. Silva said of the pilot's evidence that the Zaburo he describes certainly does not refer to sorghum, but to Z-maize, whose grains can roughly be compared with those of Lathyrus cicera, which is indigenous in the south of Europe and therefore known to the author. An earlier Portuguese reference suggesting the pre-Columbian cultivation of maize in Guyana comes from a record of the ordinances of the Portuguese king Manuel, 1495 to 1521, who allowed for the purchase of maize from Guyana by those ships that were sent to embark slaves at San Tome. An even earlier dating is given by Santa Rose de Viterbo, who, in his supplement, to the Elucidario, written in 1798 on the authority of earlier writers, states that maize was brought into Portugal in the reign of King John, 1481 to 1495, after the discovery of Guyane. A considerable number of references are quoted by Jeffries to demonstrate the widespread cultivation of maize along the Guyana coast in the 16th century. These other references, however, while they certainly establish the ubiquity of maize and its use as a staple food in West Africa, are too late. I feel to be of value in this argument. What is more relevant and persuasive is his contention that the Portuguese terms for maize are African terms, and that on finding maize in the Americas, the Portuguese neither invented new names for it, nor did they adopt the local American Indian name. Rather, they referred to maize as Milho de Gaiani or Zapuro. Jules Cesar Seelinger, as early as 1557, stated that the word Zabur for a cereal was of African origin. He remarked, quote, My Liam is called by the Ethiopians Zabur, by the Arabs Dora. Jeffries, in an article on Zaburo, shows that the evidence points to the origin of the word among the Akan, a Twi-speaking people, who he claims acquired maize from the Arabs while in the Jen 
Timbuktu region circa 1300 and acquired the name at the same time because the Twi, Fante, and Asante do not have the Z sound in their languages. Zabudo would appear in these languages as Abudo. Over a wide area, Za and its variants mean Sorghum, and Boro and Buro are variants of the term for Arab. The Zabudo or Aburo means Sorghum of the Arab. Even in East Africa, among the Sian Gazija, the term for maize is Rama Buro, which means the sorghum of the Buro, where the word Buro would never be taken to mean anyone but an Arab. The possible alternative origin of this word, Zaburo, from Serburo, meaning cattle fodder, has also been considered by Jeffries. The possibility does not upset his case. The early use of maize for fodder may have easily led to the phonetic and semantic fusion of these verbal twins, Zaburo, Seburo. Leo Wiener quotes Soares de Souza as saying in 1587 that, quote, in all of Brazil, there is a native plant which the Indians call Ubatim, maize, which is Guiana millet, and which in Portugal is called Zabudo. The Portuguese in Brazil plant this millet with which to feed the horses, cattle, chickens, goats, sheep, and pigs. End quote. In Italy, notes Jeffries, quoting Berta Cagnoli, quote, Maize at first was grown as a food for cattle. End quote. Jeffries has followed the trail of maize across vast areas of Africa, west, east, and south finally to Asia and Asia Minor, the empire of the Turks and Saracens, and from Asia Minor to Europe. The evidence he unearths is not simply based on linguistics, that is, names for maize, but also on archaeological finds, such as the Goodwin finds at the al Ife. The summers and wild finds in the Inyanga ruins of Mano Motapa, now Rhodesia, and the Vishnu Mitre and Gupta finds in India, all pre Columbian. A. J. H. Goodwin in 1953 reported that pots decorated by rolling a maize cob over wet clay were found at Ile Ife, Yoruba territory in Nigeria. Goodwin noted, quote, as vast numbers of specimens were collected from a pavement of potsherds that provided a clear dating line for certain sites, it became important to note whether or not the maize cob decoration occurred. It did and it is abundantly clear that this particular paving is subsequent to the introduction of maize." End quote. This pavement was laid while Ile Ife was the ritual capital of the Yoruba kings. No more precise dating is given, although there is no question that the pavement is pre-Columbian. Jeffrey's attempts to date it and the maize cob potsherds found on its surface by reference to Yoruba traditions. These traditions, according to R. F. Burton, state that maize was introduced among the Yoruba by yellow-skinned foreigners who crossed the Niger from the northeast. This would rule out Europeans as bringers of maize to Africa 
since apart from the fact that they do not fit the physical description they came much later and from the west maize according to Yoruba traditions recorded by Babalola arrived in Yoruba land while the Ile Ife was still the capital Talbot writes that between AD 600 and AD 1000 a wave of immigrants from the caste invaded Yoruba land and made Ile Ife their capital but later this capital was moved to Old Oyo Jeffrey says quote if now one takes the latest date for the invasion as say AD 1000 and the Old Oyo was founded around AD 1100 then it would appear that somewhere about this time maize appeared among the Yoruba Jeffries has done another important test to confirm the Yoruba oral traditions that maize reached them from the northeast as one progresses inland from the coast he notes the tribal names for maize indicate the route by which it migrated thus the name for maize in tribe A is the sorghum of tribe X and where X is found ultimately to be the name of a tribe east or north of the receiving tribe A two or three examples may make this clearer the Hagi receiving their maize from the Kanori call it the sorghum of the Kanori to distinguish it from their local brand of sorghum African sorghum the Jakun receiving it from the Pabir call it the sorghum of the Pabir and the Yakutare received it from the Kwona called it the sorghum of the Kwona and so on the evidence Jeffries presents for pre-Columbian maize in East Africa is equally impressive the Arabs were trading on the East African sea coast from Sofala to Arabia long before the Portuguese had rounded the Cape of Good Hope the Arabs penetrated far inland for when the Portuguese first visited Zimbabwe then the capital of Mono Motapa the present Rhodesia they found Arabs already established there Jeffrey shows that starting from Sofala and proceeding north along the coast until Madras in India is reached all the names for maize among the coastal tribes of East Africa are connected with the Arabs V. Dalmedia the first viceroy of India noted on his arrival at Kilwa on the East African coast in 1505 that that city had plenty of milho like that of Guyane the Portuguese had for centuries known what sorghum was like but here at Kilwa was a grain like that found on the coast of Guinea again it must be pointed out that 200 inches of rain fall on the coast of Guinea and so no cultivated sorghum will grow but maize grows and produces two crops a year hence it follows that the remark by the Almedia Milo or grain like that of the Guyane can point only to maize in 1505 then maize was a staple crop in places as far apart as Kilwa East Africa and the Guyane coast West Africa Chinese sources established an even earlier date for maize in East Africa Dewey Van Dyck mentions that the Chinese between 1405 and 1422 sent six expeditions by sea to East Africa these Chinese navigators sent back reports of things seen there among which were an unknown cereal with extraordinary large ears a vegetarian tiger which has been identified as the African zebra and sweet dew 
With respect to the first item, it should be noted that the Chinese were well acquainted with the Old World cereals, rice, wheat, barley, and sorghum, none of which carry extraordinary large ears. Therefore, one is forced to the conclusion that the cereal referred to was maize. The size of maize would strike the Chinese, who, according to the botanist Alphonse de Candole, have annually since 2200 B.C. ceremonially sown five kinds of seeds, wheat, rice, sorghum, citeria, italica, and soy, none of which, it must be repeated, carry extraordinarily large ears. How and when maize got to China is another intriguing side to the story. The first European to reach Mozambique around the Cape, Vasco da Gama, recorded maize there in March 1498. In an account of the capture of two boats in the Mozambique Channel, da Gama wrote, in the one we took we found seventeen men, besides gold, silver, and an abundance of maize, milho, and other provisions. The word milho, Jeffreys claims, on the strength of all the documents he has examined, was the standard Portuguese official name for maize, and was used for maize in the early records of the Portuguese administration. Recordings of maize in southern Africa by Europeans are all post-15th century, but they are well before the movement of the Europeans as settlers into that area. They found maize already growing there when they arrived. Reports in the 16th century attest to the pre-European presence of maize in southern Africa, accounts of a shipwreck on the South African coast in 1554 and of a murdered priest at Zimbabwe, now Rhodesia, in 1561, both tell of a cereal in terms that leave little doubt as to its identity as maize. A survivor of the wreck of the Esperanca in 1554, Manuel Perestrello, not only uses the term Milho Zapuro for the grain offered by the Africans at the mouth of the Pescaria River, but the priest who was murdered, Father Gonzalo de Siviera, was noted in a Portuguese account for his daily consumption of roasted grain cooked with herbs. A detail that distinguishes maize from African sorghum. This is so because Indian corn, maize, in South Southern Africa, unlike Kafir corn, African sorghum, is roasted on the heads and the embers and eaten parched in hot ashes or cooked with herbs and served as a vegetable relish, which is still the practice among the Bantu today. Further evidence of pre-Columbian maize in South Africa has been found in the Ayanga ruins of Mano Motapa. The Ayanga site was abandoned in the 15th century, according to R. Summers. H. Wilde, in his botanical report on these ruins, states, Portions of a maize cob, Z. maize, were found on the surface of a grinding place on Site 4, although no actual seeds were discovered. How did maize reach southern Africa before the Dutch or the Portuguese? As a consequence of the movement, says Jeffries, of two Bantu tribes, the Nguni and the Bavenda, from East Africa into Central Southern Africa, Jeffries traced the names for maize among these migrating Bantu tribes, and he found that South African Bantu tribes either have stems of the Nguni words for maize and maize loaf 
or called maids by a similar name to that by which they knew the Nguni. While the maize words of the Bavenda tribe form a linguistic island, that is, are words used for maize only by the Bavenda. This clearly suggests that the Nguni arrived with maize before the Bavenda came, and in disseminating this crop, disseminated the maize names linked with them. Arab trade in the Indian Ocean closely linked the East African coastal territories with the world of India and China. The pre-Columbian appearance of maize in India therefore can be explained in the same way. Chinese documents of the Ming Dynasty, the Pun Sao Kang Mu, the Nong Chang Xuan Shu, and the K T King Wan also point to a pre-Columbian introduction from territory west of China. The latter document specifically pinpointing Kansu, where there was a large settlement of Arabs. In 1928, the Russian botanist N. N. Kuleshov published the results of his investigations into maize in Asia. These results point to a feature in Asiatic maize which, if it is a mutation of the American plant, would call for an earlier cultivation of maize in Asia than the time of the first landing by the Portuguese on the shores of Asia in 1516. The facts which were established by us, Kuleshov and Vavilov, return us anew to this supposition and this time with a great deal of conviction. Maize names in India all suggest an Arab introduction. In the whole of southern India, says Sri P. Krishna Rao in a personal letter to Professor Jeffries, maize is known as Mecca Sorghum, the word Sorghum being rendered into the respective local Indian language. The names all strongly point to the fact that maize has come from Mecca. Mecca here refers not to a specific place but to the symbolic heartland of the Arab Mohammedan world. The Vishnu Maitra and Gupta finds are the strongest evidence supporting the pre-Columbian presence of maize in Asia. Vishnu Maitra describing carbonized food grains and their impressions on potsherds from Kuandinyapur, an archaeological site in Madhya Pradesh, North India, wrote that, quote, the evidence of maize in India is not in any case later than 1435 A.D. and tends to establish its pre-Columbian age, end quote from both Asia and Asia Minor, which circa 1320 was the empire of the Muslim Turks and Saracens, may spread to Europe, and hence it is referred to in European countries as Turkish wheat, Saracen wheat, wheat of Asia, or Arabian wheat. Turk was once the generic name for the Arab in the Mediterranean. Thus we have Grano Turco, Grano Saraceno, Fumentum Saracenium, Fumentum Asiaticum, Italy, Turkish corn, Tartarian wheat, Great Britain, Turks Tarway, Holland, Turkish Saved, Sweden, Turetsky Jelb, Russia, Fumentum Asiaticum, Germany, Blé de Turkey, France, Shirkia, Morocco, and Arab site, Greece. The pre Columbian appearance of maize in Asia is well known. Botanists who knew nothing of the African 
pre-Columbian evidence unearthed by Jeffries were claiming an Asian origin for the grain. In fact, no one ever suggested that maize was originally brought to Europe from America in the first 30 years of the discussion of the plant. Europe, as Jeffries has shown, has almost all of its names for maize associated with Asia. That part of Asia within the pre-Columbian Mohammedan world. Asia, on the other hand, has no names for maize associated with America or Europe. Even in Spain, an early name for maize was Trigo de Turquia. Not the American word maize. From the Arawak maize, and in Portugal, as mentioned earlier, it was referred to as the Guinea wheat. To return to the central question, how did maize get to Africa, to Asia, to Asia Minor, and to Europe in pre-Columbian times? Who originally brought it from America, and when and how? Jeffries has suggested expeditions, return journeys, across the Atlantic by Arab Africans to account for the pre-Columbian presence of American maize in the Old World. A thesis published in Algiers in 1930 by a French commandant, Jules Cave, lends further support to this suggestion. While involved in another study, Cave noticed that the ethnic names of certain Berber groups were the same as those of certain American Indian tribes. The Berbers are a mixed race of Arabs who live in North Africa. They originally came from Northern Asia, India, and the Caucasus, and have also mingled with Negroid tribes in the Saharan deserts. They lived in the medieval period at the northern boundary of the Mali Empire and paid allegiance to the black emperors of Mali. Because of their original Asian background, before their intermingling with other Caucasoid and Negroid elements, Covey found it necessary to cross-check Asian ethnic names to see whether these similar names among the Berbers and the Americans rose as a consequence of a simultaneous arrival of groups from Asia. This check could not explain these astonishing parallels. Few could be accounted for by virtue of the early Asiatic element in the Berber background. Certain American ethnic names, Calvé said, are only duplicated among the Berbers and are not found anywhere else in the world. Certain other American names have undergone Berber transformations. The origin of a number of names is attested by the grouping of names of collectives in the vicinity of their point of origin. Calvet examined the origins of 77 such similar names of tribes on both sides of the Atlantic. Among the 77, he was able to distinguish five categories. Of the 77, he found as many as 46 names of American tribes that seemed to come directly from Africa. He cites the following examples in this category. The Aslantecas of America. The Atlantis mentioned in Herodotus. The Baquetas, the ancient Baquatis. The Barkas, the Barkajana mentioned by Arab writers. The Bukoyas to Bukoya of the Rift in North Africa. The Gwesnes, the Gwesna of the Rift. The Gwalis, the Gwelia of the Rift. The Chorti, the Chorta mentioned by Arab writers. The Gomeres, the Gomara of the Rift in the island Gomera. The Guanches, the Guanches of the Canary Islands, the Huaris, the Huara of Morocco, etc. 
Ave explains how some of these names found among Americans belong to inland as well as coastal Atlantic Berbers. Berber tribes moved around. Inland tribes took part in expeditions organized by coastal tribes. Arab African expeditions to America drew upon people from all over the Berber complex in Africa. In the other four categories of names he places those which certainly came from the East but might have got to America from Europe as well as from the Berbers. Examples are the Antis, Torres, Dorans, Gobelins, Gis, Jabaros, Lippis, Parisis, Syracus, Samagotos, Tamiz, Zamoras. Those that are also Berber but seem certainly to have come to the Americas from Europe. Campus and Utes, those that might equally have come from Asia as from Africa, Chorus, Chalcus, Cochines, Katamas, and those whose origins remain unsure but are found nonetheless duplicated in America and North Africa, the Amel Cetus, Caesaris, Pharaonis, Georgesenos, Matamatis, and Out Taouts. Covey's study is massive. It runs to half a thousand pages. These in brief, however, are his main discoveries. Some of the ethnic names he has turned up could have traveled to America during the medieval contact period between Africans and Americans. One is the uh, Galabese, for a small tribe in Brazil in a province once known as Portuguese Guyana. From the Galabese in the Mali University town of Timbuktu. Another is the Marabitine tribe of the Sudan, which he compares with the Mara Batinas and the Mara Vitinas, also a former Portuguese Guyana in Brazil. Mara Bios, Nicaragua, and the Mara Vigene, Venezuela. There are many more, but these should suffice. Anthropologists have often found ethnic names important in following the migrations of peoples. Like the names of individuals, they are the last linguistic elements to go, even after the foreign tongue has been abandoned, forgotten, or absorbed. Linguistic studies among the Gula blacks in the Sea Islands, for example, although related only to post-Columbian migrations, show how thousands of West African names have been retained as secret names among them. People drop a great deal when they settle in an alien environment and intermarry with the women or the culture of native populations. The last thing they drop, however, is names. Names can therefore often be used to track down their identities as detectives track down the identities of suspects from fingerprints. But these many identities and names are not simply the result of one migration of Arabs or Africans to America, nor in fact to a one-way traffic of people and culture to the American continent. Calve does not rule out American contact with Africa and mentions four documented instances of Americans shipwrecked on the shores of the Old World. These were rather rare events, much rarer than African accidental shipwrecks, because the pattern of winds and currents favors the possibility of the one over the other. Nevertheless, they sometimes happened. The Gulf Stream departing from Florida provides a return route back to North Africa and parts of Europe. At Spain, the Gulf Stream divides in two directions, one continuing around the British Isles on to Germany and Denmark, and the other bending south to Africa. This would explain American Aborigines being found in Berber territory in North Africa. Two anthropologists have demonstrated 
that certain people living in the Sahara possess American Indian traits. Not only do they have similar names and naming methods, but tribal groups are also designated by the same titles, differing only in the aspects of an occasional prefix or suffix. Furthermore, the women folk of the same region, in all appearance, could easily be mistaken for American Indians. These nomads reside in tents, rather than mud brick houses, as do most of their neighbors. Among the documented instances of Americans landing in the Old World is an incident in the life of Quintus Metellus Seller, governor of Cisalpine Gaul in 62 BC and governor-designate of Transalpine Gaul prior to his death in 59 BC. A chief from somewhere just outside of the Roman world made him a present of some shipwrecked sailors who created a sensation. After some communication could be established with them, they were questioned closely, and on the strength of this, Metellus concluded that they had been blown by a storm from, quote, Indian waters, and eventually cast up on a shore in Germany. This would agree with the drift of the Gulf Stream current from America, a branch of which proceeds to Germany. These so-called Indians were brought across the Alps from the Atlantic side by the Suevians, a tribe which lived in northeast and southwest Germany. The Americans were shipwrecked near the mouth of the Rhine and were taken up that river and across the Alps. Seller related the incident to a friend, Cornelius Naples. Naples included it in a geographical work which, though lost, was cited by subsequent historians Pomponius, Mela, and Pliny. Records of the incident were therefore preserved, and these writers used the information as proof that the ocean extended continuously around the north of Europe to India. One thing is certain, comments Professor J. V. Luce, who has investigated the matter. No one from India could have taken this route at this date. Where, then, did these shipwrecks come from? An examination of all the facts, drift of ocean currents, point of entry into Europe, physical appearance, etc., establish them as Occidental Indians, that is, Americans, as against Oriental Indians, Asian from India. These Americans came too early to have been the carriers of the maize grain to the Old World, but they might have brought in the pineapple. Their visit occurred in 62 B.C. About a hundred years later, 79 A.D., a catastrophe struck the Roman city of Pompeii. Excavating under the volcanic dust, archaeologists turned up a mural which depicted this plant, completely unknown in the old world. It has been confidently identified as the American pineapple by Casella, an authority on Pompeii, and has been accepted as such by plant taxonomist E. D. Merrill, who had argued in the past against pre-Columbian contact between the Old and New Worlds. It would be an irony indeed to find that Americans, quote, discovered Europe many centuries before Europeans, quote, discovered America. But the whole notion of any race, European, African, or American, discovering a full-blown civilization is absurd. Such notions should now be abandoned once and for all. They presume some innate superiority in the, quote, discoverer, and something inferior and barbaric in the people, quote, discovered. These notions run through the works, even of pioneers like Wiener, Calvet, 
and Jeffries. What I have sought to prove is not that Africans discovered America, but that they made contact on at least half a dozen occasions, two of which were culturally significant for Americans. The African presence in America before Columbus is of importance not only to African and American history, but to the history of world civilizations. It provides further evidence that all great civilizations and races are heavily indebted to one another, and that no race has a monopoly on enterprise and inventive genius. The African presence is proven by stone heads, terracottas, skeletons, artifacts, techniques and inscriptions, by oral traditions and documented history, by botanical, linguistic and cultural data. When the feasibility of African crossings of the Atlantic was not proven and the archaeological evidence undated and unknown, we could in all innocence ignore the most startling of coincidences. This is no longer possible. The case for African contacts with pre-Columbian America, in spite of a number of understandable gaps and a few minor elements of contestable data, is no longer based on the fanciful conjecture and speculation of romantics. It is grounded now upon an overwhelming and growing body of reliable witnesses. Using Dr. Rhine's dictum for phenomena that were once questionable but are now being empirically confirmed, truly it may be said, the overwhelming incidence of coincidence argues overwhelmingly against a mere coincidence. End of chapter 12 Postscript on Other Finds The Negro started his career in America not as a slave, but as master. R. A. Jirazaboy Ancient Egyptians and Chinese in America The startling fact is that in all parts of Mexico, from Campeche in the east to the south coast of Guero, and from Chiapas next to the Guatemalan border, to the Panuco River in the Huasteca region north of Veracruz, archaeological pieces representing Negro or Negroid people have been found, especially in archaic or pre-classic sites. This also holds true for large sections of Mesoamerica and far into South America. Panama, Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. Alexander von Wuthenau unexpected faces in ancient America. I let the grains filter slowly through my fingers, like sand falling in a measured trip through the neck of an ancient hourglass. Some of the grains at the bottom of the grave reminded me of that sunless ashen powder one finds on the floor of abandoned ant heaps. They were mixed now with a darker, heavier, more brittle soil, but when the grave had first been opened, the layer in which I now buried my hands had been dated circa A.D. 1250. Within that layer had been found the bones of two negroid skeletons. I looked up from the pit, strewn with the irrelevant debris of beer and soda cans. 
at the pure, unlittered pool of the Caribbean sky. My guide called down to me from the edge of the pit. Her voice was clear above the muffled hammer of the sea in the bay outside, and the closeness and immediacy of this vital cry against the whisper of the unseen ocean in Hull Bay flooded me with the sensation of the overlapping of the visible and the invisible, of modern substance and ancient shadow, of the far and the familiar centuries. I felt as though the hands through which I now sifted this thirteenth century dust were branches drawing sap from the grafted tree of my Carib and African ancestors. I had come to the Virgin Islands a year after the Smithsonian had reported the Hull Bay find. According to the Associated Press report on the discovery, the skeletons of two negroid males in their late thirties had been found buried in soil layers, layers dated A.D. 1250. Clamped around the wrist of one of the skeletons was a ceramic vessel of pre-Columbian Indian design. Examination of the teeth of the skeletons indicated, quote, dental mutilation characteristic of early African cultures, end quote. The find must have generated considerable excitement at first, since the adjoining area of the grave had been acquired at the cost of hundreds of thousands of dollars. By March 1976, however, when I visited the site, a blanket of secrecy had descended. The grave had degenerated into a garbage dump. I learned from information filtering out of the Smithsonian that interest had evaporated because the skeletons found in the grave could not be properly dated. Salt water had seeped into the bones, disturbing the carbon content, leading to wildly fluctuating readings of skeletal age. Also, and this is most revealing, a nail had been found near one of the skeletons. Indicating, said the informant, that the find was most certainly post-Columbian. Note: My visit to the Virgin Islands was sponsored jointly by the Environmental Studies Program on St. John and the College of the Virgin Islands on St. Thomas. Mrs. Doris Jaden, president of ESP, had invited me to study the petroglyphs carved at the bottom of an ancient freshwater pool in the Reef Bay Valley. Some of these I identified as African. The central plaque was distinguished from the others by the Gi Nami sign of Ashanti origin, a sign of power overturned and reasserted, as well as by a medieval West African dating code of solar dots and lunar curves inscribed along the waterline. End of note. In matters of this nature, it is wise for the Smithsonian to tread with great caution. The disturbance of the bones by seawater makes one aspect of the evidence inconclusive, but the other features, the pre-Columbian ceramic vessel, the age of the soil layers, the evidence of an unusual dental ritual not associated with Africans of slavery times, strongly suggests a pre-Columbian context. In other words, nothing in the evidence associated with the skeletons suggests a post-Columbian dating. The find at Hull Bay remains, therefore, an open question. Further diggings in that area may establish the pre-Columbian presence of Africans in the Virgin Islands after all. But the matter is being prematurely closed by a conspiracy of silence 
a spate of insidious rumors and by apparent ignorance of African metallurgical history. For to assume that a nail found beside an African skeleton is proof of a post-Columbian dating is absurd. Apart from the possibility of accidental intrusion from a higher stratum, such a tiny object can easily slip through a crack in the earth, the even more real possibility that pre-Columbian Africans were acquainted with iron nails has not been considered. Why should a nail pose insuperable problems to Africans whose smelting of iron dates back to 650 B.C. at Moreau in Nubia and to 200 B.C. at Nak in Nigeria? Are we to believe that the medieval West African who could devise metal implements refined enough to perform eye cataract surgery in the 13th century was incapable of making a nail? The find at Hull Bay, however, is only the most recent in a series of discoveries of negroid skeletal remains in pre-Columbian strata in the New World. I have already noted some of these among the Olmecs, as cited by Andres Wierzynski and Frederick Peterson, and the Pecos River Valley skulls of a later period, as cited by Ernest Houghton. Note. In fact, an isolated iron spearhead was found in Nubia by the David Randall McIver and C. L. Woolley archaeological team in a stratum dating back to the 12th dynasty. This is 400 years before tiny iron implements for use in ritual ceremonies appear in Egypt in the tomb of Tutankhamun, late 18th dynasty, and more than a thousand years before iron began to become common in the Egyptian world which was in the 25th dynasty under the blacks. C. A. Lucas, Ancient Egyptian Materials and Industries London, Edward Arnold, 1926, pages 196 and 197. End of note. Some theorists H.S. Gladwin in Men Out of Asia and his latter-day disciple Le Grand Clegg II in his article Who Were the First Americans point to quote proto-negroid or quote proto-australoid finds among some of the Pacific migrants to America 20,000 years ago. These finds are almost exclusively of an australoid pygmy type and are mostly confined to the Pacific coast. They cannot account for the presence, influence, and distinctive racial cultural characteristics of Negro African types found much later in either the Olmec or medieval Mexican cultures. They are therefore peripheral if not irrelevant to our study. In the first place, they are different in stature, in cephalic shape, from the Olmec Negroid types reported by Wierzynski at Tlatiglo, Cerro de las Masas, and Monte Alban. Second, they belong to a period in world history when the so-called, quote, Africoid, or, quote, proto-Australoid base to use terms coined by these theorists, could equally be traced even to some tribes in the Baltic region in northwestern Russia. Third, they had mixed and melted into the billion-bodied mongoloid gene pool for at least 20,000 years, to judge from the datings given to these very early remains of the glacial epoch. Far too long to emerge suddenly as clearly defined, highly distinctive Negro-African faces, such as we find in the colossal 
black dynasties of the Olmec civilization. Fourth, the Negro African portraitures in stone, clay, copper, gold, and cobalt found in pre-Columbian America are distinguishable as Nubian Egyptian and West African types not simply and solely on the ground of their Negroid physiognomy but because of identifiable cultural items helmets, coffers, headkerchiefs, caps, compound earrings, tattoos and scarification associated with particular historical periods and particular peoples. Also they are found mainly among the Atlantic seaboard at the terminal points of winds and currents which bear from Africa all that remains flying and afloat. Not only gourds and men and ships but even the seasonal dust cloud drifting out of the great ocean of Sahara the Harmattan. The pre-Columbian blacks reported by Mongoloid Americans and enshrined in the oral traditions are clearly not the primitive quote proto-Australoids of the Ice Age. No oral traditions in the world go back that far. If they did, we would expect the Mongoloid Americans to preserve legends also of their primordial Pacific homelands before the crossing of the Bering Straits. The look at their oral traditions makes it very clear that the black figure to which they refer was an unusual outsider, in most cases an object of mystery and reverence, and moreover a figure who began to feature prominently in their world in historic times, that is, from the Olmec civilization onward. Unlike the short-statured Pacific Australoid Negrito, he was taller than the average Amerindian. Although the historian Carlos C. Marquez does make mention of a few, quote, small black men seen in Darien, now Panama, by the American tribes who first settled there. Nicholas Leon, an eminent Mexican authority, reports on the oral traditions of the Native Americans, according to some of whom, quote, the oldest inhabitants of Mexico were Negroes. The existence of Negroes and giants, he continues, is commonly believed by nearly all the races of our soil, and in the various languages they had words to designate them. Several archaeological objects found in various localities demonstrate their existence, the most notable of which is the colossal granite head of Huayapan, Veracruz, and an axe of the same located near the city and Teotihuacan, a bound little head of the Ethiopian type and paintings of Negroes, and Mokokan and Oaxaca, the same have also been found. The reference to giants is interesting, since many continental Africans are much taller than the Native Americans. Vespucci mentions a strange race of tall men sighted on a Caribbean island now known as Corazal. And his distinguished biographer, Frederick Poole, believes that these men were blacks. In a letter to me, Poole wrote, quote, Vespucci is accredited first explorer to reach Corazal island of giants, and did so in 1500. His letter from Seville describes the giants, even the woman, as a head and a half. 
taller than any of the Spaniards with him. Spaniards in his day in Spain saw many Moors, and Indians were of a different color also. And so Negro giants were described only by height, not by color. A Medigo does give the color of the Indians of Trinidad in the same letter. His letter, written five or six months after his landing on Curacao, was to his patron in Florence, and he could easily have failed to put in details which he had given. After completing the present work, I fell upon an extraordinary little volume, which is really a chapter in a larger work, Old World Origins of American Civilization by R. A. Jerazaboy. Jerazaboy claims that the Olmecs burst in on the Mexican Gulf Coast circa 1200 BC, and that it is just after their appearance that, quote, all kinds of civilized activity appears, including massive organization of labor, a trade network, ceremonial centers with pyramids, colossal sculpture, relief carving, wall painting, orientation of structures, gods and religious symbolism, an obsession with the underworld, representation of foreign racial types, hieroglyphic writing, inscribes, seals and rings, use of iron, and so on. End quote. He attributes all these to old world migrants who came to America in that period, circa 1200 BC, but admits, quote, few artifacts so far found go back to the first generation migrants, end quote. In fact, none indicating an Old World influence do go back to 1200 BC. Hard carbon datings of artifacts associated with outside influence begin in the 800 to 700 BC period, though the cultural complex known as Olmec has its beginnings in an earlier stratum, 1200 to 1100 BC. Because of Jerusalem's hypothesis that the journey from Egypt to the Gulf of Mexico had to be made circa 1200 BC to coincide with the first Olmec settlements, he is led into strange speculations about the role and fate of the black figure in the reign of Ramses III, the Egyptian pharaoh of the 1200 BC period. Since the Negroid figure, according to him, was a slave and mercenary in that period, but appears as a figure of great authority and power among the Olmecs, he speculates that they came to America under the supervision of northern Egyptian overlords, and were either made military governors of the Olmec by these overlords, of whom he admits there are no sculptural traces, or that the blacks mutinied and killed their overlords. The latter suggestion is even more problematic, since it would mean that all the complex Egyptian elements he mentioned were transplanted here by soldiers. The so-called overlords, which would include the high priests, would in all likelihood have perished in the mutiny or been relegated to a role of little or no influence. These matters can be explained far more simply and without recourse to such speculations. First of all, the Native Americans were not savages when the Nubian Egyptian party arrived, and while one may speak of profound outside influences upon the Olmecs, one should make allowance for the existence of a native civilization, however less advanced, in the Gulf Coast area before the coming of the outsiders. 
to date the coming of the outsiders, therefore in the reign of Ramses III, because it coincides with the very beginnings of all mixed civilization, is quite unnecessary, apart from the fact that the hard carbon datings of the Negroid figures in the Olmec heartland, La Venta, are 800 to 700 BC. Second, the prior existence of a civilization among the Olmecs explains why there is an incorporation of Egyptian elements with native modifications rather than a wholesale replica of Egyptian civilization although there are a number of identical traits shared by both cultures reinforcing the evidence of an intimate and prolonged contact third it is dangerous to take so literally as Jerusa boy does the legend of a Ramses third expedition to the quote inverted waters or the quote mountain to the far west of the world believed to be the entrance to the underworld couched in this vague mythological language legends of this nature abound among the sun worshippers of Egypt fourth all the main Ramsey traits traceable to Olmec culture were especially in vogue in the 25th dynasty of the blacks and some that had lapsed in the Ramses period were revived by the Nubians. Finally, the blacks emerged in America as, quote, tough warrior dynasts, to use Michael Cole's phrase, because that is precisely what they were in the Mediterranean of the same period, 800 to 700 BC. Bearing in mind these reservations, one may still point to a great deal of valuable evidence to Royce Boy presents for an Egyptian contact and influence upon the Olmecs. He notes that Tanis was the place from which Egyptian ships went out on distant expeditions. Tanis is also the place where he cites colossal sculptured heads and stones, some representing Negro Nubians similar in style and size to the ones found in the Olmec world. This is particularly interesting in view of the fact that the black kings made Tanis their capital, and Taharqa not only concentrated his military and administrative elite in that delta city, but built a new pharaonic palace and gardens there. Jarazaboy also highlights an oral tradition among the American Indians that may indicate the place where the migrant party from Egypt eventually landed, and the number and type of ships in which they traveled. It appears from this oral tradition, if it relates to the Egyptian flotilla lost off North Africa, that they were blown off course into the North Atlantic current and made their landfall at a place called Panuco, north of Veracruz, in several seven wooden ships or galleys. This oral tradition, recorded in the Popul Vah, the Bible of the Quiche Maya, also mentions, quote, black people and pale-skinned people, end quote. As among the people who came to this land from the sunrise. This will fit in with a Nubian Phoenician crew. While oral traditions are sometimes difficult to date, and most literal events in the Popol Vuh go back only 13 generations to about the first decade of the 14th century, some of its recorded traditions do go back to the earliest American civilization and Jerusa boy points to a number of datable clues. He demonstrates remarkable similarities between several deities in the Egyptian underworld and those in Olmec, Mexico. At least half a dozen of these gods present in comparative analysis, such a startling identity 
or arbitrary elements in unique combinations that it is difficult to see how independent cultures having no contact or other means of diffusion could duplicate them. These clusters of identical traits go beyond the universal generalities and symbols common to the world's religions. He also draws attention to almost identical ritual practices and funerary customs shared by both cultures, as well as similar names for religious objects and concepts. One or two examples of these rituals may be seen in the phallic cult and the opening of the mouth ceremony. The most striking linguistic identities lie in the names, allowing for slight phonetic and morphemic translations for sun, Mexican and Peruvian Ra from Egyptian Re or Ra for sacred incense, Mexican Copal from Egyptian Kupi for paradise, Peruvian Yaru from Egyptian Aaru for the sacred crocodile Barque Mexican Sipak or Sipakli from the Egyptian Sibak. The Mexicans and Egyptians also share the same hieroglyph for sun, and the origin of heart plucking in Mexico can be traced back to the heart plucking of enemies of the sun god in the Egyptian underworld. I have already noted the similarity between the royal litters and parasols in the two cultures. Jerusalem boy also mentions the double crown of Egypt, which appears on an Olmec dignitary who is proffering an object to a seated Negro figure. Von Wutenau has also noted the pharaonic cap itself on a Nubian figure in Mexico. The Nubian sistrum, a musical instrument, is noted as being in use among the American Indians of Yaqui territory with a similar religious function. The new light De Rosa Boy sheds on the skeletal evidence of the Polish craniologist Wyszynski is of great importance in clearing up confusions over the Atlantic origin of the Negroid population among the Olmecs. He highlights the fact that 13.5% of the skeletons examined in the pre-classic Olmec cemetery of Tlatelolco or Negroid. Yet later at Cerro de las Mesas in the classic period only 4.5 percent were. This indicates that the Negroid element intermarried until it almost fused with the native population. The female found in the graves in the pre-classic period next to the Negroid male is very distinct from the male, native female, foreign male, but becomes similar to the male in the later classic site, indicating progressive intermixture and the growing absorption of the foreign Negroid element into the largely mongoloid American population. This evidence makes it very clear that the Olmec Negroid element was a distinctive outside element that came, conquered, and crossbred in the Olmec time period rather than proto-Australoid or proto-Negroid aborigines who may have trickled into America from the Pacific in the very ancient glacial epoch. According to these skeletal statistics, the latter would have disappeared millennia ago into the American gene pool. Therefore, it can only be concluded that Atlantic migrations from the African continent are responsible for the black pre-Columbian presence in America from the Olmecs onward. End of postscripts. End of They Came Before Columbus.
the African presence in ancient America by Ivan Van Sertema. Let's <laughs> go.